This is the second uh, workshop for AI for a credible election. And um, uh, this is being organized by, uh, uh, with me, uh, Professor Anita Nikolic at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, who is a specialist in security. Uh, Professor Andrea Higgerson, who is a, a specialist in mass communication and journalism from University of uh, Mississippi. Uh, Tamu Koppel uh, from uh, Estonia. Uh, he's from a uh, business school. And uh, Professor Chris Droz, uh, who is a, a political scientist at New York, at New York University. And uh, Dr. Uh, Sachindra Joshi, who is a distinguished engineer uh, at uh, IBM Research, uh, focusing on uh, building uh, dialogue systems. So as you can see, we have a very diverse set of people spanning different topics, which we think are relevant for uh, having a good election and making people be convinced about what's going on, okay? So this is a continuation of the first workshop, which we had at 2021 uh, New Rips, uh, and with a number of the similar people. Before we start, I want to just clarify a few things which we will, to level set people from different uh, communities, uh, what is democracy? <laughs> so we are talking about voting and so on. So first we need to talk about what is democracy, which should have a common definition. It is people electing people to govern them independently, okay? Which means that if you have only one party, you don't have a choice, then there is no election. And that's a very important point. Then what is voting versus electing, right? It's important to know the nuance of it. Voting is exercising the right to make a choice, okay? And electing is selecting a candidate from a set of people. So you can select in whatever way you want, right? Voting is, voting is exercising the power. That's the very important thing. A party versus people, okay? Notice that democracy is all about people. There is nothing about party as such. In practice, party is used. Okay, that uh, and in some places only one party is there, two parties are there, or hundreds of parties are there. Okay, that brings the richness of uh, democracy. Okay. And the topic: Why are we doing it? Credible elections. Okay, the the main thing here is that the governance model should respect individual liberty. Okay, and the best model known to ensure peaceful transition of power. That's what we are really trying. So that's the essential aim of democracy. Governments will come and go. We want hundreds of years of governance and there should be peaceful transition. So this is the currently the best model known and that's why it is important. So given mm -hmm. what we are talking about is so essential to how people live, it is surprising that very little work has been done. And that's what we felt and uh, that's why we are doing this. Okay. Uh, this ecosystem consists of technology, people, human AI collaboration, and then framework, standards, funding, and so on to support it. So what you see here is discussion in our panel discussions, in our invited talks, focus on technology, but that's not the whole thing. We have focus on people aspects of uh, topic. Then we have human AI, uh, which is a form of technology, collaboration, how they're coming together, and then how do we do it at scale, which is what standards and frameworks allow us. Okay, and we have a number of research focus. You can look at the details, uh, which has been in the call for papers and so on, uh, but uh, we are focusing on election candidates. I mean, it can be about that. It can be about election organizers, it, uh, election commissions, for example. It can be about voters and cross-cutting concerns. I would argue that the most important thing is the voter. If the voters are enabled, everything, the rest of the ecosystem gets taken care of. Okay. They are the customer of the election system. So we are very excited to have an exciting program today. It consists of uh, uh, talks, three talks, interspersed with three panels, and then a peer-reviewed papers. I hope we will have a lot of discussion. So without much ado about uh, what we are going to do, you can check out the program on the website. I will invite Professor Nupam Joshi to give the first talk. Um, so thank you, Viplav. I appreciate um, you thinking of me and, and the other uh, colleagues and, and inviting me to talk about some of our new work today. But this is an invited talk, not a discussion of the research we're doing. So I'm going to, except for brief interludes about my own research, I'm going to 
think of this more as a framing thing to um, engender some discussion, hopefully. And I'm thinking of sort of, I guess, your bullet around mis and disinformation and then you know, cross-cutting concerns. Because one way to manipulate elections is to hack into voting machines or whatever. Another way to manipulate elections is to stop people like physically or legally from voting. Another way of manipulating elections is to shape the narrative, which by the way has, uh, don't get me wrong, political parties do it all the time. So it's not necessarily bad in of itself, but what we are going to discuss is how people perhaps who shouldn't be parties to an election, nation state adversaries, others are beginning to use these kinds of tools and techniques um, in the digital world. So my name is Anupam Joshi. I'm from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which for those of you um, from not this region is about eh, 20 kilometers, 15 miles or so north of here as the crow flies. And as I was discussing with uh, my colleague from Zurich here, uh, is in a rarity right now that you can get from here to there using nothing but public transportation. It's unique for uh, this part of the world. Um, and this is what our campus looks like. So if you, this is early in the morning, so if you tune out during my talk, here are the key point to it, right? So miss or dis, and I'm going to use those terms interchangeably I know that there is a subtle difference when you talk about misinformation versus disinformation, uh, but I'm going to use the terms interchangeably. So it's, you know, it's rarely in the electoral context, a singular artifact which can be detected and debunked because those kinds of misinformation people have been thinking about for a while, you will see some examples and people have figured out how to potentially detect and how to potentially even counter that. The second tricky part of this is that for many things, misinformation, like so many other things, lies in the eyes of the beholder, right? So what perspective are you coming to right? uh, from a certain perspective? And, and we'll see examples. What I'm going to talk about are influence operations in the modern digital world which try to mix facts, opinions, and selectively tailored small pieces of mis or disinformation to craft a narrative that will shape outcomes. Right? Because if you lie blatantly, ignoring the whole Gobelian piece about if you lie big and lie often enough, et cetera, but if you're doing a blatant lie in the modern world, it'll get caught. The thing is to, play around right, with what is, what's an opinion, and then throw in some, some misinformation there. And it's, it's very easy to do in the modern sort of mobile social media landscape. We've all seen examples. And you know, as of what, like a month or so ago, in the chat GPT world, it's just ridiculously easy. Anyone can make an account and spew out whatever plausible stuff they want. And I'll give you some examples of some work we did a couple of years ago, uh, which predates ChatGPT with the, this kind of work, right? So this is a low cost and hard to attribute. Oh, low cost and hard to attribute um, troublemaking approach uh, for nation state adversaries. Low cost is good if you're an adversary and hard to attribute is even better because there's plausible deniability. I'm not doing that, right? So the open question that we are investigating in some of our research um, is, can you detect it to use cybersecurity terminology left of exploit, right? Before an exploit, before something spreads and actually shapes an electoral outcome, can you detect that narratives are being crafted? So I will begin with an example in three parts, right? So the first part are raw facts, undisputed, right? In September 20, 2018, there was a typhoon that caused the closure of Kansai Airport 
in Japan, right? Uh, the, uh, Kansai serves Osaka. And so people had to be evacuated from there to Osaka city. Only airport buses were used to evacuate people from the airport to designated places. And from then on, right, air, airlines or embassies or whatever were responsible from taking people from those designated points to wherever hotels and whatnots they had arranged. A Chinese airline grouped all of its passengers into specific buses, perfectly reasonable, um, to send them out. And the Chinese consulate arranged to transport Chinese passengers from the designated points to Osaka, as presumably did other countries and other airlines. So, so far we are dealing with pure facts. There's no dispute here. Now let's think about some opinions. As happens um, in many parts of the world, stories were carried in the Chinese media where Chinese citizens were praising the efforts of that airline, their consulate, their government uh, on being efficient and helping organize that evacuation. Yeah, it's an opinion. That's great, right? Not, nothing wrong with having that opinion. And a passenger commented that in the airport bus, they had even accommodated passengers from Taiwan. You're probably familiar with the whole geopolitical situation there, don't want to get into uh, that discussion. Uh, but the idea was that, and again, this was this passenger's individual opinion, which they're allowed to have saying, hey, we accommodated people from Taiwan in our bus as long as they were saying that they were Chinese, right? And the Chinese consulate in Osaka put out a statement that they had coordinated with the Japanese side. Again, you know, their opinion, they're free to state that. You could argue that that statement was worded in a way that could be read to assume that they had kind of suggested the whole thing to the Japanese, that they should do this kind of evacuation with buses. Facts opinions, right? Nothing, nothing particularly bad so far. And now this happens. So in, in Taiwan, there is a very popular bulletin board called PTT. And so people who were later alleged to be fake accounts began to post saying that the government had failed to do its duty to the citizens. It had not organized evacuations. Look what a wonderful job the Chinese government did organizing those evacuations. And they were citing, linking back to these stories that had appeared in, in the media in China, which you know praised the Chinese consulate and the government. And these postings omitted one key fact. The evacuations from the airport was done by the airport authorities using airport buses, right? They just didn't mention that fact, right? So now what happens, right? Now these were later found to be fake accounts, but that's later. So what happens in a modern electoral democracy? Imagine that a story like this and replace China and Taiwan with America and Canada or something like that, right, had appeared. Sorry, use the clicker. So what happened? The mainstream media in Taiwan picked up the story and began naturally, it's the media to say, hey, there are stories appearing that our government flubbed this evacuation. What's going on here? We demand answers. That's what journalists are supposed to do, right? You can argue how, they how much due diligence they should have done on a thinly sourced story. But that's an argument. Now let the dean of, um, you know, the J school here argue on how much sourcing is needed before you, you go after, right? And of course, like in any other electoral democracy, there are these more sensational sites that, you know, created headlines like to get on the bus, one has to, you know, and of course, this led to, you know, obviously this was then picked up by the opposition parties in Taiwan, 
you know, in a multi-party electoral democracy, this is a God given. Yes, the government flubbed its response. We demand answers. And this led to a, what I will politely call a lively discussion on the bulletin boards. And much hateful comments were directed towards the person who was in Osaka uh, representing that government. And this gentleman, uh, I'm sure there were other issues involved, committed suicide. And this was the triggering fact, right? So this is the kind of crafting a narrative that I'm discussing today, right? There were facts. Those facts were mixed with opinions, which are also perfectly legitimate to have with just a little bit of misinformation to craft a story that in this case said, our government bungled its duty towards its citizens, right? And I don't live in the intelligence community. I have no secret clearances. I don't know if this was a tailored information operation or just something that happened. You can imagine things like this just happening without any malintention on another side. But you can also imagine that things like this could be done by a nation state adversary. And in fact, in the rumor mill kind of a scenario, um, there are many things that you can point to where the allegations is that a third party caused these kinds of events to happen, right? So in this country, we are very familiar with the, the story around 2016 and the Russian attempts, I'll be careful, Matt, the Russian alleged attempts to manipulate those elections, right? And again, that sort of leads to a very politically divided um, discussion in this country. And I have no secret knowledge to know what, what actually happened. But you can see how things like this could be done. So this is sort of the framing. Um, disinformation is not new, right? I mean, rumors have existed before there were elections, um, uh, before there were electronics, around election times in particular, right? So as a young uh, child in India, I remember rumors being spread about candidates, about positions, by word of mouth around election time. So this is not new. And even in social media, as I'll show you some examples, this, is a, this has been a problem going back at least a decade, if not more. So around the time that the Pope was being elected, the current Pope was being elected, uh, someone had created a fake account and was posting, you know, essentially criticisms against the church's policy on homosexuality. More fun, someone created a fake Delta Airlines account around the same time and promised to have, uh, I think, 1,000, yeah, I think it was 1,000 free tickets to the first however many people who chose to follow that account. Again, some of this kind of obvious fakeness has now been fixed. But there are physical and social consequences. So if you, uh, in India, uh, the previous prime minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, uh, around his time, a Twitter account was created for the prime minister of India, which is the at PMO India, right? Someone pretty early on Twitter days created a PM zero India account with the same picture. Right Now, there were obvious parodies. And if you're from India, you will understand yum, yum, how, what that's good. But you know, if you're not from India, let's just ignore that. But this is a pretty obvious parody, right? This isn't. And what did this account do? Um, some of you are, how many of you are familiar with the Rohingya um, issue in Burma, Myanmar? So uh, for those of you who are not familiar, um, there are allegations that the uh, Rohingya people, you know, there's sort of been ethnic cleansing 
kind of a thing against them. South Asia, in terms of its um, racial admixture, for the lack of a better word, is very diverse, right? So the Rohingya people look sort of like this. The, the Burman people look more like people from Southeast Asia. So there were pictures from these atrocities in Burma and this account posted these on WhatsApp channels and Twitter channels in India said, look, people from, you know, the states of India that neighbor Burma, the so-called Northeastern states, those people are doing bad things to people from the southern part of India. And we need to do something in response. And there was enough of this that there was literal panic and people from Northeast uh, states of India were leaving the tech hub in India of Bangalore. There was like literal out migration before, before the government could step in and you know say, no, 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 this is misinformation. This picture is not from India at all and so on. So, so again, you can detect this kind of fake, but it takes time to respond. And again, this is not a, a new problem is all I'm trying to say here. Uh, there's financial crime, right? So around the time of the uh, Boston Marathon bombing, tweets appeared pointing to pages, so seeking donations for victims, which were completely fake. And as you can see, they got a lot of retweets and people actually contributed money to these fake accounts. Um, some of you may remember this. Someone hacked the AP's Twitter feed and said that, you know, there's an explosion in White House. Barack Obama has been injured. The stock market actually fell for about two or three minutes before, you know, news went out saying, no, this is false, and it came back up whether that was motivated by a short sell, <laughs> we won't know, but you can very clearly see that this is not something that 60 Minutes would have been posting, right? but someone hacked. So more funny stuff, the Burger King account was hacked around the same time and pictures of McDonald's were put in and Jeep was hacked and Cadillac you know, things were put in. So. Um, this is some work we'd actually done back in 2013 um, in a WWW paper, but you know, you can certainly probably without much prompting figure out that this is a fake. Right? A shark swimming in the New Jersey Turnpike. This one is fake, but if you were looking at it for the first time right after a hurricane, you would not necessarily be sure. And this is fake, but does someone know where this? picture is actually from? There was this Hollywood disaster movie where three super duper cyclones sweep from the north of the south, pulling air from the troposphere and causing, yeah, 2012. This is the scene as those fake things are approaching New York. Someone posted it right after Hurricane Sandy. So, my meta point is that this stuff has existed for a while. And because this stuff has existed for a while, there has been a lot of research in the social media and the AI community to detect this kind of misinformation. Uh, there are automated approaches um, that deal with network properties as well as propagation properties, cascades. Uh, uh, there was nice work from um, CMU around whether the information cascades or the, and the disinformation cascades were actually different. Um, there's also manual fact checks, although fact checks themselves these days are, have been called into question on, on whether they're checking opinions um, or facts, right? So, you know, there are known approaches to counter this, but sort of limited success. And this is especially insidious in social media 
that permits forwards with end-to-end -end encryption like WhatsApp. Um, some of you may remember about three years ago, um, there were in India rumors being spread through WhatsApp saying strangers are coming to kidnap your kids. That's it, nothing more than that. And that actually led to about seven or eight lynchings in different parts of India because people were so like worked up. Some random person shows up, you know, in, in, in their village and they ask, who are you? And if they're not satisfied, they think, oh, right. And this led actually to a significant back and forth between the government of India and, and um, Facebook because the government of India was saying, well, tell us who started this so we can go after them. And Facebook said, enter and encrypt it, sorry. Right. They did concede to limiting the amount of forwards, but this is still an open issue. Uh, and it's an interesting question in, for the political scientists to think about, right? Uh, and, and, the, and the policy uh, people. End-to-end -end encryption, if it truly makes certain things hard, impossible to attribute, and is being used to spread this kinds of sort of fake information that has real physical harm, where is the line being drawn? Right. Open, non-technical question that um, I will not pretend to have an answer to. So again, information operations, the kind of thing that craft narratives, they're also not new. You know, the Mongols, for example, were known to you know, when they were invading a new region, they would be particularly brutal with the first places they attacked, but leave a few people to spread the word that 99.999% of people have been killed. And then they would go to a new place and essentially say, surrender and pay a small tax and, you know, declare yourself to be a vassal or, and, yeah. Uh, they also had other tactics like, you know, tying stuff to horses' tails so that a lot of dust would, rise up as you know they were advancing cavalry charging and people would think there was actually a bigger army than it was and so on and so forth um before the great wars in europe both napoleon and frederick the great are known to have used information operations you know selective leaking of their plans in neighboring countries and and such like in both world war one and world war two pamphleteering was used the united states actually dropped uh, pamphlets from its bombers towards the latter part of the war, even the Germans had. And I hate to say this, but there were fairly sexist tropes along the lines of, you know, while you are here, your spouse, and I'll leave the rest to imagination. Um, today, right, there is a kinetic war, to use the polite, you know, phrase happening in Ukraine. But there's also fairly significant information warfare on Twitter and this crafting of the narrative, right? So what has changed from the times of even the Second World War? Or, you know, in between, if you want to know, I don't know how many in this audience are familiar with the Gulf of Tonkin incident, right? But that's another example of a, a narrative being created. Now, in those days, if you wanted to craft a narrative, say, in the United States, I'll use that as an example, there were three main television providers, CBS, NBC, ABC, and maybe a couple of papers of record, New York Times, Chicago Tribune, San Francisco Chronicle, Boston Herald, and if you got your story, and if you got those seven or eight sources to say, this is the story, Mr. Conkright would be on your television in the evening and his very television-like voice would tell you what was going on in the world and you would nod along and say yes, right? Today, if you are a nation state adversary, instead of having to subvert six, seven, eight new sources that are a part of the other country's establishment, if you would, you don't have to. You have direct reach into the hearts and minds of your adversities, especially in open democratic societies. Right? And so uh, Biplov's, you know, 
in his level setting said, we're talking about elections in a democracy. So if you were without naming any country, if you were not a democracy, you probably don't have this issue because you've censored your media sources, including social media, and this is not an issue for you. But if you are an open democratic society, this is an issue because your adversaries now can directly appeal to hearts and minds, right? And there have been lots of examples. The reason I'm not putting them on the slide here is that in most of those examples, they're so current that you get into particular partisan loyalties in this country, and I don't want to get into that argument. Um, but whichever side of the politics you are in this country right now, there are examples where allegedly the other side has been helped by people outside this country. The other thing that has changed, and I'll give you some examples. Riplov, can you give me a five minute? Okay, you've given me a five minute one. So I'll now rush through the rest of the slides. The other thing is the ability to generate plausible but, but fake information that passes the smell tests and takes effort to debunk, right? So I'll rush through this because how many of you have played with ChatGPT already? Right? And you've got it to generate all kinds of completely random stuff that if you presented to a person and didn't tell them it came from ChatGPT, right? I mean, uh, it has passed uh, MBA examinations in Warden. It has passed the USMLE, which the test used to, you know, certify MDs in this country, you know, so... Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example from cybersecurity. I'll, I'll skip through all this stuff, given that I'm in the five-minute warning already. But let's say that before there was chat GPT, there was, there was some work in 2021 where Google said, hey, our threat analysis group says that nation states uh, are creating fake security research account and doing fake blog posts about security. So we said, okay, let's see how hard is this. So in the era of GPT-2, right? We basically took a cybersecurity corpus, took the off-the-shelf GPT-2, fine-tuned it on our cybersecurity corpus. Um, this work was actually done by the people who are doing the AI in cybersecurity workshop. <laughs> workshop. Um, so let's say with a part of the United States Department of Defense. Um, and we generated cyber threat intelligence, and then we actually tested it. So before I get to that, the thing on the top is the actual threat intelligence about a real cybersecurity threat. The stuff on the bottom is what GPT-2 generated. And except for minor errors in English in the GPT-2 era, the Russian Moscow-based group rather than the Russian Moscow-based group, which you could easily clean up, right? It's taking actual threats and generating completely fake information about what they do. But if you didn't know about that particular piece of information and you read this, you'd say, oh, okay. So they're doing social engineering to get around network, which is completely false, but it's also completely plausible because these things the things can be done, right? Solar winds, it came up with a completely different way that solar wind allegedly attacked, which is also completely plausible because this is a real exploit that can be exploited, right? So, so we said, okay, let's give this to people who do this for a living, whose job is to do threat, cyber threat intelligence for a living. And in where our campus is located, let's just say that those kinds of people are easy to find between the US government entities and the private companies that support them. So we found <clears throat> 10 threat hunters, as they are called, with each having at least 15 years experience in the field. And we gave 280 real threats and 280 fake threats. Takeaway story, you know, so you can see this is about 0.73. So true positives were about 0.73 and the false positives were about 0.78. So these people for about 80% of the completely fake cyber threat, you know, experienced people who do this for a day job were saying, seems reasonable. This could be a real thing, right? So 
The take home lesson here is that you can now generate completely plausible stuff that is completely fake. And now with ChatGPT and its successors, you can generate it in the voice. You know, write a story as if you are a 14 year old girl in Tennessee that is dealing with racial discrimination. It will generate it and in that voice. So imagine if you were a nation state adversary, what you can now begin to do in that scenario, take real facts, take opinions that already exist in the society and begin to feed these kinds of false pieces of information that support that opinion and help craft a narrative. So um, I'll skip through most of this because this is the less interesting piece. This is research. Can you detect them? And we're beginning to make uh, some things and what we're doing is we're actually reaching into literary theory on how narratives are crafted so this is my homage to my mother who's a professor of literature right we're, this this is this is not computer science right how are narratives created well studied issue in literature and then right can you instead of just linking together stories in a timeline for which there is a body of work that exists uh, can you use, for example, this is one common approach called Freytag's pyramid on how, a, how in literature you bring something to a climax. How do you set up the characters first and how do you, what are called rising actions, you know, plot points that feed into eventually leading to the climax, the denouement, and then how is that sort of climax result, right? So in some sense, what your adversary is doing is creating a story it wants you to believe. And what we're trying to say is, can we computationally and you know, by building ontologies that capture that sequence by using large language models in the reverse to say, okay, if I wanted to create this kind of a narrative, what kind of a thing would I have created? And now am I seeing evidence of those kinds of things? Um, okay, something is stuck. So this is uh, our ontology in some detail. Um, this is how we're using um, large language models, right? To essentially achieve thematic ordering. Um, and our initial focus is on the cybersecurity domain because unlike the general purpose political science domain, here we can have some agreement on what is the truth, right? Um, because even in cybersecurity, it turns out that modern sophisticated attacks, the so-called advanced persistent threats are built using what's called a kill chain. And offline, I can tell you how the history of the term kill chain, but the idea is you first reconnaissance the adversary, you find out their weaknesses, then you craft something that will, you know, someone will click there and then you deliver that, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea is this is also a theme. This is also a story. But this is a story where there is agreement. Yes, this is how this attack happened. So can you discover it? Or yes, this is an attack. Whereas in the kind of things that I was describing to you, if I go back to the original story, I suspect you could have arguments on whether that was an attack or just something that organically happened and was perfectly okay. Um, and so we're building this kind of a thing. Um, I'll just stop here in the interest of time. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Sure. Thanks, glad to be here. You'll move on the camera my back on this one. Virtual this one. Great question. Oh, they are not questions. Yeah. We do not have any questions. If anybody wants to ask. Oh hey Jeremy, how are you? Thank you. I have a question about the narrative analysis. So in journalism, there's the inverted pyramid. So I'm wondering if you've looked at inverted pyramid or if you 
think there would be any difference in looking at a story that way where you start kind of with the nut graph of here's what the story is about and then you lay out the evidence. So why that and not the inverted pyramid? So I think the inverted pyramid would work well if you knew ahead of time. So for example, let's say if you're yep. a, and this is where you get into the domain of intelligence agencies and yep. things of that nature. If you said, we have an upcoming election, we have evidence that the following bad people are going to manipulate things in this way, then I think the inverted pyramid works actually and works very well because you're then able to say, I know what exactly to look. Right. We're trying to deal with a slightly harder problem, which says, all I know is that people will be crafting some narrative. I don't necessarily know what that narrative is, right? And so I'm just looking to see, am I beginning to build a story chain that fits together and is beginning to do and figure out what the climax might be before you kind of reach the climax? Which is admittedly a much harder problem, but my PhD student wanted to take it on, so more power to her. If anybody else has a question. So um, Anupam, thanks for um, giving us a good coverage of the things. I wanted to uh, check that, uh, you know, how is uh, language and uh, like, um, is, is, is there uh, uh, certain languages in which this problem is much more than in other languages? For example, in English, we keep hearing about it. Is this uh, very prominent in like Chinese or in uh, European languages or like uh, Indian languages? So I can tell you about Indian languages almost certainly, right? Uh, because I try to stay away from WhatsApp, but most of my family are on it. And so I get random forwards, right? right? In, um, in given my background, mostly in English that are often saying things that I know to be false. And they are forwarded by sincere people because they got it in their inbox. But the problem is that it seems easy. So it's certainly true in India. And there have been lots of examples across the various languages in India where this has been demonstrated and actually across social media. I suspect you know, just reading stuff that they have. I mean, um, so if you go back to the uh, Brexit and the elections around that time, right? Uh, there were certainly allegations that this stuff had been done in England, this kind of narrative crowd. And some of it perfectly legitimate because in that case, it was political parties within England that were doing it, you could disagree with what they were saying, but it was their democratic say that. Um, and I gave you an example of what yeah. happened in Taiwan, so certainly um, Chinese, but um, I, I don't really know why the global. So, does the low resource language save us? <laughs> that was my, I was trying to think as. So, a low resource language saves you a little bit. Uh, so, Chinese is certainly not a low resource language. Yeah. But there's been a lot of work in this kind of work in Chinese. And in India, Google, for example, has been investing a lot of money in building good language models for Indian languages. And before that, there was wonderful work done by the people in the fire consortium um, in India, Google and others. Um, so I dare say that most of the major Indian languages, so India is a language country of about three, four hundred you know, languages that are regularly spoken. The language I speak at home, with unfortunately now only my mother, you know, we have to speak. With. Yeah, it's a genuine low resource. <laughs> There's definitely no sort of automatic tools to generate stuff in that. But in Hindi, which is what I speak to the rest of the family, yeah, it's not a low resource language. Hindi is not a low resource language. Bengali is not a low, low resource language. Uh, Tamil, Gujarati, I mean, the major language in India, there, I would dare say that there are no languages. Uh, thanks, Anupam. Thanks, Anupam. Thank you very much. Appreciate all right, uh, this is the uh, time for uh, the first panel. And uh, uh, we have uh, Professor Anita Nikolaj uh, uh, on, the, 
on, on uh, virtually who will be actually organizing this. So I see at least two of our panelists online. Uh, Jeremy's got a beautiful, not virtual background. Thank you for joining from vacation, Jeremy. And Good to be here. We have Ashish who just joined. Thank you for joining. And it's our, in the room, I assume Uwe is there. Well, trying to, trying to multitask here. Yes, uh, he's here. I, I just go to the next one. Okay. Uh, one one second. Uh, yeah. Sure. Go to the next one, please. Yes. And uh, can we have the camera? I mean, if people want. Just one, uh, one second, uh, Anita, please. Sure. We are trying to get everyone on the screen. Yes. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, so thanks to the panelists for joining. We have three panelists that are here. I'm going to introduce them one by one. So I'm going to um, start on the screen, do a short intro, and then if they could give some short remarks, and then I have some prepared questions, and then some questions I'll kind of ask on the fly. So I'm going to start with um, Uwe. I, I assume he's in the room. It's hard for me to tell on the camera. Uh, but Dr. Uwe Serdolt is PI at the Center for Democracy Studies at University of Zurich, Switzerland. And he is also a full professor in the E-Society Lab at the College of Information Science and Engineering at, uh, I can't, cannot pronounce this well, but Ritsumeiken University, Japan. Uh, he works on internet-based platforms and tools for citizens and administrations to enhance transparency and deliberation in an information society. And he also does work in blockchain, which I'm very excited to, to hopefully I'll talk about. So Uwe, did you want to give a, a few minutes of um, some remarks, maybe like as long as you want to give something less than five minutes, uh, and then we'll do the other panelists, then I have some questions for all of you. Yeah, okay. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. I'm very uh, pleased and excited to be here in this uh, interdisciplinary uh, group and panel, and I think that's precisely the approach we should take for this topic. So I have my main background is in political science, but I had a, took a minor in computer science, and now I mainly work with data scientists in Japan and with political scientists and uh, lawyers in, in Switzerland when I'm in Switzerland. And we started to, and I'm really glad at how you uh, frame this whole topic, Anita, because you took a very broad approach and uh, that's also how we work in our group so at the beginning we just looked at i mean the, the overarching question i'm interested in in is in a nutshell is what does the internet do to our democracies right that's the, the core of the question and here we focus more on elections and in political science, we would say this whole topic has three dimensions. So we should look at opinion formation and how discussions on the internet, learning, and maybe monitoring also information could be yeah, put in danger, manipulated, as we heard from the keynote speaker today. That also was very much on, on topic. And uh, the second dimension we usually look at is what we call co-creation. Uh, co so a lot of uh, public administrations and governments have started to interact more with uh, the, the voters, the audience, the citizens, the residents. So there's digital tools allowing you to be consulted. So there's lots of e-consultations going on, especially on the local level. In uh, You can also connect this to the whole debate about smart cities. You just try to reach out to the people and collect as much intelligence as you can from them. On the other hand, you can also voice your opinion. So you have a lot of tools, digital tools and websites allowing you to make some input and provide information or make some demands to your uh, local government or administration. And then the third dimension is what we would say would fall into decision making. So there it's, it's a bit more technical. You have to usually identify yourself. So the, the whole discussion about how you identify yourself for an election or even for an e-petition platform so EIDs is a big topic there. And then finally, how you vote. So we also deal with uh, 
e-voting. We have e-voting in Switzerland trials, at least. And then you can have, uh, so you have tools for all of this, digital tools for all of this. You can discuss, you can learn, you can monitor, you can be consulted, you can voice your opinion, you have to identify and you can vote. So there's tools for all of this. Uh, but to start the debate here, I'd like to put the emphasis on one specific uh, tools. Maybe later on we'll, we'll talk about other stuff as well. There's uh, kind of one tool that is mushrooming in democracies. It's called, in, in the literature, you would call it uh, voting advice applications. I don't know whether you've heard of them. So this is kind of a civic tech tool that allows potential voters to answer, let's say, 20 to 30 questions or items. And when you do this, you are then matched with the political parties or the candidates that run for an election. You, you do this, you use this tool before an election takes place. And in some countries, I think in the US you have them as well, but in some European countries, uh, they're so popular that 25% of the electorate are using these tools. So when we talk about elections and that we need good information before we can make a choice, these VAAs um, have an important, they play an important role these days. And I would say after a bit of research I did in this field on BAAs, I would say that they're all a bit biased. There are no non-biased BAAs because think of it, uh, you have to define these 20 to 30 items or questions and 25% of the electorate use it, they get a result, they get a match. You need a matching algorithm. You can get this. 10, 12 different ones, you can choose one. So you have to define the questions, you have to define the answer categories. And so it's wide, the field is wide open. So if this VAA is well done, and there's maybe research behind it, fine. You get a, you get a let's say, a valid recommendation. But it, if it's done in a sloppy way and not much effort put in, it's misleading. And if a large part of the population uses these civic tech tools, such as VAAs, you get a misleading vote recommendation, right? So uh, this is just, I wanna highlight for the upcoming discussion and where could AI or machine learning or that language processing play a role here? It's, it's for usually these VAAs are designed or created by political scientists, and they have to somehow come up with these 20 to 30 um, yeah, questions or items. And they just use what they know from surveys. But here, because there's kind of an information overload, computer scientists, data scientists can step in and help these VAA designers to come up with a more informed approach on deciding which items are now debated in the news, in social media, by politicians, because you have to, in a way you have to reconcile what is the political debate like currently and what is an offer from the uh, candidates that run for an election. So to bring that together, I think there's a, a big role that can be played by computer scientists, data scientists. They can just harvest what is uh, and classify and do topic modeling, for example. And that would inform the VAA designers what the proper input should be in a, in a current electoral race. Because if if you're completely out of bounds and you don't capture what is currently on debate, you give a false recommendation to, or even worse, you give a recommendation that favors one of the 
contestants or one of the political parties in the race. And you give this recommendation to, to a large percentage of the electorate. So uh, here's what one out of many uh, tools in which uh, I think data scientists and computer scientists, machine learning can, can play an increasing role. We, we try to uh, give a start with this a bit in our own research. But this is just one example to open up the debate a bit, and I'll stop here with my first input. I'm, I'm so glad you brought up voting, uh, the, the voting assistance. I've heard that in my own projects. I want to come back to that for sure. Some, it's frightening when computer science people actually design it without any input. Um, so we'll talk about that kind of in the questions. But next up, uh, I see Ashish is on. Thank you for joining us. A quick intro, Dr. Ashish Kundu, uh, honored to have you. He's the head of cybersecurity research at Cisco. Uh, he's an ACM distinguished member and a master inventor at IBM Research, where he led the R&D for security and compliance for IBM Watson Health. He has 110, if I counted right, patents to his name. And he's the co-founder and CTO at Cyfence and was head of cybersecurity at NeuroAI. So welcome, Ashish. Uh, please give us your thoughts. Oh. Hi, Anita. Um, can you hear me? Is it is, okay? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for kind introduction and, and it's a uh, honor to be part of a great panel here. Um, thank you. So, so uh, this is this is a great uh, um, topic to actually talk about how AIML can help, uh, especially cybersecurity uh, of um, uh, elections. You know, and and uh, that includes not only just voting machines, but the entire. Uh, um, entire pipeline or process of elections, and, and it was uh, uh, great to uh, hear the previous speaker uh, talk about uh, the voting assistance and other things. So, so in my opinion, uh, of course, uh, security plays a uh, plays a major role, as we have seen and then uh, uh, heard about, uh, but. Security, uh, there, there are four components to trust. I, I would like to bring more about trust rather than just, just cyber security and threats here. The trust essentially is uh, have four pillars, if we say, right? Uh, at least that's what I, um, you know, we look at security, privacy, regulatory compliance, and, and ethics. Um, if, we are, if you're using any uh, or, or fairness of, of AI models, uh, right? Uh, so. Um, in in this current context, if we uh, look at uh, uh, the, the there are there are uh, especially the NIST pipeline of of how a, how uh, an election should be conducted, right? Um, as part of the pipeline, when we start preparing for the election and start um, you know, either manual election or somebody will come to a booth and provide the, um, you know cast the vote. Or if it is a, a, a kind of a ballot best, um, like uh, the ballot is sent uh, over mail, and then that mail is actually sent back to uh, by the by the voter uh, to the election office. Uh, in that context, uh, I think language, the way uh, we are uh, analyzing uh, or are using languages, right, is very important. And uh, for us, there's a bias that can creep in. So fairness is an important aspect. Um, there could also be certain uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, for example, how, what, what are the key, key uh, components or key um, statements that are made in the language, uh, especially in the, uh, uh, in the way the uh, voting information is uh, disseminated. But then when, if we go to the uh, voting machine, right? Um, the voting machine, I'll particularly give more emphasis here because you know, especially look at the uh, uh, security and privacy side, right? One of the important aspects that, is, that concerns voting machines is for secret ballot world is that uh, is the privacy of the vote or you can call it uh, uh, confidentiality is it going to be disclosed in some way or the other? You know? and, and, the, uh, and the challenges that are there are, uh, uh, I don't know if I can uh, 
share a screen. Can I can I share a screen just for uh, sharing be. my slides here? You should be able Thank to, you. yeah. Thanks, Anita. I'll do that right very quick. Okay. Um, yeah, I prepared a couple of slides. Yeah, so so one of the key challenges about um, um, uh, voting machine supply chain security. Okay, so look at this. is a, a cyber physical machine. Uh, and when it is prepared and then it's, it's, uh, it's, it's designed, developed, right? You want to make sure that all the components in the voting machine is actually um, uh, uh, vetted against different threats and vulnerabilities. Uh, you want to also make sure is, there, is part of the voting machine is coming from an uh, export control country, right? That you don't trust. Uh, or is coming from a, um, uh, from a biased, uh, organization, right? That could be within a trusted organ company, uh, trusted country or trusted group. But but then that that specific uh, group which is designing or developing the code or developing certain UI um, or the way um, uh, or the way uh, shuffling of votes or shuffling of use uh, uh, and of the the data is carried out. That is called that's primarily cryptographic shuffling. That is that is used. Um, if that is not used, that should be used, uh, which is which is probably secure. And and uh, and then there is also the security of traceability of the of the uh, machine when the machine is um, you know moving from one place to the voting uh, booth, and then from voting booth back to a place where it will be used for counting. Um, and then wherever it stays, you know, in between, after, before the election, after the election, in, in its entire lifetime, okay? It's important to keep track of, because this is a, this is a highly sensitive equipment. Uh, and and uh, uh, of course, like any other computing system can be temporary. There is no foolproof security, you know? But it doesn't mean that it is, it is insecure. It is, it is always temporary. No, it is hard to temper with. These, they have temper proof capabilities of and and other other aspects so so the traceability of the machine is very important you know? uh, so and this is where actually um, we uh, uh, look at blockchain and and also decentralized computing sometime and and this is where uh, governance and management of the supply chain traceability can be carried out uh, using uh, using uh, uh, blockchain right and that will be because there are multiple peers that manage the machine, that handle the, the, the uh, build the help build the machine, and and also there are peers. Uh, there are different parties peers. They actually uh, help in uh, transporting the machine and getting enabled, getting it enabled for the for the voting. And there would be the the uh, the key threats are to check here is what are the anomalies that are that can be detected in the supply chain as well as in traceability. And this is where we can use uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, mostly mostly perhaps uh, deep learning, uh, which is what we are currently using in software and cyber security supply chain, cyber physical supply chain, and this is cyber physical machine. I'm actually working on one of that right now, uh, one of such a uh, project at CISCO Research. Um, and then there could be um, uh, you know you want to you, you can perhaps do a quick. Uh, uh, traceability check on the machine itself. If there is enough compute power, you might want to not use a deep learning capability, but use a use a lightweight, maybe maybe decent trees or or SVM kind of capability right on the machine. So it's it's edge computing, right? You want to enable the machine to inform on the blockchain, say that hey, my location is this, okay, or my or or uh, my software has been updated today at this time to this version, okay. That will that will alert. Uh, the the corresponding smart contracts on the blockchain as well as as well as uh, other peers saying that hey something that was not expected to happen right um, now uh, another another aspect that we are currently working on on edge security like to highlight that because these are edge computing devices and and we want to be able to do a uh, uh, real time uh, threat analysis, even, even if it is in a real time, uh, offline security risk analysis, and to do that, we are actually uh, 
using a holistic security method called ETA graphs uh, and and uh, vulnerability analysis. We are using a uh, uh, lot of machine learning in it, uh, using um, um, uh, BERT and uh, for NLP, uh, and and uh, we are extracting vulnerability information, then piecing them together using again uh, machine learning to match them to to connect them together. Uh, and then doing also some form of graph analytics. Uh, we are we are uh, in the process of using uh, deep learning and and uh, um, NLP a lot. Uh, so we have a system that we actually uh, demonstrated at the SCM Sigmatrix last year, which has evolved over uh, the time. And this can be this can be quite useful. It provides a 360 degree view of uh, uh, the top uh, attack paths. And and uh, the the uh, risk factors uh, in a in a more holistic manner. Uh, I think uh, the next important part I like to say is data pro data protection. When you collect the data from the devices, uh, uh, oh, sorry, um, from the electronic voting machine after voting, right? That is one point where you have to check the integrity and authenticity of the data whether it has been updated, how it was updated, that's essentially a form of a, a form of data provenance, right? Then you want to also, when you add other data that, that uh, the ballots that you have received over mail, there are, there are voting booth ballots, all of them you want to add together, you want to maintain that provenance information in a, in a secure manner. Now the data protection on the voting machine itself has to be taken care of using, uh, using uh, temper proof, uh, uh, cryptography mechanisms, um, but you to also make sure that they are uh, uh, now the data protection can be carried out also in a in something called DSPM data security posture management uh, using attack paths and, and attack graphs. You know? uh, now uh, you have to use especially the corresponding level of digital signatures, etc. And then the next risk that is coming up right now in next few years, four to five years even less than that is post-quantum cryptography uh, or post-quantum safety. So quantum systems are capable of breaking uh, uh, RSA and, and several other several other public key cryptography. In fact, they can weaken also, uh, unless you do key agility, they can weaken AES, uh, kind of symmetric cryptography. Excuse me, I'm sorry. So, so you need to support we need to we need to upgrade our voting machines and their communication even their even their other cryptographic uh, capabilities uh, for uh, to making to make it post quantum secure anyway let me pause here i don't want to take up all the time but uh, uh, there there's so much more to that was great thank you i have many many questions keyed up in my mind but let's go to the next panelist do some introductions um and then we'll get to the questions so our next panelist, Jeremy Epstein, is the lead program director for at National Science Foundation. He's also on vacation, so thank you for joining us. A lead program director for the Secure and Trustworthy Cyberspace Program at NSF. This is the National Science Foundation's flagship multidisciplinary cybersecurity and privacy program. He also leads the Size Research Initiative and Research Initiation Initiative targeting junior faculty at under-resourced institutions. He's a longtime cybersecurity researcher outside his day job, focused on election security and voting machines. And generally, I think he's still an AI cynic, which is one of the reasons we invited him today. <laughs> so Jeremy, your thoughts? Thanks very much. I appreciate the introduction, Anita. And um, a little bit earlier, Anita was noticing that she could hear the birds chirping in the background. And I told her if I unmuted myself at the right time, she would have heard the church bells. Uh, so I am in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. It's really beautiful here. Um, and uh, so um, it's a good excuse to always talk about voting in elections. Um, I should start with the usual disclaimer, uh, because I'm a government employee, everything I'm going to say is my opinion, not necessarily that of the government, blah, 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 blah. You know how that goes. And so as Anita said, yeah, I'm, I'm a, a dis, uh, skeptic uh, uh, about AI and ML. And, and I think Uwe's comments in particular about VAAs um, sort of hit that for me. Um, I, I think there's some cool things about VAAs, but we, we need to look at it from a lot of different angles. What are the uh, 
uh, risks of manipulation, uh, to be sure. Um, and we have to think about things like adversarial machine learning. If you're representing a candidate and you want the VAA to prefer your candidate uh, for more potential voters, you're going to, uh, and you know how that, that VAA makes its decisions because you, you've learned what data it ingests and how it manipulates it and how it comes to the conclusions based on what questions it asks and what answers it gives, there's a great opportunity for uh, a candidate to use the uh, machine learning against the voters in a very indirect way. So we need to be really, really cautious of jumping in on those things. We need um, uh, computer scientists and uh, political scientists, to be sure. And when we talk about computer scientists, we need to make sure that we're thinking about cybersecurity people, not just from the perspective of can that VAA be hacked uh, directly, but can it be hacked indirectly through adversarial machine learning by the candidates who are pushing data in. So that's just an example. There's plenty of others. I just throw that out there as an example. Um, so the program I lead, uh, as, as uh, Anita said, is the flagship cybersecurity research program for NSF. And we funded a lot of different research uh, in election and votings. Um, and, and some of it, you might think, well, what does this have to do with AI and ML? So let me point, for an example, to a, a project we just funded with Mike Alvarez uh, at um, Caltech um, in Southern California. Um, he, uh, if, if you've paid attention to voting in elections, you know that there's been a lot of hate speech and threats and things like that against election officials, the people who set up our ballots, counter ballots, et cetera, um, to, to the point where the number of election officials who have quit has just skyrocketed in the past few years, uh, which is a, a, a huge brain drain on, on that expertise, which is not easy to develop. Well, what Mike is doing and his team are doing is they're using artificial intelligence and machine learning to recognize hate speech in how it's being directed to election officials and that allows folks to work with um, law enforcement and so on to uh, go after uh, uh, to, to, to protect the election officials and go after uh, people who are going after them. Um, so that's an example of using AI and ML. And, and in my mind, that's a good example. So I, I am a skeptic, but um, there are times where I think it can be useful. Another example is uh, we funded um, a team led by Mike Byrne at Rice University, um, uh, which is looking at how do you design ballots so you they're easy to understand. And you think back to butterfly ballots in Florida in 2000, for those of us old enough to remember that. And it was it was basically a crappy ballot design. And, and this happens periodically. The people who design our ballots are, are election officials. They're experts in elections. They're not experts in all the things that go into elections, like how to design a usable ballot. So using artificial intelligence is a great way to help election officials design ballots that people won't misunderstand. Um, another example I'll point to that we funded is uh, deep fake detection. Um, and this could play into the VAAs, it could play in more uh, broadly in other areas, but we've done, a, we're funding a lot of research in um, detecting deep fakes using AI and ML. Um, and uh, that can have a big impact on, on elections. So I guess I'll conclude by saying there are great uses for AI and ML, but there are also terrible abuses that are potential, like uh, predicting the outcome of an election or trying to identify, um, uh, to say, uh, actually, let me st step back just a second, even though I said I was concluding, and say, we funded things like a project by Stephanie Singer at Portland State, um, looking at huge volumes of data that get collected about the elections, and can they tell us where there is likely to be errors? And Stephanie's team did not use machine learning. They used st some statistical measures, but they were not using machine learning. And I think we have to be really, really cautious about uh, using um, um, things like machine learning where we can't 
explain what it is exactly that cause, uh, causes us to doubt an election result. We've seen the impacts of that uh, in recent elections where we've heard claims of the election was stolen without any factual basis whatsoever. And machine learning has the opportunity to make that worse because you can't explain what, what's going on. So great uses for machine learning in some areas, but let's stay away from using it to predict how voters are going to vote or what totals are or what the, the uh, where there's um, potentials for uh, uh, results to be incorrect. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Anita. Thanks. So you've know, heard a, a kind of a range of things from human factors to supply chain. I want to go back to something Uwe brought up that I have seen, which is these um, these voting um, assistance uh, systems, uh, voting advice applications. So, uh, I mean, I've seen computer scientists that in good faith want to use these to nudge voters, maybe people who um, you know, aren't able to, to you know, read the news accurately or whatnot, to nudge them, to think about things. Um, I think that's a slippery slope, but I wanna go back to Uwe and ask, uh, I've seen these particularly popular outside the US. Why are they so popular? Is there a way to make them you know, it's impossible to get ground truth, but if they are increasing popularity, how would you improve them? And I want to hear uh, maybe from, from Jeremy and Ashish, your thoughts on these VAAs. Should I say something now? Yeah, yes, that's for you, yeah, please. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I think the only way forward is to have interdisciplinary teams and computer scientists should work with uh, political scientists and, and vice versa. And that's also what we're trying to do. Unfortunately, there's uh, kind of commercialized VAAs out there, big media, large media companies who don't put a lot of effort into the quality and the selection of the items, and they have no clue what kind of matching algorithms they're using, as long as it creates a couple of clicks on their uh, uh, websites. So th this is the real danger. And um, but they are very popular in countries where you have multi-party systems and maybe voters or citizens are a bit confused and they use these VAAs to get some information. The big danger is really that some young voters, apparently that comes out of kind of follow-up studies and survey research, that they take this for granted. And they think, you know, it, they don't take it as a learning experience and just additional information. They actually think that, oh, VAA says I'm supposed to vote for this or that candidate. So uh, it's also it's really also maybe some ethical guidelines are needed here that VAA designers need to make it explicit what kind of algorithms they're using. They You could have... It's quite easy these days. You could have a, a simple switch button allowing you to switch from one algorithm to the next one and see whether your kind of match holds or whether it changes. That would already alert the users that there, there's more truth than just one. But here, yeah, again, I think um, that there's... One problem for VAA designers is that they should come up in some political systems. In, you should come up with a VAA in, in a very short time. So there's time pressure for the designers. I experienced this myself. I do it with political scientists in Japan. So you have within a week, you're supposed to come up with perfectly balanced VAA items because the, the electoral schedule is so tight that you don't have and the uh, political parties come out with their manifestos in the last minute and then you're you know supposed to come up with a proper VAA so you're under enormous time pressure and here I think uh, data scientists and machine learning could help to just you have information overload so you could go over all these party manifestos use NLP language use language models to come up with some uh, item candidates that would, would help you to have a more informed choice of uh, VAAs. And last point here, you should have several VAAs. You know, this is, you should have several, we, we need a variety in the news. Uh, you should have different news sources. You should also have several VAAs. If you only have one, it, it's a bad idea. 
any thoughts on Jeremy and Ashish before we move yeah, on? Yeah, I, w- I want to jump in on that because yeah. I, I, I agree with what you're saying, Uwe, about multiple VAAs and multiple algorithms. But um, the reality of elections in the United States, and I don't know, I don't believe it's as bad in other countries, is the amount of money that's sloshing around is just unbelievable. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars in senatorial elections, billions of dollars in presidential elections peeling off a few million dollars uh, for a candidate to um, develop uh, t- um, input that will go into that that VAA that will cause it to mislead the voters is just astronomical. The value to the candidate of doing it is, is just really high if these ever become popular or where they are popular. Um, and I, I think that Spending nowadays, not um, moving forward with these without having a real understanding of how candidates, I mean, candidates are always trying to mislead them. They're always trying to game them. But now they can game them in whole new ways if they're using ML and AI uh, that, that may be indetectable to an ordinary reader, but the the... ML system may read between the lines, so to speak, and give bad advice. And so I think we have to be really, really cautious about this. I'm not aware of anybody who's uh, uh, looking at at that problem. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there are people. But that seems to me a a big risk. Ashish, any thoughts? Yeah, so... uh... So from my side, I think I think there are very excellent points uh, Zerem and you have uh, made already. Um, so VAs, when they start using, especially NLP, right, and and uh, I agree with uh, Jeremy, there's a lot of potential to actually uh, create uh, uh, create a lot of bias, especially generative bias, if you want to say, you know, with with the uh, current chat GPT and and others uh, capabilities that we have. It is easy to it is easy to uh, you know, fake uh, create defect videos, defect audios, um, uh, create a uh, create an informational threat. I would say, in in uh, that's what we call it. Um, that the the voters will be uh, will be socially engineered, you know, and and kind of an AI engineer to select one candidate versus another, or not for go not to go for voting at all. You know, there could be, especially, there could be veiled threats uh, that could be um, integrated with such messaging that uh, that they were uh, discouraged from going for, uh, from voting, you know. Uh, that I could want, happen, in, and if not in U.S., uh, it could happen in many parts of the world. I want to um, ask a question based, but, up, based on what you just said. I interrupt you for a second to ask this question. This is not a technical one, even though it's a technical panel, but... I mean, machine learning, as, as you're saying, machine learning has been used extensively in the past few years, especially to try to detect election misinformation, disinformation, deep fakes. I think the jury is still out on its effectiveness. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you, and particularly, is this an investment we should still be making? Should we do more, you know, sentiment analysis, more NLP or or less? I mean, CISA tried to do this with their disinformation governance board to tell people what's true and what's false. And clearly that was a big fail, but potentially there is a technical roadmap. So Ashish, we'll start with you. Is this an investment we should be making to do this better? Yes, so 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 that is a, that's a great point about uh, using AI, ML or machine learning for uh, trying to determine whether specific information is, is fake or not in that, in that um, uh, voting pipeline, right? And, and yes, uh, Machine learning is definitely a, a necessary component, but it's not a sufficient requirement. You know? Because machine learning can do only what it is trained for, the data that has been given, the kind of machine learning algorithms that have been used, uh, and kind of fairness that has been, that has been uh, designed it for. Uh, so, but however, it can only say whether it is fake or not fake based on the data set. That's why you need to have other provenance mechanisms, like where did this, uh, this uh, uh, information originated from about this this uh, uh, specific candidate, okay, or this specific uh, race or group of people, right, or this area 
where did where did this information come from? Or basically, if you look at an image, right? Oh, this this image shows that this candidate was doing that bad thing or good thing at this point of time. You know, how do you how do you determine this uh, or detect this defect information? For that, first of all, provenance. Second of all, you need to have a have a, again another democratic mechanism of uh, validating whether it is fake or not. If you cannot really establish in a, in a probable manner or verifiable manner, that is your actually blockchain plays a major role. You know, I we would say that again. Uh, you know, you have to be careful about how you build a blockchain network. Who who is part of that? Uh, are they are is there going to be a fifty one percent majority attack? Right, like in Bitcoin world that happens, right? How do they compromise consensus mechanism? So that's a that's a, another rabbit hole we want to go into. Sure. The last point I just want to make is that the the, the machine learning models that are used in entire of AI ML systems, you know, um, uh, should be should be carefully designed. Anyway, let me pause here, please. So, so, so yeah, can I jump in just for, for yeah, really please. briefly? Um, so what I was thinking about listening to these comments is. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard the uh, apocryphal story about subliminal advertising experiments in the 1950s. According to Snopes, they are apocryphal. They didn't actually happen. But the idea was that they would put um, uh, advertisements for popcorn in one frame uh, out of 24 or whatever in, in the movie, which would make people think they wanted popcorn and also make them thirsty go buy sodas but they didn't realize they were seeing this because it was subliminal like i say this the, there's no evidence that this actually occurred but what i wonder is is ai in a sense the 21st century version of subliminal advertising where things are happening that we don't even realize are happening um and we need to be very aware and very cautious of the reliance we have on these technologies can, can that you we give an can't example? understand. What's, what's an example of what you mean by that? Um, I'm, I'm having trouble uh, actually coming up with an example, but um, could these systems that we develop be uh, presenting information to us in ways that are not obvious to us? Uh, they're, they're very subliminal, but make us want to drink coke or vote for this candidate or whatever without ever coming out and saying it but but dropping hints um and these are things that uh, could be done by a human but uh, ai systems could enable uh candidates to do it much more effectively and rapidly uh than than doing it by hand uh and crafting and, messages and, and it is part of that perhaps hard like micro targeting for certain populations yeah. to, okay yeah, yeah. And I don't know how it would work, but but it, it just scares me. <laughs> but then again, I'm I'm something of a Luddite, not something. I am a Luddite when it comes to AI. Uh, Uwe, any thoughts on, you know, continuing to invest in um, this, kind, this uh, kind of technology to detect? It, it, would it even be effective to detect misdisinformation for uh, election uh, information using AI? Uh, Anita, if uh, I may ask the... Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, please. Um... Uh, I just wanted to make sure that the audience also uh, could have a word uh, because we'll have to wrap up in five minutes. But very quick question uh, because AI was being faulted, so I wanted to ask this question. <laughs> and, 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 and sorry for that. Uh, was that, uh, why blame the poor AI, just uh, algorithm? Uh, the thing is, uh, in network, we have a network stack, right? And you want reliable network, if we have a reliable network stack. In election, is there an election stack? Is there a trusted election stack on which we can kind of say that, okay, these are the gaps, because it seems to me that at every every stage of the election pipeline, which is being mentioned, right, there are so many issues, but there is no reference architecture, or am I reading it wrong? Because as an AI person, right, and many of the people in the room, they would say that, look, I'm looking for positive news, <laughs> and, and I don't see any uh, reference stack on which uh, I can say, okay, this is where my machine learning algorithms can be helped and all, all and so on. It seems like, okay, don't touch this area. I, I'm not saying don't touch it. I'm saying- I'm, I'm being extreme, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think there are areas that can be very useful. My fear is that it's being thrown about as a cure-all. 
So maybe a way to 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 turn what Bob said. I, I, I see there are some emerging NIST standards on election security. I don't. They don't look great to me. Are the, is this a case where we need some frameworks and standards, kind of the, the whole pipeline, the human to the voting machine, or is that too much? Or is is it a question of not good enough standards for the pipeline? I think one of the challenges for elections is there are no standards um, in the United States. There are roughly 53 different election systems, 50 states and three or six, depending on how you count it. Um, and, that, and it's completely different in other countries as well. So saying this is the standard um, is really hard because there's so much variability. I think we can identify some best practices, and I think that's what NIST is doing. I think it might make sense, and I have not looked to the latest NIST standard that you mentioned. Uh, it might make sense to see whether in that, that broad framework we could figure out where AI makes sense and where AI doesn't make sense. But um, I, it's a real challenge to give absolute answers in, in very many cases simply because of the level of variability. Ashish and uh, Ufe, any thoughts on standards? And I have one last question from the audience. Okay, so uh, a quick point that is uh, is that, uh, so in, in uh, security and cryptography, and especially in any, any, there is a maturity model, number one. There is no maturity model as, as uh, adding to what Jeremy mentioned. The second point is, there's something called fifth standard in crypto crypto cryptography we use a lot for any federal, uh, system that we implement or, or any any HIPAA compliant or other compliance related information system we implement, we have a specific uh, NIST standard that is there that we build a uh, cryptography algorithm and it is built by someone we trust and it has been tested rigorously. Such such AI models need to be tested and such, such as uh, election, election stack as Bipla pointed out, needs to be, needs to be vetted out properly you know, for by against bias, against fairness issues, against ethics issues, and against security issues and privacy issues. You know, and that becomes that is a compliant stack that we should use. Yeah, I I don't have a very good and uh, exciting answer. I think it just depends. I think we really have to go through all of what I listed. You know, and where can AI make a contribution? So we'd have to look at if discussions happen online in the internet, uh, learning, monitoring, being consulting, voicing opinion, identifying yourself, voting in the end. And all, we just have to go through all of these uh, and check whether machine learning, AI can make a real uh, a contribution. And uh, sometimes maybe, as Jeremy said, it's certainly not a, a cure for all and maybe can do more harm than good. So we have to, then we have to, to make that explicit again as well. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so it's a word about time. I have one question from online from uh, Mary Claire O'Sullivan, who is from Ireland's newly established Electoral Commission. And she asks, are there examples of good collaborations between AI specialists and political scientists, either on practical projects or uh, research that you can point to that would help her? And Maybe there she can't pick off hand, we could always uh, forward the emails along. And there could be security scientists also, so security researchers for sure. <laughs> I mean, from my side, we we started to to work to to look at VAAs in that way, and we're we're currently doing this. But other than that, I think that's also yeah one thing that comes out of this uh, whole program here and uh, panel that this is probably needed, and uh, we should we should go forward like that. We work, work together on that. Jeremy, so, spring to my, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was just going to mention Mike Alvarez's uh, project that I mentioned earlier at Caltech. Um, Mike includes some political scientists in his project, and they are uh, working with AI specialists. So that would be uh, an example. I don't think I have uh, anything big to, to offer, uh, but um, that's just one that, that strikes me. Mm -hmm. And can Mary get a hold of you? Should I give her your uh, your address just in case she wants to yeah. know you do? Okay. Yeah. I will. So, sorry, I, I was just going to say that um, I will have this question followed up. Uh, Chris Dawes, one of our co-organizers, might know a lot. He has been working extensively with um, 
uh, New York uh, ecosystem, election ecosystem on uh, these points. And uh, last but not the least, uh, uh, our, the fifth talk in the paper uh, session where we are talking about some of the things, uh, we have journalists and AI scientists involved, but we are also uh, taking help from political scientists. Just wanted to mention that. Wonderful. Well, thank you, this followed up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Ashish, any, any, any final comments from anybody? Ashish or Jeremy online or, or Uve, any final comments before we take a coffee break? Thanks very much for the opportunity to join you. All right. Well, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a great, great panel. Thank you. Fine for me as well. Great. Okay. Thanks, Anita. So we'll take a, about 17 minute break and then we will reconvene at 11 o'clock. In that session, we will have a panel discussion on technology and people for in the election ecosystem, followed by two paper re, uh, reviewed papers. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome back for the second half of the morning session to, right now. Uh, we are going to start with a panel discussion for about 45 minutes, and then we will have uh, uh, two uh, reviewed papers. So uh, the topic of the panel is uh, elections and technology empowering people. On the panel, we have Dr. Neeta Verma. Uh, she is with the Election Commission in India. Uh, uh, Dr. Neeta, has extensive experience in all forms of data governance uh, handling at the India's national level. Uh, she also is uh, right now at Election Commission, as I mentioned, and looking at various uh, issues related to election at a, such a large scale where 1 billion people are voting one time or the other in various forms of election um, at various scale. The other panelist we have is uh, Dr. Deepak Padunabhan. He is currently at uh, Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, earlier, he was uh, at IBM Research. Uh, Deepak has worked uh, ex extensively in data management, information, and right now he is working on trust issues with AI. Also, uh, Dan, are we to have him? We are supposed to have Professor Dan Wallach. Uh, Dan, if you are in the link, can you please uh, turn your camera on? Okay, uh, uh, I, I guess uh, he will join. Um, uh, Professor Dan Wallach is at uh, uh, Rice University, and uh, he is uh, uh, he studies various forms of computer security, uh, including electronic voting, and he serves on IEEE. Uh, he's the IEEE representative for uh, U.S. Election Assistance Commission. So we hope he can also join. The purpose of this um, uh, panel is to look at technology and its interplay with people. Are people able to use the available technology? What issues they are facing? How can uh, those issues, can technology actually address them? What's the future and topics like that? So I would like to start by asking Dr. Neeta Verma to make introductory uh, comments on this. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Am I audible with this? Uh, yes. No. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Again, it's a pleasure uh, to be here on this. Just, just one minute, Nita. Uh, there's a lot of echo. Should we go on mute? Uh, can you please say something? Hello. Good morning. Okay. Uh, please. So, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here on this panel. Is there a problem? Should I connect to some other audio system? Uh, yes, Neeraji, if you can please reconnect, that would be okay. And okay, so you can continue with Deepak. Let me again try and connect. Sure, please.
can you test uh, diplav is this good now very good okay thank you very good thank you very much so can i yeah please go ahead thank you so uh, as the uh, as diplav said that i am looking after it in election commission nowadays so when you say about technology and people you know elections if you look at it are far more than just the polling process or counting and publishing of results you know it starts from enrollment of voters into an electoral roll uh, updating keeping their information up to date providing services to them to be able to uh, update their information when it is needed uh, confirmation of when the election comes confirmation of their uh, name in the roll their constituency from where they'll vote to the polling booth which they have to go then coming to political parties allowing them or giving them provisions to file their nominations online and the whole lot of affidavits they have to tell in terms of what kind of assets they have what kind of uh, criminal antecedents they have and then also to be able to give provisions for candidates because you know elections and particularly talking of free and fair elections discloses play a very important role as far as transparency is concerned so giving candidates a provision where they could see what kind of uh, affidavits these uh, their candidates have their file then we have model code of conduct which has its own set of rules so how do you ensure compliance to that address all the grievances which have been come to this and then finally planning of elections that how many booths we need to have uh, how do we really deploy the personnel how do we make the largest the voting machines as i was saying when we have general election we have about 1 million booths where about 10 million people have to be posted all from our regions outside then where their posting has to be done so in all these processes we use technology in a big way and this technology helps us in not only introducing a lot of efficiency uh, a lot of uh, it it helps us bringing a lot of transparency uh, it also helps us uh, bring in uh, a kind of uh, you know doing our disclosures uh, or following all sops which is actually needed or a cornerstone of any uh, democratic uh, democracy as a whole or, or the fundamental of the elections which we kind of conduct so uh and i just tell you and this is something not what we are doing we also use in india electronic voting machines for uh, for conduct of for, for people to poll their votes and all but we recently had january you know a, a conference of election management bodies across the world where about 16 different um, election bodies from 16 different countries and international organizations like ifs and idea had you know, participated topic was use of technology for elections integrity and by and large many of these uh, emb's have, are either using technology uh, to connect with people during all this process or some of they are different level of maturity so technology definitely plays a very important role uh, as far as uh, elections of conduct is concerned another thing which um, you know in our country now we are at good about 60 67% of voting happens in safa elections but you would like more and more people it's to be more and more inclusive so we have programs where we are doing the outreach to these uh, voters uh, to be able to come on that particular voting day and lot of initiatives we uh, we have taken and which i think as we go forward i'll share those there also technology plays a very critical role thank you uh thanks nita ji uh deepak do you want to make some introductory comments here okay yeah um i hope you can hear me people uh, yeah mass quality good okay yes, yeah yes. so <clears throat> i'll just start by talking a little bit about ai uh, so we live in an era when uh, when ai is all around us uh, such so as search navigation social media feeds everything is determined by ai <clears throat> and uh, these use methods like deep neural networks and and very data driven methods uh, complex arrangements of non linear units and so on and so forth so uh, this is probably enhanced effectiveness of ai for a variety of different tasks and also um, more importantly enhance the remit of ai from traditional tasks uh, towards things like predictive policing and judicial decision making and actually in a way if you look at it elections are probably the only sector where ai has not really found a lot of widespread usage in the core parts of it 
So <clears throat> I would like to think of two kinds of tasks for which AI techniques are being applied. The first is things like handwriting recognition, object identification from images and other forms of pattern recognition. In these cases, <clears throat> you are basically transferring mundane tasks from the user to the AI. And when AI addresses these tasks, the actual mode of operation is still very controlled and restricted to specific settings. And you could say that the agency or the power to or the power of decision making is still substantially with the human. The second kind of tasks are those which traditionally have made use of significant human agency. For example, you can think of CCTV footages and classifying them as either suspicious or normal. And uh, there is a broad range in, um, of, of things in between. Like, I mean, some of them are suspicious, clearly some of them are normal. And experts could disagree uh, within this ambiguous range as to whether something is suspicious or normal. So there's a lot of human agency in these kinds of processes. <clears throat> So while handing over these kinds of tasks to AI, we are also giving up human agency to some extent. So, so there are two fundamental uh, different ways of handing over tasks to AI. One is with a lot of agency, another one is without um, uh, handing over a lot of agency. So elections within representative democracies are a domain where human agency is considered very important. The human voter thinks through the options before her and exercises, the, exercises her right by choosing particular candidates in an election. The exercise of agency holds a lot of, lot of importance. It's in the center stage. And the election officials are very well trained uh, to ensure that the electoral processes are working well. And they also exercise their agency in determining strategies to raise awareness among voters, ensure integrity of voter lists, combat electoral fraud, ensure secrecy and security of the process and all sorts of other matters. So one way to think of um, AI and elections is to think of how AI could help in ensuring the primacy of human agency within the electoral process. So these days, one of the major issues with elections is that of disinformation. So disinformation can be thought of as undermining voter agency by priming them towards or against a particular candidate. AI techniques could be used in a positive way to ensure that voters are safeguarded from disinformation and so that they get to see the various options out there, various opinions out there and make a recent, a recent decision. However, if AI techniques to combat disinformation are more effective against a particular flavor of disinformation as opposed to another, then it could end up undermining human agency in a particular way. So uh, coming to the actual uh, processes of elections, a simple application could be to identify suspicious voters in voter lists. And this is about basically ensuring um, <clears throat> uh, that there are no false positives. So there is another part of the problem, which is basically about false negatives who are eligible, eligible voters uh, who, are, uh, who, are, who don't figure in the voter list. So can AI um, uh, be used to address both of these things? Typically it's used in a carceral way, it's used in, it's used in a fault point way, but can it be used in other ways as well? <clears throat> and so that you can, you can ensure the integrity and, uh, and, and make sure that all eligible people are able to use their uh, agency in the elections. And when it comes to electoral fraud, and I'll just use an example here, within a polling booth uh, using video-based AI, you're trying to combat electoral fraud. And depending on what data the AI was trained over, there could be specific kinds of false positives and other kinds of false negatives. <clears throat> So thus, the decisions of such AI um, actually should be read as very contingent and not as absolute. And the system should be set up in a non-imposing way so that the agency of the electoral official to make the final determination is protected to the fullest extent. So similarly, video monitoring equipment should not create an intimidating atmosphere for voters, leading to voters thinking that the vote might be recorded in a particular, in some way. And that could create some pressures of voting in favor of the dominant party, which once again undermines the agency of the voter, uh, which is sought to be protected by the secret ballot process. Um, and, and surveillance is one of these factors there. In short, I'll just conclude here, but I wish to put agency gradients in AI usage within elections as a topic for discussion and debate. And each usage of AI within elections, I believe should be evaluated upon how it enhances the process to bring benefits to all involved while protecting the agency of the humans involved in the process who are interested with the process itself. And in other words, we should consider AI usage that undermines human agency as a red line. Uh, this is just a thought. And this could make it markedly different from usage of AI in certain other sectors. And so how can AI enhance elections while remaining true to the ideal of the primacy of human agency within it? So this is a question that I would like to pose um, uh, as a thought question. Thanks. Okay. So, thanks, Deepak. Um, 
Bharat, if uh, Professor Dan joins, please let me know. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, uh, so, given that uh, you know um, we have raised various ways that uh, AI can actually help people, uh, I want to start with by asking you: Is it actually helping people, and especially people who really need help? So, I'm talking about inclusivity and people with the cognitive. Uh, uh, failures or uh, people who actually need decision support. So as you know, AI, one way, view of looking at AI is as a decision support tool. So people who really need help, do you think that today it is offering help? People who can be physically, um, um, I mean, they might face hardship or they might actually have cognitive hardship or they might have uh, access hardship because they're dependent for taking them somewhere and so on. Uh, and and uh, what is the role of technology in those things? So, um, Nita, Nita or uh, Deepak, uh, whichever, whoever wants to take this. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, first of all, you know, I just also wanted to kind of tell that when we use AI uh, in a big way in purification of our electoral rules, you know, and that is where we have used techniques like, you know, photo similar entries because we have photos of these voters. So we do a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, at a periodic interval, uh, a kind of verification or, or comparison of these photos and wherever we have found that there is similarity because again, these algorithms will answer to certain level of uh, um, accuracy and also it is not that simply by finding these photo similar entries, we kind of remove them. We again go through a proper process of ground verification but our experience in the last one and a half year of using these algorithms has been they are quite effective. A large number of duplicates or records are being detected during this process, which really helps us, you know, keeping our so that one voter is only registered in one constituency at one place. Uh, we also do similarly um, uh, algorithms like demographically similar entries where we compare certain demographic parameters of, of the candidates with each other and find out. And the best part is over the time, you know, because it is not this AI, we find out we have to make sure that this is a fundamental right of citizens to vote. So erroneously, we should not uh, remove anyone's name. So there is a very well-defined SOP at the back of it, which has a very robust uh, um, a procedure to be followed with ground verification and with this then. But all in all, this has been very helpful in terms of uh, this thing and results are quite encouraging and therefore we plan to do these cycles on a repeated thing. One of the problem or challenge we have, you know, we are, as you know, is over 95 million voters in our electoral role. And you know, India has a wide uh, demography or diversity of demography, diversity of education and access to technology. So when we turn to voter education or voter awareness uh, is one of the important uh, activity of the commission. And that is where reaching all these people and with, in their own languages, in their own dialects, to be able to answer the, their queries and all, that is where we are exploring the use of these, so to say, generative AI and and all these NLPs and all those things so that we could really make some kind of an instrument chatbot or whatever you may call it, uh, which should really be able to talk to these voters into a language, into a dialect, which they will be, um, which they understand kind of a thing. And I think if we do a good job there, we will really be able to uh, educate and go towards that goal of inclusivity where we want everybody. Another thing regarding this, uh, uh, citizens who are, we in our country call them divyans, which is basically uh, people who are with have some kind of special abilities or disabilities. For them, we have this uh, option of, you know, they can, we have this accessible application, mobile application where they can go, they can register themselves, whether it's a permanent disability or it's a temporary disability. They could hide, they could mark it there. And then we have a provision of sending a team to their home to make them vote uh, with a, this complete procedure of recording and all, but that is how we are helping. But, or in case they would like to come to the poll, uh, polling booth, so if they, they want a wheelchair or they want any kind of a volunteer to help. So all those provisions have been done, but as far as technology is concerned, we are essentially using them to be reaching out to us and marking themselves and seeking help. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. Um, I. I welcome the audience to ask at any stage. 
I just want to correct one uh, thing which uh, uh, Nitaji mentioned, which was uh, nine, not 95 million, but 950 million. Sorry, uh, sorry, uh, 950 million. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nothing, no, nothing in India is in one or two millions. It's always in hundreds yeah. or thousands sorry. of millions. Thank you, Vipla. Yeah. This is 950. Yeah. yeah. So the uh, I want to just follow up on um, your point, and uh, which was that... Um, technology, uh, including AI technology, all of them will fail at some stage. So what is the backup or what is the recourse people have? Uh, for example, your face is not getting recognized or your voter, uh, this thing is not getting recognized, you know? So what is the recourse? What, what is the human and technology uh, backup system, right? When failures occur, what can a voter do? Or, uh, or what is the general thought behind those mechanisms? Uh, independent of individual technology, right? The te technologies keep changing, but I think I'm just kind of asking, what is the support system for human AI backup uh, recovery, so to say? Yeah, when the so, failure happens. So this process of verification is not online. It is not during voting. This is this is in the in the uh, in the offline mode. We do these kind of verifications, and as I said, that base is sometimes photo quality may not be good. Sometimes match is not uh, at a certain level of percentage. So algorithms basically do these matchings and put kind of how much percent has matched or whatever other attributes. Then this has been sent to the ground in every booth. We have a booth level officer, which is a kind of extension of any government extension office. These officers then have to go to the ground, confirm with these people. And if only after they have verified that this person's name is appearing at two places, then only the name gets. Otherwise, Till that process is done, the things go on as it is. So it, it, it's not during the voting time, it is the non-voting time these processes take place. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, I want to uh, pick up on the uh, original question, uh, Deepak, to you, uh, which is that how do you see inclus inclusivity uh, being promoted with AI technology. And this is one area where you are very passionate about. So of, of different kinds, right? So uh, do you want to make a comment about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, so I mean, uh, of course, I mean, uh, 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 I mean, over the last couple of decades or something, I mean, there has been a lot of lot of people have been put on the information superhighway. So there is the digital divide has kind of reduced significantly in some parts of the world. Some parts of the world not so much, um, but um, uh, yeah, but that has been so. So people are more familiar with digital technologies uh, than maybe a couple of decades back. Um, uh, so, um, so in that sense, when you're looking at when you're looking at ways of addressing some of these issues um, and AI and technological ways of addressing some addressing some of these issues may not really feel very intimidating. Might actually be be reasonably um, be reasonably friendly um, uh, to voters as compared to maybe potentially earlier times. And one particular thing that I would like to mention here is uh, sometimes when you put in when you put in some of these technologies within within like say public sector uh, operations, let's say, um, and and you and you have algorithms make a particular kind kind of uh, particular kind of suggestion and it should be easy and this is something that you also mentioned people have a couple of minutes back about the appeals process it should be easy to actually override that thing uh, and it should not come across in a way that it that it is it makes it easy to comply with that um, but very hard to very hard to uh, kind of go against it. Um, uh, so in the sense, uh, I mean, all the, all of these AI decisions are contingent, contingent on the training data, contingent on various kinds of things. So it should be it should be quite easy to be able to. I mean, they should actually help us rather than rather than imposing a particular viewpoint upon us. And it's increasingly hard to ensure that this happens uh, easily within the public sector because public sector. Across the world has been has been facing serious cuts, austerity, and so on and so forth. So uh, so you have fewer and fewer people to address um, uh, to address some of these tasks, um, and and there's a lot more pressure uh, to to have a high throughput and so on. So when you look at uh, from the lens of efficiency and so on, um, ensuring that there is an ease of appeals, ease of ensure, ease of overriding the AI decisions, it, it's it's kind of tricky from various angles. Uh, so that's something that uh, that would be interesting to look at as well the human AI interface and, and how it could work uh, synergistically rather than uh, one dominating the other. Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned, audience, please feel free to ask any question at any stage. Uh, the next question which I have is that uh, there are a bunch of uh, uh, AI researchers and especially students uh, in the audience. The question which comes to mind is, 
if I do something today, how can I make it election ready, right? How can I make it uh, applicable to the election area? I might be working in uh, uh, face recognition, the example you were mentioning, I might be working in sentiment uh, detection, uh, I might be doing a chatbot, I might be doing uh, uh, something else uh, like a sound and translation, right? What should I be doing? How can I convince the election officials that my technology is good enough for that purpose? And uh, are there any specific things which you would look for? Or if I just say that, look, I have the best state of the art in this competition, uh, am I good enough? So generally, how do we go about it? Like when you were trying to assess this, let's say photo verification uh, algorithms. Uh, so generally we have a concept of, so to say, um, kind of doing a POC with the various algorithms because maybe a particular algorithm is doing well with a certain amount of data, especially if somebody's come who's applied for some Western or specific countries data, especially faces have these kind of challenges. So you, you sort of, and also the quality of photo, what we have, because remember we have photos which has been collected uh, quite a few years ago, uh, ago also over the time. So that time resolutions and all may not be that high. So we kind of do a POC with those algorithms and that's our way of, you know, taking any technology and then this is that we first decide the quality and then we go on the other parameters of pricing and all those things. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, as far as, um, if you say, see, as um, we do not have any spe <laughs> specific standards, we kind of go into what is the best as far as this particular technology is concerned in terms of accuracy and all. But those are primarily, they do work as a reference points. It be more rely on, on our, because we have an advantage of having a huge amount of data. So running a POC in our data is far more, it's much simpler for us. And we then kind of, and that's how we do any technology is generally doing POCs, seeing the outcome, sharing with all, because it's, as you say, election is again a multi-stakeholder. It's not that I have to be happy with this. I have to be convincing all my stakeholders, whether my state election officials or whether political parties and everybody else. So all these technologies, if you look at EVMs, you know, we have electronic voting machines, I mean, which was a very new kind of a technology. It has, it, it, it has kind of come into election in a very graded manner. We had POCs, then we had smaller elections coming, then we have larger elections coming. And it has taken about 15 to 20 years when we said no, now all elections will be only through this electronic mode. So the process of induction of technology is, uh, is normally very, very graded, very, very careful, and making sure that we have trust and buy-in of, of all stakeholders, because we are always conscious that what we are doing is, on, is hinging on the democracy of the country and, which is, uh, and the fundamental right of the citizens. Uh, Deepak, any comments on that? So, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, um, very, very interesting to you, uh, Nita. Um, so, uh, so one of the things that I would like to just, just quickly mention here is um, uh, a distinction that some philosophers make between risk and uncertainty. So, so while we, while we train these machine learning models or AI models, uh, we, we generally take a look. Uh, we generally take a view towards reducing risk, the risk of making bad predictions, the risk of making embarrassing predictions, and all of these kinds of things. Um, uh, whereas, uh, whereas there is uh, there, there is something else called uncertainty which is basically when when things go, don't go in the way that was in the way that is aligned with the assumptions that were made while the development of while during the development of the model mm, for example there would be other actors um, uh, in the in the in the entire electoral system and they might they might try to use it in a particular way that you did not even plan um, uh, that these ai systems would be used for they might they might i mean a new particularly new form of disinformation might come into the play um, uh, various kinds of uncertainties around it so so i think um, i think it's uh, i mean i think it's important uh, like like nita also stressed i mean it's it's probably important and to ensure that there is a graded introduction of these technologies just so that we don't we don't um, we don't get we don't get very bad we don't end up in very bad situations because of these uncertainties that we did not plan for if there is a graded introduction we see we get some visibility into the uncertainty as it is in the field and then we can deepen uh, as we as we go along uh, to, uh, while taking care of these uncertainties 
as well so so it's it's important to um, keep in mind that i mean the, there's there's a very dynamic ecosystem there are voters there are political parties there are there are corporate interests at play there are all sorts of things at play and so uh, the uncertainty involved is is quite big as compared to certain other things like say face recognition and and so on and so forth and within like say access entry access systems um and, and and stuff like that so yeah that's i think something to keep in mind okay so we have a question uh, for Nitaji. Um, we have uh, uh, Mary uh, from the Ireland Election Commission. And the question for you is that uh, you mentioned about the recent conference with a number of electoral commissions recently in India. So could you say a bit more about what came through from that conference in terms of different approaches in different countries or lessons or conclusions that uh, you took from the conference? Thank you. I will uh, so I will also share. We had prepared a small summary report. I'll share with you, people, and maybe you can then send across. Okay. Uh, but essentially, you know, as I said, most of the um, uh, election management bodies are using IT. Everybody say IT is something which is today not a choice. It's by default that you have to do. But mostly, IT is being used. Technology solutions is being used for. Uh, management of your electoral role, maintaining the sanctity and purity of it, planning of elections, arranging all logistics, the two processes, and again for the counting and publishing of results, technology is being used by quite a few bodies and some are preparing to go towards that side. But as far as the voting per se is concerned, there was a very, very small, we had a presentation from Georgia, I believe, and uh, I think Estonia was not there. They also, so they are trying to get it to, uh, trying to experiment onto this online voting, but this online was again, not fully online. They were trying to get data downloaded onto a pre-designed machine and things like this. Like we do electronic voting machines. Our electronic voting machine is again, totally disconnected machine, which is not connected from the net. So. So on that front, everybody was apprehensive because everybody's concern was that gaining the trust of the stakeholders, particularly the political parties, is a challenging task. And because moment you connect anything onto the internet, uh, internet, then it, it's very difficult to prove that it cannot be tampered. You know, you you may give all technology logics of cybersecurity, blockchain, and all those things, but. Still, I think, or maybe I think we need some more time. As I said, even EVMs took a long time. It'll be a slow process, but I'm sure. But one thing which all the election management bodies uh, kind of raised their concern, and I have recently started getting deeper into it, is about the concern for disinformation. Uh, that is where they all were concerned. And with the kind of speed and the networks and this cloud, the speed at which this disinformation spreads and goes viral, was a concern, how do we contain? Because elections are for a limited time and if you're not able to counter that disinformation into that particular time or with the speed, that really becomes, then that then can influence elections you know, or disrupt elections in a big way. Um, I was also trying to read through the various solutions and all. Um, it is a challenging thing, especially with the new kind of things as I was hearing these deep fakes and all those things, they're becoming so sophisticated and they're becoming so democratized that anybody could create these kinds of, you do not really need to have those, so to say, very niche specialists with you. With these kind of things, that is really a concern. It is a concern for us also that how do we really, and I really look forward to solutions for that, where you could really, how do, so, so so as of today, if you ask me, I mean, I opinion which I am coming is that it is not only from technology, maybe we have to put a lot of other communication, reactive and proactive strategies in place to be able to counter this kind of a, uh, disinformation. But I think if you could be supported with, uh, with, with good, robust technology platforms where you can quickly detect these things, it will be of great help. Because as I always said, speed is very critical when it comes to disinformation of elections. Um, these were the things and I don't know if I've social, again, the concern of social media that how do we really have these kind of arrangement with this popular social media platforms so that, uh, so that, I mean, they could also take some kind of responsible behavior, particularly during elections to be able to 
proactively removed if they find any kind of these deep deep fakes or any kind of disinformation which is affecting the process of election so election management bodies they are not getting into the other parts of this which is a kind of between political parties our concern is on disinformation regarding the process of election which can impact the process or, or influence elections in one way or other so so that was another concern but in any case i'll share the report also with you which you can share with us okay uh, thank you uh, i wonder if there is any follow up question so please uh, mary please feel free to ask uh, there is another question uh, uh, Anything, uh, Deepak, you want to add if you on this one? Uh, yeah, I, well, uh, not quite, but I just um, I just posted a few links on on this uh, on some of these in, uh, debates around uh, between electoral bodies, and there are conferences that are emerging where yeah. electoral uh, like like Neeta mentioned. I put, I put in a, a couple of links on the chat, but I think people yeah. who they physically cannot see this. But yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll happy to. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and uh, I, I'm very happy that uh, Dan could uh, join. And uh, Dan, apologies uh, if uh, uh, I changed the time zone and I caught you by surprise. But uh, well, I had another meeting scheduled from uh, during the pr previous hour, and it just ended. And I saw your email, and I'm like, oh. So I, I got here as fast as I possibly. Okay. Uh, okay. So all right. So we are very glad that uh, Dan, you could uh, join and. Um, as I mentioned, Dan is um, a professor of computer science at uh, Rice University, and he works uh, extensively on um, uh, elections and voting voting machines and uh, in the context of elections also. And uh, Dan, um, uh, I would like uh, you to make some uh, uh, introductory comments. And what we were discussing right now was uh, how technology, um, uh, in your particular case, the voting technologies and so on, they are uh, uh, they are posing threats to uh, to voters around the world and uh, how people are using the technology and what gaps are there. So that was the context. Thanks, Dan. Okay, so I guess I'll do a I'll try to keep this very high level, and uh, I assume that people will ask questions and help drive the discussion. So my name is Dan Wallach. I'm a professor at Rice University. I work on voting security. And I've worked on finding bugs in voting machine software. I've worked on designing better voting technologies. I've worked with election officials, usability experts. Um, voting is cuts across many different areas of computer science and other aspects of other academic disciplines that have nothing to do with computer science. And we're all trying to solve the same problem, which is to make sure that the voting systems accurately reflect the will of the people, even in the face of um, bad actors trying to tamper with election results, perhaps. So there are, we have to face a number of threats, but we also have to do it on a budget and it has to be usable. Um, we can't expect voters to be able to execute complicated cryptographic protocols in their head, even though that would sure make life a lot easier, but unfortunately that doesn't work. Um, so instead, we have to have computers operating on our behalf, and how do we trust the computers? So the election machines became popular in the US about 20 years ago, uh, and they have been, and their popularity has been up and down. Recent trends have been going away from the earlier machines that had no paper whatsoever. They only recorded votes electronically to newer machines where either you have hand-marked paper or you have a machine that's called a ballot marking device that has a user interface on the computer, but it prints a paper ballot. Security people really like paper ballots because it's very hard for, they're, they're, they're permanent, they're tangible. And then you can have physical processes for storing them, for recounting them, for maintaining them in a way that some hacker over the internet cannot mess with a box full of paper. Um, so that's a big deal. Um, uh, usability people are mixed on paper because not everybody has the ability to operate a pen and fill in a bubble. And so that's a very real challenge. And so the usability aspects of, of that matter, because voting is an unusual activity because it's something done by everybody, old people, young people, people who are not necessarily literate in the language, 
people who might be blind, people who might have motor control issues, everybody has a right to vote. And creating a technology that's easy to use for literally everybody is a hard challenge. Um, how's that for a super quick overview? Happy to go deeper if people want to know more. So um, uh, thanks to Dan for the intro. So one question uh, which came earlier was, uh, how is um, uh, this looked at from the prism of inclusivity, like people of different cognitive, physical, and such capabilities? So uh, are those uh, considered or uh, they have been ignored until now in the US or generally? No, I would say that this is a challenge that's front of mind to everybody who works in elections. Um, so the issue is not necessarily that we're worried about people who aren't thinking clearly, although they vote too. We're worried about people who make mistakes, people who don't follow instructions, people who are in a hurry, people who might have dyslexia, people who might not be um, literate. These are all perfectly valid, reasonable, commonly occurring cognitive conditions that we have to deal with. Um, and this is often considered an argument in favor of having a user interface, having a computer between the voter and the record of their vote. Because a computer can have large type for people with low vision, a computer can have headphones for people who are blind, a computer can have various assistive devices for people with low motor control. There are things called sip and puff devices for people who can't move their hands at all. Um, there are a wide variety of assistive technologies that computers can use. And being able to do that expands the, the, the franchise of voting to a broader class of people to be able to vote without having a human assistant. Uh, people, people love to vote by themselves. That, that, that privacy is important for not just for security, it's important for people's sense of participation in the election that they did it themselves. So absolutely, this is something that is uh, close to mind. And sometimes this need for usability and accessibility and the desire for security can come in conflict with each other. You know, a security person might say, I insist on having hand marked paper ballots because then I don't have to worry about the security of the software that's assisting the voter. So that's a very typical and common and very reasonable argument. Um, and so then the question is, can we either mitigate the security risks of malware inside this assistive computer, or can we minimize the number of voters and provide it as an option to voters who want it, but allow a pen and paper to voters who don't want it? And that might also have cost ramifications because if, say, five to 10% of the voters need an assistive technology and the, and the rest are happy with pen and paper, we might be able to run an election for less money. And I don't wanna be crass, but money matters. Elections are expensive and anything we can do to reduce election expenses while still making them usable and secure and accurate and everything else matters. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh so um, we do have uh, questions coming in online, but I'm wondering if uh, people in the in the class, I'm saying, sorry, in the room, <laughs> uh, they have- We're all professors, uh, we all teach. <laughs> yeah, so because if you're not, don't ask, then it's a class, okay? <laughs> all right, so um, we have a question uh, coming from uh, Prasad, uh, who was asking that what are some of the channels in which uh, researchers, practitioners can come in contact with election officials to discuss ideas related to technology? What are the venues by which they can interact with election officials? Uh, Nitaji, to you, but also to other panelists because you may have interacted with them. So what are some of the uh, avenues for interaction? Yeah, definitely, you are most welcome. You know, we are all our email addresses and contact numbers are there on our website, Election Commission of India's website, which is called eci.gov.in. 
and you can write a mail to uh, and what is the portfolio each officer looks into that's also mentioned there so you can always write a mail and uh, uh, seek an appointment if you are not in india you can always look for a vc meeting um, or you can seek some information over the email as well okay uh dan or deepak do you have anything otherwise i have one uh, one um, experience to share um, i'll just say that i've interacted with election officials in a variety of different uh, venues um sometimes election officials show up at voting security workshops uh there's one called evote id which is held in europe um there's another one the defcon voting village cuz where would you rather be in august than las vegas um and that an, a huge number of election officials and even politicians will show up at the defcon voting village and they get to interact with the researchers and hacker types who show up there um also sometimes i've been invited to go to things there is something called uh, iacriot which is the international association of county recorders and i forget the rest of the acronym it's where all of the us election officials from all the local counties go like once or twice a year and they have meetings there's another there's another one called the national association of secretaries of state which is sort of a level up in the political hierarchy that also meets once or twice a year covid has kind of made a mess of all of these things but um so there are plenty of venues where you a researcher can go interact with election officials whether it's computer ish venues that attract election people or election ish venues that attract computer people and sometimes you get invited that's always fun i've i've been invited sometimes to go testify at hearings or to come collaborate with election officials so it happens in a variety of ways ebook uh well i haven't interacted much with election officials and uh, well in the way that i wanted to in the terms of like um, uh, i mean um where where policy decisions get made etc but uh, yeah it's good to hear some of these and maybe i should uh, maybe i could also point that there's the somebody from the election election Com electoral commission of um, ireland here so she might have a word to say or something mary uh, yeah i don't know i don't know if it's okay to or maybe people have you can go with your uh, media uh, experience i think <laughs> do you want to unmute mary if mary if you want to say please uh, unmute yourself you you should be able to sure. say can you can you hear me yeah. yeah great yeah well just to say this is this is an ideal event for me because i've only been working our electoral commission was set up a few days ago and i've only been working there since uh, the middle of january so um the timing of this couldn't be better so i mean i think um unfortunately we didn't get to attend the conference in india but i'm delighted to hear about some of the challenges that came from there because my one of my particular roles will be indeed around disinformation and misinformation and how to tackle that and and the points that nita varma made there about speed and and how to counteract it i think it's interesting to hear that these are challenges that other countries are are grappling with as well and just i mean we will be very keen to interact with researchers in 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 all fields we, you know our legislation provides for a number of advisory groups and consultative groups and so on and i think one thing we'll be very keen to do is is to speak to ex experts not only in other countries like the uh, electoral commission of india but also to some of the researchers that we've heard from today um i'll see how late i can our time difference is is quite different it's a bit later in ireland but i'm hoping to stay as as late as i can and and hear that the topics and um i'll certainly be hoping to to meet some of you in in person at future events because it's been really ideal to be able to sit in today so thank you very much uh, thank you uh, mary uh, for the kind words and uh, yeah we definitely that's the aim of the uh event that to promote cooperation uh, and uh, among um, not only within the research community but across uh, different uh, uh, stakeholders uh, i i want to just mention here uh, to prasad's question that uh, in uh, our experience including experience just two weeks back um uh, in in the us but uh, starting with the, about 10 years back experience uh, starting with the uh, nitaji's uh, organization when she was running data.gov.in one fine day i sent an email and uh, it's uh, and and they quickly responded and uh, we have been friends since then 
And uh, two weeks back, um, uh, Vignesh, who, uh, our collaborator, and myself, uh, we went to South Carolina's election commission, um, and uh, we walked to them uh, because they were not responding to some emails. And then they said, uh, here is the right email on which you should send us, and we will do, but please don't come to our office. Uh, sorry, it was not Vignesh, but Brett. And then um, uh, another colleague, Brett Robertson. And then uh, we came back, and then they were very responsive. So. I think that uh, I would say uh, our experience, whatever data points we have, uh, has been extremely good. Uh, just that, uh, you know, sometimes it takes time to find the right email. Okay, uh, so we are getting out of time. I would uh, like to uh, give a last opportunity to all the speakers, as well as first starting with the people in the audience, in the room, or uh, online, and then uh, each of the speakers, if you want to say anything. So in the room first. No. Uh, online? No. So, uh, uh, Deepak, why did you go first? And then uh, uh, Nitaji and then Dan. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, so just a very quick comment here. Yeah. So, uh, so things are moving at a, at a much faster pace than one can, one can potentially imagine. Just before the last panel, people were talking about voting uh, assistants, agents, and so on, which I wasn't really aware of. So, so I think, I mean, it's important to have this debate and uh, about how technology should influence elections and how technology could work with elections. Um, at this point in time, when we still have the time to, uh, to apply due process, because very soon, uh, very soon, it might be, might be too late and, and technology Technology would have taken over, so at which time we can only we can only complain and, and go back. So so it's it's uh, it's important to have these conversations now, and and I think it's sometimes important, uh, not very easy to realize that technology is moving at a, such a fast pace and and penetrating into some of these processes at such a fast pace. So yeah, that's it from me. Yeah, Nitaji. Oh. I feel as far as technology is concerned, we all have been using for decades in elections in one way or the other one. Remote voting is, uh, I think we still have to go and uh, travel a little more path before we go there. But as far as AI is concerned, which is now becoming mainstream, and we have already seen started seeing the effect of AI as far as disinformation and misinformation is concerned. But I think at the same time, we all have to work and see that how can we really leverage this new process or new uh, applications of AI for towards having free and fair and transparent elections with inclusivity uh, at the underlying theme. Okay, uh, Dan. All right, well, I apologize that I wasn't able to be here at the start. I had the calendar off by an hour, and so I'm, I'm glad I was able to jump in at all. Um, I'll say a little bit about AI and elections. Um, the one place that I've been personally working on this is using some modern computer vision techniques to improve the accuracy of ballot scanning. This is a grant I have with some colleagues at Texas A&M and at University of Alabama. We're looking on using some deep learning techniques to more accurately figure out all the weird ways that people scribble in. One of the fun parts about giving somebody a pen and a piece of paper and say, fill in the bubble is a surprising number of them don't follow instructions. And likewise, traditional scanners, if you fold the page, they'll see the fold. And if the fold goes through a bubble, they'll think you filled in the bubble, even though you didn't. So modern computer vision can do so much better than uh, traditional ballot scanners. This is an opportunity that we're pursuing as a research agenda. More broadly, I think that one of the big roles for AI in elections is going to be in the misinformation, disinformation space where elections are people and people are influenced by media and media is overrun with misinformation and disinformation and trying to get a handle on that is going to require i'm going to borrow a phrase from the u.s government pardon me it's going to require a whole of government approach or in this case a whole of academia approach I don't think that there's any one technique we're going to use to stop the misinformation disinformation problem, but I think throwing everything we have at it, um, including AI techniques, is going to be necessary in order to make sure that we have an informed electorate. And with that, thank you all for for being here. Sorry I was late. Great panel. Uh, all right. So thanks a lot to our panelists, uh, Deepak, uh, Nita, and uh, uh, Dan.
And I, it is a good segue to the third panel, which will be on uh, how do we empower the journalists uh, with the information and uh, disinformation. In fact, our first uh, talk also of the day was on the topic. So very rightly put. Uh, with that, we will end the panel and uh, we will have uh, two paper presentations. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now we will have uh, paper presentations and uh, uh, we will have two paper presentations and then uh, we will break for lunch. The first one is... Uh, by Alpan uh, Kuila and Sudeshna Sarkar, if you build, they will come. Identification of new stakeholders to detect party preferences in news coverage. Uh, you have 15 minutes. Uh, Alpan, are you uh, ready to present? Uh, yes. Just, I'm sharing my screen. Hello, can you see my screen? Yes. Hello, uh, I am Alapun Kuila and I am a PhD student in IIT Kharagpur. And today I am going to present my work on automatic identification of news stakeholders to detect party preference in news coverage. So news media bias is an uh, interesting and emerging term in computational journalism and computational social science and also in computer science research. So the, the basic uh, uh, responsibility of news media is to provide its consumer with balanced reporting and objective reporting. But nowadays, the news media is often alleged as biased when it, it uh, gives more or less coverage to some specific uh, actors or some specific viewpoints, then the media is often called as or alleged as biased. So in our work, in this work, we are identifying media bias on the basis of party preference. That means to which uh, actors or entities it gives more or less coverage or whether we can detect it. So new stakeholder, the, the term stakeholder is first coined by Oga, Ogaya or et al. in 2011. In their paper, they have, identified, they have defined stakeholder as participants in a news event who have some relationship with other participants. So in this work, as we are talking about party preference in news media, so we redefine it as the actors or entities who are directly involved in the news story, plays important role in the conflict and gives opinion about some issues and other actors. What happened in, uh, in, in news, in conflict news, there are different stakeholders with multiple or, or multiple viewpoints and multiple ideologies. Okay. So, for example, in stakeholder, if we can tell about some stakeholder examples, right? In in the American presidential elections, if we see the news uh, reportings, the two major political parties and their presidential candidates may be regarded as some valid stakeholders. In case of Indian general election news reporting on Indian general election, as India is a multi-party system. So participating political parties, corresponding candidates, the election commission, and last but not the least, the voters may be regarded as valid stakeholders. So why is stakeholders identification in news is important? Because first one can assist in determining salient name entities. So it will help in news content analysis. In the news article, there are lots of news uh, uh, 
entities or actors. So if we have to identify the, the salient named entities, in that case, we have to identify the stakeholders. Second one is find relatedness among news events and articles. So if we can identify the uh, valid stakeholders in multiple articles published by same news media house or different media house, we can relate the related news articles based on the presence of or reference to the same stakeholders. It also helps in political ideology detection. So if media house giving coverage to some specific political stakeholders, so we can say that it is lenient to that ideology. So, and at last, the imbalance in coverage of the stakeholders help in quantitative analysis of media bias. So what are the challenges that we have faced or the existing works faced? So one is stakeholders are domain dependent. It is very much domain dependent. So for example, we can see that in political news, the political parties, the political persons, or these are the stakeholders. In case of uh, an entertainment or gaming news, the stakeholders are totally different. So, the, and what happened that the scarcity of well-defined tag set is also a barrier in this research. So, and tag set is not there. So, their annotated data is also not available. So, any supervised learning or model designing is also uh, a bit tough. So, existing some of the papers uh, have used dictionary based system, but what happened in case of new emerging topics? these dictionaries are not complete. So what happens if a new entity came and comes and it is not present in the dictionary, the model failed. And with the uh, help of NLP techniques like named entity recognition or named entity linking, it is not also enough to, uh, to address this problem because what happened uh, only uh, named uh, link, uh, for example, in named entity recognition, uh, once same entity may be a stakeholder in case of one topic, it is not that much important stakeholder in other topic. So any are maybe not useful everywhere. And in case of named entity linking, what happen? What happen? One specific stakeholder, it may be referenced by multiple names. Uh, so if it is not present in the predefined list, so NL in, uh, can, cannot be effective there. And selection of valid stakeholder candidates is also a challenge because in the news uh, uh, article, there are lots of uh, entities. So identifying the valid stakeholders, which are valid uh, to, towards the topic is an uh, cumbersome task. And one specific, entity uh, uh, mention may be reference to two or multiple different entities. So this is called ambiguity problem. Another one is one specific entity may be referenced by multiple names. So that is another task. And our task is not only to identify th those entities and we have to map them to a specific stakeholder class because our main aim is to identify the stakeholder preference of the uh, media. So our objective here is to identify each occurrence of the stakeholder candidates and thereby quantify and quantify the visibility of the stakeholders type in the news publication and eventually identify the party preference in, news, in media outlets. The visibility and coverage these two terms are used uh, in this presentation interchangeable. So what is our problem definition? Given a news topic T and topic specific predefined stakeholder set S and the stream of news articles D, set D, our task is first to identify all the candidate stakeholder phases. Second, aggregate all the synonymous entities within and across documents and generate a list of synonymous stakeholder group L. And 
thereby map each synonymous stakeholder candidate group to correct stakeholder class. And finally, for each document D, our output will be a list of order pairs EJ, SK, where EJ is a candidate stakeholder phase and SK is a corresponding stakeholder class. We have used uh, in our experiment uh, four topics before Indian uh, India based topics. One is farmers' law, one is demonetization, citizenship amendment bill, and the fourth one is COVID pandemic management in India. And we uh, extracted the news articles from uh, GDELT uh, database. And this is the uh, time range where we have identified, we have collect, collected the news articles. And for evaluation, we have annotated a few documents in the documents for from the document in each sentence, we have identified the valid stakeholders and tag it with a stakeholder class. So one important one important uh, thing that we have done is we have created a stakeholder ontology. So here we have used three relationships. One is is a relation. One is part of relation. One is belongs to relation. So what we have done, we have seen that few of the stakeholders are are generic to all the topics, and few stakeholders are specific to a topic. For example, uh, for the few generic stakeholders are government, political party ruling, political party opposition, judiciary, government bureaucrats, civic society, international figures, and news editors. And few topic specific stakeholders are like for in case of farm law is farmers, international figure. In case of demonetization, banking sector and private companies. For CV bill, this international figure. And for COVID control, scientists and researchers and international figures are some topic specific stakeholders. So our model framework is based, is based on three sub modules. One is pre processing. One is entity representation, one is stakeholder classification. In case of pre-processing, what first we have done, first we have identified all the entities, named entities from the news articles. And we have used a, a space for that named entity recognition task. And then what we have seen that only the person geopolitical entities are the are the valid stakeholder, they may be regarded as stakeholders. So we have collected those named entities. And then using the spacey, we have done the within document co reference distribution. And then in the next step in the entity representation module, first we have used contextual features from the sentence and the external knowledge base feature from uh, that two features we have used and used BART to get an entity embedding. For external knowledge feature, what we have done that we have collected few India specific Wikipedia pages. We have used semantic role leveling. And then from those, if a named entity is present on those Wikipedia pages, so we have collected the sentence specific the embeddings from those Wikipedia pages and that are used as an external knowledge feature. And using those two uh, features, we have represented each entity. And after that, we have a cross document entity clustering composition algorithm that we have uh, used for cross document entity uh, clustering. And then we have classified the stakeholder classes. And ultimately, I we get the article wise stakeholder uh, classes. So this is the uh, the sequential cross document candidate aggregation algorithm. So here we have used example based uh, stakeholder identification. So initially we get a seed dictionary where the key is an entity ID and the value is a, a synonymous candidate list. So now we have also E that is the list of extracted entities from the news articles and T is a threshold similarity score. And our ultimate goal is to get LF 
which is a final set of candidate clusters with levels. So for each entity E that we have collected uh, from the named entity cognition uh, module, we have checked whether this E is present in the initial seed dictionary. If it is present, so we label this entity as the as it is present in the dictionary. And if it is not present in the dictionary, so we get the embedding from the entity representation module. And then we uh, generate the embedding of this each synonymous set. And then we have compute the similarity score between HE and HK. Here we have used uh, cosine similarity. And with, we identified the uh, synonymous uh, set which has maximum uh, similarity. And if this similarity score is greater than the threshold, in that case, we are aggregating that entity to that specific synonymous set. And in case it is less than the uh, threshold score, similarity score, in that case, we are generating a new cluster and add it as a new uh, uh, stakeholder candidate. So in this way, we are using the uh, this algorithm to identify new entities and its stakeholder class. So we have, uh, for the evaluation of our uh, model, we have annotated few uh, documents and based on that, we have I get this score for stakeholder classification. And a, a sample output here, uh, we can see that this D1, D2, D3, D4, D5 is the stream of news articles. And here you can see, for example, stakeholder opponent. Here you can see that Indian National Congress, Congress, Adhiranjan Choudhury, Rahul Gandhi, these are some stakeholder candidates, which of types opponent. Here you can see that Indian National Congress and Congress, these are synonymous terms. So it is in, inside a single cluster. And Adhiranjan Choudhury and Rahul Gandhi, they are actually uh, 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 politi politicians from this uh, uh, political party, but they are different entities. So they are they are in different cluster. Similarly, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Prime, uh, Prime Alpin, Minister Modi. Yes. Uh, sorry, um, we're getting out of time. Can you please wrap okay. up in one minute? Okay. And these are some sample uh, coverage analysis statistics that we have get from the unannotated data set. And using our tool, we can also do some analysis on stakeholder coverage varying with time. If we see this graph, we can see that uh, that with with the time, it, the stakeholder, the coverage of different stakeholders varies. And from these uh, stats, we can we can uh, draw some analogies. Also, we can identify some events where uh, the, these the, these coverages are varying with time. That's all. Thank you. Uh, we have time for uh, one quick question. So any question? Yes. Uh, Hello. Um, so great work. Thank you for presenting. My question is, um, some of the aggregation you were done, I'm curious how you are. Uh, Actually, this deciding. is based on the domain knowledge. Uh, some uh, no, no, I understand, right? So yes. for example, you said, uh, yes. in some cases you said farmers, right? So if you yes. remember the farm law agitations, mm -hmm. the farmers were themselves divided, right? There were four or five different groups with slightly different takes. So uh, similarly for demonetization or you know the citizenship amendment, all those things, the yes. acts were divided, the the groups were divided. So how, would it not uh, yes. be better to tease that out or or do you think that okay, a single okay. holding okay. is sufficient? Okay. Okay. Uh, right now, till now, our task is on uh, their visibility analysis. Right? So we have not uh, added the polarity term or sentiment term in it. Okay, right now we are just 
checking that how media house how much coverage they have given to these stakeholders so fine so yes your 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 point is valid we have to aggregate the sentiment to this so that we can we can uh, get the more bigger picture okay uh, thank you alpan yes the next the next talk uh, in this session the last and which is also the last talk in this session before lunch is uh, by Prasad Murugesan and uh, Samshu Darwes uh, Saganwali. The topic is an AI-powered VVPAT uh, counter for elections in India. Uh, over to you. Cool. So, yeah, I, I you know, uh, my co-author is Prasad Murugesan. Uh, so he's uh, pursuing his final year uh, master's in data science um, in, in PS development technology in India. Uh, I'm from industry. Um, I'm working as a senior director uh, in the Banking Digital uh, USA. So our title of the, of the work is um, an AI-powered VVPAT counter for elections in India. Uh, a few minutes ago, Professor Dan Wallach uh, you know, uh, mentioned about uh, he's working on a deep learning system uh, to, to detect you know, ballot paper countings. So this is more like a, a variant, since we don't use ballot papers anymore in India, uh, this is more like a, uh, you know, uh, doing the same task on the VVPAT slips in India. So these are you know, some of the uh, bullets that uh, we'll be covering in the last next uh, 10 minutes. So a quick introduction into you know, investigation history, you know, what sort of uh, you know, different um, uh, methods of polling that has happened, um, formation on a problem statement, um, the actual you know, proposed uh, prototype and the methodology, uh, and even you know, some recommendations and results. Uh, going into uh, uh, India is the largest democracy. Uh, you know, um, so in fact, as of you know, Jan 1, uh, 2023, uh, it's estimated up to be 945 million electorates. Um, this is like almost three times of the, the US electorate. Um, the first general elections in India happened in 1951 uh, So it's been you know, 70 years of a, of a process. Uh, but up until 1990, you know, uh, ballot papers were, were predominantly used. Um, you know, in all our elections, from, starting from parliamentary to all the way up to uh, the more micro elections happen in, uh, for village constituencies. Uh, but in early 2000s uh, is when the electoral voting machines, uh, EVMs, uh, were introduced, uh, you know, instead of ballot papers. And since then, we are, we are using uh, EVMs. Uh, one other point on the 945 million population is that, uh, you know, the recent survey says is that close to three, one third of that population uh, is not actually participating in, in the electoral process. Um, one of the main reasons is around you know disinformation, uh, you know lack of transparency, lack of you know, trust uh, in the in the process. So you know this our work and you know, a lot of the other papers uh, being presented is, is actually hitting on the theme. Um, play into um, uh, what from after after the introduction of the uh, of the EV machines, you know, a lot of Concerns uh, around transparency and, and EVM tampering uh, uh, appear uh, in the the news, and you know, of course, a lot of mitigations are happening. So uh, the primary concern was that you know, moving into a EVM machine, um, you know, it could it, it's no more ballot papers. Um, the, the votes are not transparent because a mere counter uh, that comes during the time of uh, time of counting. So why should you know the citizenry trust on the process? So you know, a lot of uh, in cases uh, were happening in Supreme Court uh, since early 2000s. So Election Commission of India, as a uh, you know uh, as a response uh, to these concerns, they introduced uh, you know, VVPAT, uh, the expansion is voter verified paper audit trail uh, that was introduced in 2019 uh, Parliament elections. So um, the VVPAT machine looks uh, something like this. I'm, I hope you guys are able to see it on the screen. That it is a uh, you know, along with our uh, EVM machine, uh, which we uh, you used to have earlier, you have another device, uh, you can see on the left side, um, which shows when, when the voter comes in and presses on a particular symbol, then you know, for seven to eight seconds, they would they would see the exact party symbol printed on a slip which appear on the screen here, and then you know, those slips get deposited, uh, you know, at the uh, at the bin, the basement. So this is the the new uh, voter verified VVPAT, uh, VVPAT set. So, um, of course, in this uh, introduction by the Election Commission, definitely improved voter confidence because at least now voters are able to see you know, which party that they are uh, you know, actually voting for. So there is no, uh, it has definitely improved transparency. Uh, but now a new challenge uh, uh, you know, occurs, which is 
uh, counting these you know uh, VBPAT uh, slips and matching them against uh, the EVM uh, numbers. So because doing this for a uh, on a manual basis for each pair of EVM and uh, and VBPAT is uh, is a practical challenge. So again, related to this, also it will be a lot of concerns uh, raised in the uh, you know, raised by the opposition, uh, quoting that uh, you know if if you are not going to use VBPATs during the counting process, then what's the point in having this uh, skull? So opposition parties are constantly uh, you know, uh, requesting the Supreme Court to direct the Action Commission of India to subject more EVMs and more EV packs into uh, physical validation, like in, uh, reconciling both EVM scores uh, and the, and the VVPAC scores. Uh, in one of the responses uh, to, uh, to the Supreme Court, uh, the Election Commission of India uh, filed an affidavit in which it says, going from 5% of the, of the uh, EVM VVPAC machines, uh, validating 5% of the EVM machines to 50% of the EVM machines in every constituency, uh, Supreme Court has mentioned uh, the Election Commission of India has mentioned the Supreme Court uh, saying that it would take like you know five to six days more in in declaring the results for every election, and they don't they really don't have the capacity to do to do this process. So this key problem uh, in you know, taking the face value of this statement uh, is actually the problem statement for for our work. So given that you know uh, in the advancements in the uh, image recognition uh, and machine vision technologies, uh, we thought you know why can't we automate this process? So why can't we, you know, um, take the VVPAT slips and what do we come up with a, a counter sort of something? How do you uh, count cash uh, in bank uh, notes? Uh, so why can't we make a counter that would automatically recognize, uh, you know, the, the symbols of the uh, VVPAT slips and create a counter uh, of, of all the uh, bastard uh, votes? So that counter, uh, those lists can be you know, easily validated against what we have obtained uh, from the EVM machines. So then, you know, uh, reconciliation uh, can be done much more easily. Uh, one uh, very important point, though, uh, in in the election rules, the Election Commission has also mentioned whenever there's a conflict between EVMs and the VVPAT, the VVPAT scores actually, you know, uh, stands, not the EVM uh, numbers. So what is what is this reduced into is, you know, uh, so... In, in, in a perfect scenario, it's it's quite sufficient for us to you know accurately count the VVPAT slips. So that is where we uh, you know we converted this into a um, you know a multi-class supervised learning problem. So if we have uh, VVPAT slips uh, stacked in a machine like what we have shown here, and we have a camera that's you know kept at the top, which constantly takes the uh, the pictures uh, slip by slip, and then you know, that image is you know sent to the image classification layer. And the image classification layer would, you know, uh, would classify the, um, you know, uh, image into a particular party symbol, and you know, uh, an index can be created. That index can be provided as an output that will finally be validated against the EVM uh, scores. So, uh, so that is a problem. Uh, you know, that's that's our, you know, core uh, uh, proposal. And what you see in the right hand side is just say uh, a proposed design uh, which can be greatly improved. Uh, as a, you know, to, to start with the uh, with the data set, because you know, as most of the papers uh, discussing here, if you don't have data sets uh, readily available, so you know, the first task was to build a, a data set. So we started referring to uh, National Commission of India's, uh, you know, uh, party symbols that has been assigned and allocated already. So uh, like close to fifty you know, uh, uh, parties uh, account to more than eighty-five to ninety percent of votes uh, in, in in the parliament elections. So we just chose like those fifty parties for now, but you know the work can be like easily extendable uh, later as well. So we we've taken you know uh, the party symbol uh, and we have created some distorted uh, you know images by, by applying some image transformations just in case. You know even if in a worst case scenario, if a VV patch slip you know prints the uh, symbols uh, in different ways. We we would like, uh, the the symbols accurately. So for each symbol, we have created some you know seventy to distortions, and that is our uh, you know, primary data set. Um, from a modeling standpoint, we used the three trained models uh, of MobileNet V two and the Step fifty as the two candidate models that we wanted to you know uh, uh, use in this work. Uh, so what we have done, uh, we have picked up this uh, pre trained uh, models and we have added a additional custom layer at the end. Uh, in order to you know uh, we use case of predicting of labeling uh, you know uh, of providing the output as one of the party symbols um, out of these models so that is the you know uh, key uh, aspect of um, with, the, with the modeling and the methodology 
uh, results, you know, we, we have got some pretty good results. Uh, we, uh, for most of the parties, we've been able to, uh, you know, uh, detect them with 100% accuracy, uh, with 100% uh, recall. But a few parties, uh, you know, where the symbols spin, you know, a little, a little closer, we found out that, you know, um, close to six party symbols, we had a recall of less than, you know, just point, uh, eight zero. So, you know, in this scenario, that's when we realized, so this is not a, this is not a system to you know, completely remove the human element uh, out of the counting process. This is a system to augment, uh, you know, uh, the human intelligence. So uh, if like, you know, for example, in a, in a constituency, uh, if like if you have one lakh votes uh, to be to be countered and validated against the VV path slips, if 98,000, 95,000 to 98,000 of those slips are you know accurately validated, uh, accurately uh, you know labeled, then humans can easily classify uh, the the rest of the 2,000 images um, you know um, with very less time. So that's why we propose like you know for any prediction you know uh, below a certain level of probability for any symbols. You know those slips would be would be introduced uh, to human intervention, and humans can you know classify and label it, and you know tally the counter accordingly. Uh, so the the idea that we have built here is you know uh, of course we have trained it for uh, close to fifty party symbols, but as the party symbols uh, you know um, grow, and as election commission assigns more uh, you know uh, new party symbols, we can easily uh, you know uh, transfer the knowledge and you know learn this model and augment this model with, with new party symbols and. Um, uh, yeah, so one one recommendation that we had out of the uh, you know to uh, to mitigate a practical challenge that we have is uh, it, if if it is possible, we can actually start printing the timestamp of the VV path uh, of the uh, voting time on the VV path slip because the timestamp is not captured in any of the processes. So if we have a timestamp that is uh, printed on the VV path slip. That can help us to, uh, you know, uh, to detect a lot of malpractices uh, happening around the EVM machines, and uh, we can also you know, neglect a lot of the, uh, lot of the pre-polling, uh, you know, VV patch slips that were casted, um, you know, uh, within the within the ballot. So within the within the bin, I'm sorry. So that's like you know one of the recommendations that we are making, uh, you know, uh, to the election commission, if it's possible, you know, to print the timestamp in every VV patch slip. Uh, so with that, you know, uh, we have provided our code, our data set, uh, a different version of paper, and we have actually built a web app as well. So you can uh, easily do, go and check in the web app. Um, you can upload a, an image of uh, any party symbol, like out of those few parties, uh, and we will be able to detect it with, uh, uh, with high level of accuracy. Uh, so I'll stop there, and uh, we'll, we'll take any questions. Uh, thank you, Samshir, for a very good uh, talk. And um, are there any questions? Sorry, in the room or online? Okay, so I actually have a question here, um, which is that uh, image um, and object detection, uh, it is uh, very, very uh, prone to different kinds of noises and things like that. So in your case, I, I see that you have considered, you know, like the different orientation of the party symbols and so on, uh, but uh, doesn't it uh, actually um, raise a number of other issues? For example, the time printing, if uh, uh, someone attacks the machine and uh, changes the time, and then uh, that's a form of attack on these um, machines and so on. So uh, any from your perspective, right, what are some of the places where you think uh, these are very vulnerable? Absolutely. Uh, so the, uh, you know, we still operate by the assumption that you know EVMs uh, and the VV patch machines are uh, you know, uh, not uh, not subject to any kind of tampering because we have been you know, constantly uh, uh, shown by the election commission uh, that you know uh, you can't tamper these machines. Uh, there are no uh, you know chips associated which could modify uh, the the backend mechanisms within the uh, within the EVM machines and also the VV patch slip. But it is it is a valid concern, uh, Professor Bitlaw. So one, what we are what we are thinking is, you know, how can um, how can election commission uh, can start thinking about bringing more distinct symbols? So you know, uh, so that using very distinct symbols, we can you know reduce the noises in the images. And how can we you know simplify uh, the images uh, on the VV pad slips? Because you know, if the images, uh, of course, these are like you know very black and white images. So um, if you have very complex you know contours and lines running in the uh, you know on the VV pad slips, the detection becomes you know a uh, lot uh, lot harder. 
So we we would we would definitely we can start thinking about you know how can we make the VB pad slips uh, to hold the images which are like you know, very simple. So the detection will become you know much more easier. So that the process can be you know uh, uh, pretty rapid. So uh, but again, this is a starting point. Uh, this is not going to answer all the you know prediction issues that we have uh, with the, with the images. But the the domain of the symbols that we have taken, uh, Professor. As we mentioned uh, in the uh, in point three here, um, we are able to successfully detect uh, majority of participants that we have up until now. So the problem would, would be, uh, you know, with very specific uh, symbols, we would you know, uh, we would have to train additional models in order to predict them accurately as well. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, any other final question? Uh, if not. Uh, Thank you for everyone, all the speakers and participants uh, for the morning session. We'll break for lunch right now and we'll uh, come back at uh, two o'clock for an, uh, another uh, uh, session of uh, talks and uh, paper presentation. My name is Tarmak Oppel. I'm from Tallinn University of Technology. I'm chairing this session. Our keynote speak will be by Dr. Nicole Kudman, who is Associate Professor and serves as a director of the Center for E-Democracy in Toronto, Canada, and as an associate professor of political science at the Brock University. Dr. Goodman's recent research focuses on the effects of digital technology on Canadian political institutions and actors, with an emphasis on political behavior and public policy. As core focus of, the, of this research, is the adoption of technology in elections, on which uh, Nicole is writing a book. He also studies political participation, public policy, indigenous politics, and local government. Dr. Goodman, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, before I begin, I just wanna make sure everyone can see the slide okay, and you can see the slide with the full slide and not my notes, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, I'm gonna try not to move anything. I might my my connection's pretty good, but um, I might stop my video. Can, can everyone see me and the presentation, or just the presentation? You you and the presentation. Okay. I'll, I'll try. I'll try and uh, I'll try and do it that way and see how it goes. Um, so good afternoon. I'm really excited uh, to be here today with you all to share the research that informs this presentation. Um, I'd like to thank Tarmo and BipLab for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. Uh, this is really a well-timed conference that tackles a number of important and interesting topics, and I'm grateful to be here to share some of my research. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to just acknowledge some of my colleagues who have contributed um, or are contributing to the research that I'm going to present. Um, all of this research is in progress. Um, and that's Alex Essex, Amanda Tiber, Mika German, Mike McGregor, and Holly Garnett. Um, and while today's presentation does not address AI specifically, it does focus on the ways in which digital technologies are transforming our elections for better or worse, and the extent to which the presence and failures of technology, and likewise knowledge about security, um, can impact public attitudes. The relevance to AI is that many members of the public can't necessarily discern between whether technology is AI, blockchain, or something different. So in this sense, I hope that this presentation will raise questions uh, and will be germane to those thinking about AI integration in elections and how a scenario gone wrong could affect public or voter perceptions, or likewise, how education about AI could influence voter attitudes. Okay, sorry, I'm just going to minimize this. Okay, uh, and when I'm speaking to the topic of digital elections today, I'll be speaking to digital voting uh, with a specific focus on online voting in Canada. So as I mentioned, I'll be drawing on a few ongoing research projects, which are separate, but also interconnected. So hopefully they'll come together fairly well in this presentation to speak to what happens when digital elections go wrong and what we can do about it from the perspective of public attitudes. Um, we also have a stream of research that examines these questions from policy and security lenses, but they're not yet sufficiently advanced to share. So today I'll specifically be speaking to two main questions. The first is how are attitudes affected when digital elections go wrong? 
The focus here today is on voters, but I do have evidence on administrator perspectives. If anyone is interested, happy to speak to that in the q and It just didn't fit in this presentation. Um, and then second, if technological issues or even the perception of issues can pose a threat that would potentially negatively affect public attitudes, can educating voters about security features improve satisfaction and trust in voting technology? Or perhaps can it have the opposite effects? I'll answer these questions by drawing on data from Canada as a case study. And, you know, I hope to, to make the case or conclude that um, the Canadian public, uh, at least at the local level, have a very, fairly high risk tolerance and appetite to experiment with technology and accept issues that may be part of the process. Based on other projects looking at topics like smart cities that I've been a part of, I believe this tolerance applies in Canada, at least, to a range of technologies, which may also include AI. Of course, further research would have to unpack that. Um, however, one caveat I will note is that the impact of technology on public stakeholder attitudes may not apply in the same way to other jurisdictions or contexts. How stakeholders perceive technical incidents or vulnerabilities and technology in general is obviously going to be dependent on political culture. So in certain countries like Latin America, for example, studies have found that the introduction of uh, voting technologies actually improves trust uh, in elections and election authorities. But by contrast, in other instances, um, such as some European examples, the implementation of voting technology has actually raised further concerns, reduced trust, and challenged perceived legitimacy. So before I get into the meat of the presentation, I'd like to just speak to the importance and the relevance of this topic for scholars and public and policy communities, um, and also to highlight that digital elections going wrong is not some far-fetched future scenario. In fact, it happens more often than not. So this table is just you know, some of the notable electronic voting trials that have encountered technical incidents or perceptions of technical or security concerns. Um, you know, I think these are both very relevant. The table highlights um, multiple voting technology examples, such as tabulators, DRE machines, and online voting. In all of these cases presented in the table, concerns uh, led to trials being halted or canceled. Now, in some cases, there was an actual malfunction. In other, like a machine failure, like you can see here in Quebec, um, in other cases, it was an exposure of a technical vulnerability, like you can see here in the Netherlands. And in other cases, nothing actually went wrong, just the presence of security concerns, um, like in, in Germany, the UK, um, you know, is the reason why um, pilots or trials were canceled. So the examples in black text were eventually canceled, while the red text highlights developments that um, are on hold, but not definitively canceled at the moment, at least. Um, and again, like I said, in most of these examples, the cancellations were either influenced because of actual events or poor public perception or public challenges. Um, in some cases, use was very short and only a trial or a few trials. And in others, you know, such as the Netherlands, the program lasted over 40 years. So the intent of this slide is to illustrate one, that digital elections can go wrong, and two, the importance of public and administrator attitudes towards security concerns or technical issues where digital elections go wrong. I, I won't speak too much to this slide, but this is just to highlight um, that sometimes technical incidents occur and they don't result in cancellations. And that's what I'll be speaking to today. This does not just occur in Canada, although <laughs> there've been a lot of incidents in Canada and we seem to have a high tolerance for allowing it to continue. Um, happy to speak to any of these examples in the Q&A if anyone would like, but Pakistan's uh, experience with DRE machines and Finland's experience with DRE machines also highlighted uh, issues and you know the technology continued there. So as I said, something doesn't actually have to go wrong for there to be an effect on public attitudes toward electoral integrity. And you know the best case to kind of highlight this is the 2020 US election, which showed us that allegations with no substance can have an impact that reverberates beyond borders. So Trump made accusations about the Dominion uh, voting machines that were used there. These were proven false. Vulnerabilities were detected with Dominion ballot marking devices, but there was no evidence that these were exposed in the election. Um, while the tabulators were not examined as part of a court order, which 
uh, examined other aspects of the technology. So we don't know for sure. There is no evidence that the machines caused any issues. But despite this lack of evidence, I would argue in many ways that Trump's allegations did have an impact on public perception until they were disproven, or some people might argue that they still, you know, have planted that seed. Um, so this case exemplifies that perceptions about security matter. And now finally to the case that I'm going to talk about today, the Ontario um, 2018 elections. So moving on, I'd like to take you back to 2018 in Ontario. Um, on election day, there was a number of municipalities, 177 municipalities that were using online voting. To put that in perspective, there are about 414 municipalities that run elections in Ontario. 43 of those municipalities, all of whom were clients of one particular vendor, were affected by a technical issue on election day that severely limited server bandwidth and prevented online votes from being cast for several hours during the evening of election day. The vendor, Dom Dominion Voting Systems, issued a statement explaining that their network infrastructure subcontractor, so their collocation provider, placed, quote unquote, an unauthorized limit on incoming voting traffic, which resulted in one-tenth of the pre-agreed network bandwidth being available. So this caused, in many cases, election websites to slow down so that it almost became impossible to cast a vote, or in some cases, it stopped working. So in response, municipalities had to take action. And due to our legislative requirements and frameworks here in Ontario, um, 35 of those municipalities had to declare a state of emergency to extend the election until the next day. And the other remaining eight of those municipalities had to um, extend voting by one to two hours that evening. So practically election day in Ontario for those municipalities that were clients of this vendor was essentially like having a wedding for 300 people, but only booking a hall for 30. And obviously the optics of extending voting, particularly declaring a state of emergency caused concern and raised questions from candidates, the public and the media about the integrity of election results. I mean, you can see in the headlines, um, online election snafus. Oh, whoops. Sorry, I thought more, more, more were going to pop up if I hit. No, maybe I didn't enable that. Um, online election snafus. Um, do dozens of Ontario communities raised systemic questions. Another online voting headline was online voting systems delay election results across Ontario. And another headline pointed to an online voting, uh, online voting being marred by an election day system load issue. So many voters saw this dramatic coverage um, in the media. And of course, if the election is being extended past the day the election was supposed to end, a lot of these people are going to be aware of that. Um, so while this exogenous shock took place, we were collecting survey data from voters about their voting experience in 31 municipalities. Eight of the affected municipalities um, we were collecting data from, and this is what the first part of my talk is going to um, address, which is the voters who participated in this exit survey. And we've split them into respondents who voted before the incident occurred and those who voted after the incident occurred, which allows us to determine whether attitudes toward um, online voting were less favorable after voters were aware of the problem. Okay, so just briefly some literature. So why might we expect that digital election incidents um, and the perceptions of electoral integrity could affect voter attitudes? Well, because research shows that perceptions of electoral integrity can affect attitudes and orientations to vote. Um, so given this, it's expected that feelings toward aspects of the voting process, like e-voting, for example, can have similar effects. And likewise, a technical malfunction, failure in risk management, security breaches, or detection of vulnerabilities in these e-voting systems could all affect public trust and satisfaction with democracy. Similarly, there's work on election scandals that finds links between perceptions about the fairness of the vote and electoral mistrust and citizens' perception of corruption. And more generally, work on political scandals also confirms its negative influence on attitudes toward political institutions and the political process. So the implications for technical incidents in the context of e-voting have the same potential to be recognized as scandals and affect public attitudes, such as satisfaction, trust, efficacy, um, you know, in politicians and in electoral institutions. Um, and currently the literature on, um, you know, 
um, public trust uh, shows a bit of a mix. There are some studies that find that the introduction of technology actually enhances public trust in the process, while others show that there's a connection between e-voting deployment and mistrust. However, no study that I'm aware of yet compares um, those items before or after a technical incident. And then the second part to this, which deals with the second part of the talk, is that likewise, if we expect that technical issues or vulnerabilities in voting um, technologies might affect voter attitudes, could we also expect that knowledge of security features might you know, also have an effect? Okay, so in terms of the methods used, um, part one looks at the 2018 internet voting study, the survey that I mentioned in the eight affected municipalities. Um, seven are presented here and they're listed there. Um, six also declare a state of emergency of those seven and one of the seven extended voting um, uh, by a couple of hours. Um, so the sample is split based on completion time. So uh, my colleague, Alexander Essex, was monitoring HTTP traffic at the time, and he noticed a significant slowdown between 5 and 6. We picked the time of 5.30. And so group one are individuals who um, voted and began the survey before 5.30 p.m. And then group two um, are individuals who uh, commenced the survey after 5.30 p.m. And we look at some descriptive statistics and an OLS regression. I think that's, yeah, I can speak to everything. Oh, maybe I should just say here. Um, so the main independent variable is voting time. Um, we also include concerns about fraud, security, system reliability, internet use, political trust, age, education, income, female, and Caucasian. Okay, the second part is very preliminary. It's newer research that um, is just kind of been completed and we're going through it. So we recently had an election here in the fall of 2022 in Ontario. We did another exit survey with 24 municipalities. Um, and as part of these exit surveys, we incorporated some um, experiments and unique questions. And I'm gonna quickly speak to three of those today. One features an informational prime that we used um, prior to a question about satisfaction. The sample was randomly split. Half of the sample saw the prime, half did not. Um, and then also some questions about additional security features. You'll see these ends very hugely. <laughs> and that's just simply because of the size of the municipalities. Some are much larger and some are much smaller. Um, it's important to note that all of these samples are self-selected. So how this is working is voters are prompted to take a survey after they cast their ballot um, and they can opt into it then. So this is all self-selected data. So it's not necessarily representative of the population. Okay, so this is the first um, table and this shows satisfaction with online and attitudes toward online voting. And you can see um, group one is highlighted in one column and group two is highlighted in the other. So respondents were asked to rate their satisfaction with online voting, the online voting experience on a four point Likert scale uh, from very sad to not, very satisfied to not at all satisfied. And we use a Z test here uh, to compare the proportions to evaluate the significance of these differences, which confirms a statistically significant difference in the proportion of people who express satisfaction with the voting system before versus after the technical outage. Um, and you can see here, you know, it's it's quite a large drop. I mean, that's not surprising. You might ask, why is it not larger? And then similarly, we do see statistically significant differences, um, although they're a bit more modest um, for, you know, would you recommend online voting to others, and then some attitudinal statements. We also asked um, about the likelihood of voting in a future election. And while there's not sizable differences here in reported future use, um, the data suggests that the technical slowdown did have an effect on some voter orientations toward using the technology in the future. And these are statistically significant. And then finally, um, with respect to concerns, so we asked also about concerns and you can see that, you know, there are differences in concerns. Um, group two, which was voting after the technical incident is less likely to say that they don't have concerns. Um, some of you might wonder, well, what does other stand for? Because there's been a decrease in security, but there's an increase in other. So I think that was people not really knowing where to place their comments. The other comments 
from group two respondents focus predominantly on the quality of the online voting system and its reliability. So one respondent, for example, remarked the efficacy of the system. It needs to actually accept my ballot and not crash over and over. Well, another emphasized the quality of the servers by commenting that their concern was having a server hosted on something faster than a 56K modem. Um, these other comments also discussed putting processes in place for technical errors to ensure that something like this didn't happen in future. And they raised questions about the integrity of the election results. Um, for example, one respondent capturing this perspective wrote, overwhelmed system at the end led to a system collapse and the possibility that many people couldn't vote and we'd have a skewed result. And then finally, some respondents pointed out that um, if it would have been, it would have actually been faster to go to a polling location and cast a paper ballot. So anyways, what all of this is showing is that the incident did have an effect, um, you know, in some cases a bit larger, in some cases a bit smaller on orientate satisfaction and orientations toward voting. And um, I've just included here an OLS regression. Um, in this regression, the outcome variable is satisfaction, which is a composite variable that combines respondents' satisfaction with their likelihood to recommend online voting to others. Not satisfied, do not recommend is zero, and satisfied recommend is one. Um, and you can see that results clearly show that online voter satisfaction is negatively affected by voting time. Those who experience the incident are 14 percentage points less likely to be satisfied. And this further, again, supports that the technical incident affected voter satisfaction and their confidence to recommend it to others. Um, you know, some other key items here, political trust is positively correlated with satisfaction, showing that the greater trust in politics and online voter reports, the more likely they are to be satisfied. Internet use exhibits a weak negative correlation, which we interpret to mean that the less a voter uses the internet on a regular basis, the less likely they are to be satisfied. Uh, I'm not showing this here, but just for interest, running the model with just satisfaction as the outcome variable shows that those who experience the incident are on average 21% less satisfied than those who did not experience the incident. Um, and just descriptively, um, another kind of test that we did was separating out those who um, those municipalities that declared a state of emergency compared to those that did not. And the difference between those who declared a state of emergency is larger. Um, is there anything else here? Oh, I guess the only other somewhat surprising thing about this slide is that the other two concern variables, so security and fraud, um, they show weak positive correlations with satisfaction. And so this could mean that while voters have concerns about the potential for security and fraud, that they're still satisfied in spite of these worries. Um, voters in these seven communities had only online and telephone ballots as options. So without the choice of a traditional paper ballot, they had to vote electronically despite any concerns. Uh, another option would be that concerns about security and fraud did not affect their satisfaction much in this case, since feelings about system reliability occupied, you know, the majority of their focus. Um, in fact, removing concerned with other from the model changes the direction of the relationship from the other two concern variables to negative and concern with fraud emerges as significant. Okay, so um, if we're going to use technology in elections and there are issues, this presents a problem for integrity and democracy. And as we've seen from this data, a technical issue can negatively impact voter experiences and attitudes. And of course, you know, this raises a multitude of questions, um, you know, most importantly about what about a larger scale incident and possible long term effects on electoral integrity and democratic engagement? I mean, in this case, yes, those those governments had to declare a state of emergency, many of them, which, you know, sounds horrible. Um, however, this wasn't actually um, a problem with the online voting technology per se. It was a problem with a third party, which I mean, does certainly affect the larger system. But the problem could have been much worse, there could have been, you know, a much greater impact. So how would this have impacted attitudes? Um, so this raises questions about, you know, what could be a solution? First of all, we know that not all jurisdictions are as open to voting technologies as Canadians are. Canada, I would argue, you know, Canadians are, are very open. And I think from what we see today, um, you know, have a very high risk tolerance. Sure, there are differences, but they're not huge differences considering, um, you know, the faces of um, 
clerks being pasted all over papers saying, you know, the election was being called into question, you might have expected larger, larger differences. So if we educate voters about security, could this potentially be a solution to improve attitudes generally um, and to potentially counter negative experiences such as the one that I've outlined? So now I'd like to speak to this. I hope this ties well together. So what happens when we educate elector electors about technology? So this table shows satisfaction with the online voting process from the city of Markham. Um, we included a prime in front of the satisfaction question about the verifiable voting system that referenced the ability of individual verifiability. So to be honest with you, I suggested we do this because I hypothesized that knowing about security would enhance sat voter satisfaction, and I was wrong. Um, the exact prime was the city of Markham is using a verifiable voting system in the 2022 municipal election. This allows voters to confirm that their online ballot was successfully received and that their selections match how they voted. And as I noted, the sample was split uh, randomly. So half of the sample was exposed to the prime and the other half was not. Among respondents who received the prime, you can see here that there is a 9% drop in those that identify as being very satisfied and a chi-square um, test reveals that this difference is significant. What's interesting is that in subsequent questions, the prime also affected responses to those questions as well. So the prime also had a small negative influence on the next question, which was whether voters would recommend online voting to others. In this case, it was much smaller. There was a 3% drop among the group who received the prime, but you know, a chi-square test also confirmed that this difference was significant. This difference actually also extended to concerns about security, which was um, quite a bit ways <laughs> down the survey. Um, exposure to the prime reduced security concerns by a modest 2%, but it also increased the likelihood of respondents saying that they do not have concerns, so identifying with that response option. And, uh, you know, even though the question came later in the survey, um, these differences are also significant. So to me, this, I think this is really interesting, and it puts governments in an interesting position, educating voters about system security might have a negative impact on satisfaction and perceptions of the voting method, but it decreases their concerns. So my next slide has to do with if education has a negative impact on satisfaction, then how might it affect trust? So all municipalities in the survey were asked questions about trust in voting methods. They were all asked um, on a scale of zero to 10, where uh, zero means not at all and 10 means trust completely, how much do you trust? And then they were offered a series of options. So the majority of municipalities were given four options, paper voting in person, telephone voting, voting by mail, and internet voting. And this table shows the mean of those responses. So here, the regular survey were those individuals who were exposed to these options. Um, however, in a couple of other municipalities, we, we modified things a little bit. We asked different variations of these questions. So this included one question with a specific feature that delivers enhanced security notably verifiability of internet voting, and a second question that asked about internet voting without that feature. So in this case, it was a ballot tracker ID we asked about, and in this case, it was a QR code that would allow voters to individually uh, to, to verify that their ballot had been cast correctly. And as you can see from you know, the means here, voters not knowing about security features have a relatively high trust in internet voting. So there's a mean score of 8.3. However, once voters are made aware, or respondents are made aware of these security features, those elements are needed to keep higher trust in internet voting. It is much lower without them. So once we tell them about the security feature, you can see the ballot tracker ID, those, you know, they say, okay, I would trust that, you know, 8.96, but without it, the trust goes down compared to here. And the same here, I mean, this is a, this is a very small sample. It was a small municipality. Um, but there is there is a difference there as well. Um, so I think we need to dig uh, we need to dig deeper into this. This is preliminary, um, but what does it all mean? Well, it means that you know educating voters about specific security features may not have a positive impact on um, satisfaction or increase. It might not increase trust. However, once voters are aware of these features, once they know about them, their trust in technology declines without them. You know, it might kind of be like 
Uh, for example, many of you may not think about the security of your home at all, but once you know about certain aspects, you may, you know, not feel your home as is as secure if it doesn't have those aspects. Um, and also that preliminary evidence suggests that such informational primes slightly reduce the security of some con security concerns of some voters. So what should governments do then? Is it better to have a less satisfied voter who also has less concerns about security and may be more aware and affected by a possible technical incident? I'd be really interested in the Q&A and your thoughts on this. Um, but to, to kind of sum up, knowing all of this, what can governments do? Just so, a note, we have a few minutes remaining. Okay, great. Um, thank you. So what can governments do? So we did do, um, I guess there's some, uh, um, Okay, it's the whole slide's up now. I realize that this may leave some governments wondering what are we going to do? And we did a representative um, survey with uh, just over a thousand um, Ontarians. This was obtained just after the election. So compared to the self-selected data, this is representative. <laughs> it was done by an online panel firm. And we asked um, a series of questions on that same trust scale about um, you know the degree the degree to which they would trust particular features of technology. Um, and what the results show here is that while voting on a web browser or app doesn't seem to make much of a difference in elector trust, um, when presented with security options, voters report having a higher trust in online voting systems that offer paper receipts and the ability to verify that the ballot was cast correctly. So I'll just finish up here. So what can we take away from all of this? Um, well, one is that digital elections do go wrong. It happens. And the technical incidents matter. Um, and they could matter a lot more. Again, this was, although it did have a big effect, and it was probably the biggest uh, um, incident in Ontario to date, um, it could have been much worse. Education about security, which some may think would be you know, a possible solution as we bring technology further into our elections, may actually not have a positive effect on voter orientations toward technology, but it could maybe it may be essential um, as the public becomes more aware to maintain their trust. Again, I want to just say that I think the Canadian public could be unique in terms of their acceptance of technical risk. Um, but ultimately, we don't know what the long-term effects of such incidents would be, or even public perception of incidents on voter attitudes and orientations, and how this could harm um, democratic engagement. In terms of policy recommendations, I think that governments, especially in Canada, but everywhere, need to be more prepared for unexpected incidents. Um, we need comprehensive technical standards. I know many countries, you know, Switzerland is working on that right now. Uh, the Council of Europe has some great guidelines. In Canada, we haven't had that. We are working on it now. Um, educating the public about technical risk, how, how to do this. I think we need to dig more into this uh, to get a definitive answer. And then balancing voter experience um, with security is really important. So what are the implications of this for AI? Well, first of all, technical incidents matter in the context of elections and potentially in other scenarios. Second, could knowledge of AI decrease public satisfaction in it? It could, uh, but could it also have a positive influence on security perceptions of the activities it performs? How would the application of AI influence trust? So these are all important considerations as technology is integrated into our lives, especially as government figures out uh, the regulation piece. Unregulated technologies have an even greater potential for incidents, in my opinion. Um, and some of you may be asking, well, how is this relevant? We don't, how are we going to see AI in voting um, specifically? And there's a number of opportunities. I mean, one, uh, I'll just give one really quick example. One opportunity would be using AI in the context of opt optical scan tabulators to better identify intent. So, you know, in one election that we had here, someone had marked a ballot and they had put a smiley face beside all of their selections and a sad face be beside the people that they didn't want. Now, a person, a human looking at that ballot could be able to interpret the intent and say, okay, I see the smiley faces. I know that this individual wants to vote for these people and doesn't want to vote for these people. But a tabulator reads that as an overvote and discards it. So that could be one way that AI could work in voting. Um, the future for technologies in our elections should ideally be a balance of regulation, uh, security to maximize electoral integrity. And the third piece that I, is up for exploration and discussion is how to do this in a way that best affects public perceptions and orientations to engage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kudman.
we have time for uh, one question. Yes, please. Yeah. Hi, Nicole. Thanks for a very um, excellent talk. Uh, my question was that uh, digital voting has also been done in Estonia, uh, which is supposed to be the leader in this area. So how do your findings compare with what has been found in Estonia? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I do follow the uh, Estonian case somewhat closely, but I'm not aware of any technical incident that has occurred um, you know, at such a large scale during the election. Um, I know there there was some talk some time ago when um, voting reached 25% of the population there. There was some security concerns that were raised, but not to the same scale. So I'd be interested if anyone knows of any research that is comparable. Yes, thank you. I, I, I think being an Estonian, I can comment a little bit. So there, there has not been any uh, major security um, failures in Estonia regarding digital elections. There are some concerns, but these are often also affiliated to the political opinions of some parties. So that's the short answer. So let's uh, thank again, Dr. Nicole Goodman. Thank you. thank you very much. And we will move on to the papers talk. The first paper is uh, by Kuram Yamin, Nima Yadali, Saokshi, and Dima Nansal, and is titled Novelty Detection for Election Fraud a case study with agent-based simulation data. Hi, I'm Nima Jadali, and this is Karam Yamin, and we're doing our presentation. Oh, testing? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm Nima Jadali, and this is Karam Yamin, and this is our presentation on novelty detection in uh, election fraud and using an agent-based simulation as a uh, case study. So I'll start off talking about the simulation a little. Uh, so our paper proposes a simulation that we use to uh, generate election data, uh, we inject fraud on an individual level, and this allows us to have labels for all the injected fraud as well, meaning we can generate data and then test uh, different models on it and measure their accuracy. Tr with traditional uh, methods or traditional data sets, you can't really uh, measure the accuracy of these models because unless if you inject it yourself, um, and this is some of the previous works where they would do similar like semi uh, generated data where they would take real world data and inject uh, fraud into it. And oftentimes this is done on the precinct level level on the individual level. Uh, there was one work where they injected fraud on the individual level. However, their uh, generated data set was very homogeneous, which me makes it difficult to do any uh, anomaly detection because it's pretty much trivial if it's uh, really uniform data. And the way we uh, it's not going to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the way we structure it is we have these precincts or electoral regions, and each electoral region is made up of uh, a lot of individuals. Uh, each individual has their own attributes, which are parameters that are put into the simulator where you say, uh, let's say income levels for like middle class income, it is 44% of the time uh, a person is a middle class. And we got our uh, probability distribution from the 2010 US census. And then using this, we generate a bunch of people. And then this is a uniform distribution now uh, for each precinct. We want to make it more interesting so, and add variability to it. So we redistribute the people based on preferences for certain precincts. And doing this, it generates a very, uh, varied data set, which we use to then uh, cast votes for all the people. So we have the population in the, pre in the precincts or the electoral regions. Now we have to determine who they vote for. Uh, we use a simple neural network with uh, random weights to do this. Uh, it stays, the weights stay consistent between individual and individual, but between different runs of the simulation, they're different. And basically you put, you put in the attributes of the individual and it outputs the vote score, which you can use to uh, segment or threshold it so that above a certain threshold is for candidate A and then another is for candidate B and so on. And so using this, we can uh, basically determine who each individual work votes for with some randomness added in as well. Um, and after this vote, uh, after determining the vote for all the individuals, we poll this population 
this is all we this is also where we get the uh, election results before fraud is injected uh the polling we put some error into it we use 2.9 percent or we try to mimic 2.9 percent which is uh, the aggregated polling for the U.S. national elections uh, error. And then we add fraud into this, which is where we also record the data. And now we have a pre and post fraud injection data sets. And we also have labels for all the frauds that we can use to determine accuracies for. Uh, now for the fraud injection itself, we're using swapping fraud. Uh, deletion fraud and addition fraud. Swapping fraud, we swap the uh, votes in favor of a certain candidate. Deletion, we remove votes in certain of a certain candidate. And addition uh, fraud, we add frauds in favor of a certain candidate. And this is just an example of the before and after of fraud uh, in the, in, with the pie charts and uh, the frauds in favor of candidate B, which is blue. And we see a shift in the, uh, this is like the percent of the precincts that uh, are voting or are in favor of a certain candidate. And we see a shift in that uh, after the fraud, but it's not enough to put candidate B in the lead. But we see also a shift in the composition of how uh, extreme the votes were in favor of a certain candidate. And now Karam's gonna talk about the model. Hi, so for our model, our goal is to detect election abnormalities or anomalies in the election. We don't seek to detect definitive election fraud because it's, it's like basically impossible to do that without looking at individual ballots. Um, so the way we do this is we compare the election results of each electoral region to the general trends of, uh, of regions that are similar to it. So we compare election results of regions to the poll predictions and the regression predictions of similar precincts. So for existing literature, there's been a good bit of work done on machine learning for elections and statistical tests for elections, but a lot of it has been highly politically motivated and like when scrutinized, like they don't hold up, for example, Benford's Law and Lots test. Uh, as of recent, there have been some researchers doing machine learning for specific uh, like election detection, fraud detections. Like for example, a researcher used computer vision to look at ballots to see if ballots were changed. But these fraud detection measures are usually on an individual ballot level, uh, not a holistic level. Mm -hmm. So the way we do our model is first, we cluster the individual electoral regions into different groups based on their demographic similarity. The demographically similar uh, regions are clustered together. Um, uh, and then we compare those regions. So for, for each cluster, uh, now we, uh, we compare each, of the re each electoral result to the poll prediction and the regression prediction of similar counties. So, for example, if there's an elect, if there's a specific electoral region, we're going to compare it to the general trends as predicted by the regression, and we will compare it to the polling estimates for all similar counties. And we do that, um, we do that using a support vector machine, uh, where it is trained on the election, the polling predictions, and the regression predictions. Uh, so you can see here that, like for example, in the, in our clean data set. Uh, we have we have the SVM with this boundary, and all of our points are, are found inside, so we don't detect any fraud. But when we have a level of fraud at 20%, you can see those yellow points are outside the barrier of the SVM. So it's it's like we're saying those are anomalous, or at least abnormal, not like definitively fraudulent, but they at least merit further investigation. And then we run the simulate we run a simulation and we test our methodology on it. So you can see that we generally have high accuracy at all levels, and our precision and recall uh, increased rapidly as well. Precision recall are relatively low at 5% fraud, but they increased at 12.5 and 20% to be very high. Uh, we also compare our method to two baseline models, which are kind of like the most recent holistic models developed for machine learning elections. Uh, at a, uh, so the first model is the paper that we wrote, uh, our lab wrote uh, last year. So this paper generally detects the correct amount of fraud, but its recall is correct. Its recall is not good. So it detects like the correct number of, correct number of fraudulent uh, regions, but it doesn't detect which ones are like the correct, the actual, which regions are actually fraudulent. And then another baseline uh, by a group at Caltech, they simulate a clean election and inject fraud, uh, fraud into the election. And then they use that model to create a random forest, which is then used on the actual election. So this generally has a uh, high precision, re decent precision recall and accuracy as well. But as you can see, our model has generally higher accuracy and a higher F1 score, which is the combination between precision and recall. Um, so in terms of our model's use, it's like highly applicable to a variety of situations because we're not looking at specific types of fraud. Instead, we're holistically looking at the entire system. Yeah, and also the simulation allows for us to run 
uh, a lot of different or generate a lot of different data sets with different amounts of fraud, which means you can run models with various uh, population makeups or uh, varying amounts or types of fraud to see how they compare and see which models perform well with certain types of fraud and so on. So in terms of the limitation on models, even uh, even at like uh, at normal fraud levels, there is a significant amount of false positives. So this is just to say, again, that our model can detect definitive fraud, and it's only used to suggest places that should be further investigated, like perhaps manually. And other limitations is the quality of the data itself. For example, we use polling data as, as a metric of comparison. But if the polling data is bad, then the model probably won't work well. In addition, the simulation needs a lot of tuning with further parameters. Uh, for example, uh, tuning the amount of noise for the poll would drastically change the results. And finally, uh, the random generation can lead to some of the data sets being unrealistic. So overall, over a lot of runs, the data sets might be good, but there might be some outliers that don't perform well. So in terms of future work, we need to do more extensive analysis about how sensitive the model is to polling errors and additionally. And we're also working on adding temporal data to this all. So we can have a uh, one where it's like it generates data, then there's a time skip and it generates new data that's somewhat similar so that you can use the, uh, for example, the post data as some sort of ground truth. Uh, in addition, we're working on making the whole simulation trainable so that you can, so instead of being purely random, uh, you provide it with some sort of data set from an election of interest and it generates new data that is similar to that uh, election of interest. And that's our presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Yeah, if there's any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Any questions from the floor? If there are, if there are, are questions on the floor, are there people online who have questions? Okay, so I would like to ask then, so, um, so the paper you presented predicts the right amount of fraud, yeah. but, the, uh, but the model is only used for to pointing to the direction of the fraud, not, not the specifics of the fraud. Sorry, what, what is the question? So how would you um, apply this model in real life? So have you, have you planned using real data? Yeah, so we're, we're planning to try it on the Fulton County data. That's where Georgia Tech is. So I, I think we have all the parameters that we need. For example, we have like polling data like on, on a county level. And then we have specific, we have demographic, we have demographic data for each of the precincts. So it's kind of like, so like obviously we, we, we couldn't run that. We probably wouldn't be running the simulation or we could run a, sim we could simulate an election similar to the Fulton County election, but like the model itself, like the machine learning model could be applied to any actual election. Mm -hmm. Would you think it would be uh, feasible to, to obtain the polling data from, from free, real life uh, sources? Yeah, so we kind of like the, the, the way we looked at our polling data and the error was that we kind of looked at like, like real life polling and like how, how much the error was and specifically like that. And we kind of like, that's how we mimicked our, our polling. Thank you. One question from the floor. Yes, thank you. Uh, do you assume that fraud in your uh, models, do you assume that fraud happens across the board? Uh, on average, or can you regionally cluster it? Because I'm asking, because in real life, sometimes you have regional clustering of fraud. So could you um, simulate that as well? Uh, so we aren't clustering the frauds, but we're limiting it to certain parts of certain percentage of the precincts being affected. So for the test we did, we did 10 or 20 or 40 of the 250 precincts being affected by the fraud. Uh, but is it is feasible to constrain it to like, uh, precincts that have historically been of a certain composition only do fraud on those ones. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Any more questions from the floor or from online? If not, let's thank the authors again. And we move on to the fourth talk, which is by Samiran Code and Supreeth Bar. And the paper is titled Understanding Political Polarization Using Language Models. 
a data set and method. Authors, are you online? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. So please uh, share your screen and uh, you can start the presentation. Yeah, uh, so, so Supreet will be sharing because I'm facing some difficulties in sharing the presentation, but I'll be the one talking. Uh, so our paper's titled Understanding Political po Polarization Using Language Models, a Data Set and Method. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, we primarily focus on the US political system because uh, because it's a two-party system and um, this way it's easier to analyze, but uh, our work can be carried forward with the uh, with other uh, electoral uh, democracies uh, which have multi-party systems. Um, so we basically try to uh, look at two questions, which is, uh, can we measure how polarized a, a candidate is? Uh, and if so, uh, how... Uh, do we see if it's changed over time? And uh, as a result of this, we come up with a data set which we believe would be useful for, for the research community. Um, uh, so next slide, please. So um, one of the reasons why we look at this is because um, knowing how po polarized an individual is um, would help the voters make informed decisions because uh, uh, how polarized they are would determine their views on um, economy, healthcare, um, and other such issues. Um, so also this polarization would uh, affect the decision-making abilities uh, of the candidate and uh, would predetermine what their views would be on certain bills. Um, another thing is uh, a lot of the polarization that a lot of polarization gets traction on social media and that of that somehow takes away from the uh, actual policies um, and our work tries to separate the rhetoric from the actual policy uh, views um, and, and the underlying reason uh, the underlying way we do this is using the uh, data available on wikipedia uh, and then use this to quantify how uh, whether or not a a, a, a political individual is polarized and if they are, how polarized are they? Um, next slide, please. So, like I said, we are trying to uh, find these two questions. Um, and as a result, the data set that we have um, scraped off Wikipedia is uh, over 120 years of Congress from the 58th to the 117th Congress. And we've divided this into four phases so that we can um, look at separate uh, phases or separate Congresses and uh, across different times and then measure how polarized they all are or if they are indeed uh, and compare them across time. And uh, yeah, so uh, like I said, the data set is from the 58th to the 117th Congress. We scraped the data set and manually annotated parts. Um, so this is something which is useful in what we are trying to do with our future work as well, is um, we believe that uh, the um, policies of an individual or their political leanings, if they are not uh, polarized, or if, if, if we were in an ideal world, uh, would be independent of what their, uh, where they grew up, where they were born, uh, what alma mater they went to. And as a result, what we have done with the data set is, um, we will be releasing both the raw and the um, clean data set is uh, we've manually annotated for all of these individuals um, from the 58th to the 117th Congress. We have manually annotated parts, which uh, we believe are um, necessary, uh, are something which are related to the background, something which is related to their political career, uh, and uh, something which is irrelevant. Um, next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. So the data that we use for this is, uh, and we've also um, uh, labeled the data that is uh, for each individual. We've uh, labeled them as either being a Democrat. A Republican or someone who's changed their parties. So we we haven't looked at people uh, who changed their parties, but that uh, data is also available in our data set. Um, and we use the personal details for that 
part uh, uh, while uh, also, we have so the way we've looked at the data is we have this background information, the political information, as well as um, the initial heading of Wikipedia, which can sort of gives the summarized information about the individual. So the original raw data has all of this, um, the, the separated parts, but um, the part that we looked at was this background and the political uh, information. Um, next slide, please. So. The preliminary analysis that we did was with more uh, classical uh, language models um, that we used Doc2Vec and Word2Vec. We used Doc2Vec to sort of see if we could classify just using these simpler methods and see if there was some polarization. Um, our, uh, so it was Doc, the embeddings that we got from Doc2Vec and then we used a simple classifier. And uh, there was some um, uh, difference. In it. So basically we were able to classify it but the accuracy wasn't as high. Um, however, we did see more uh, interesting information with Word2Vec, which uh, motivated our use of more complicated um, or more sophisticated uh, language models. So um, for example, with Word2Vec, some interesting results were that um, for words like, for words which are considered politically sensitive, uh, words like, gun violence or gun. So if you used the word gun, um, you would see that for Democrats, uh, the word check and violence were closer neighbors of the word gun, while for uh, Republicans, these were farther down the line. Um, also, we uh, saw the words, we, we checked for words like immigrants across these four phases. So we saw that the words immigrant in um, and for Republicans and Democrats, we saw that the word immigrants um, in recent times um, give are closer to words like um, words which are more um, uh, more politically sensitive. While words, the word immigrant, if you look back uh, with the uh, earlier congresses, were um, were more accepting because. Uh, our, and I, I mean, our, our hypothesis is, but we haven't really gone into this part, but this is something interesting. And that's why we are releasing this data set is maybe other people would be interested in going down this path is the word immigrant was uh, more associated with um, kinder words, I suppose, because uh, that is when, um, this is when uh, immigration was accepted in United States. Uh, next slide, please. So um, for the main analysis, we look at uh, uh, using these transformer-based models. Uh, we worked first with Roberta and then with Longformer. The reason being Longformer could take in um, uh, input tokens which were larger. So it, it can take in uh, uh, input of 2048 while Roberta could only take 512. And uh, what we try to do is uh, we look at the embeddings and try to see if we can um, classified just based on these embeddings, not fine-tuned on the data itself. Uh, and then try to, we, I mean, we propose a method where we can use these embeddings to uh, see if, see how polarized an individual is. Um, so next slide, please. So with the long former and uh, while using uh, um, these raw embeddings with a simple uh, SEM classifier, we see that uh, we could uh, classify with Doc2Vec, we, we could classify with 72% uh, accuracy on the political data and 63% on background. So, uh, and, and with long former, it was around 70 with just the background information. Um, and with political, it's obviously higher because we expect that the political uh, we expect that one would be able to classify based on the pol political information, but with background information, it should not be as easy to classify uh, since um, in an ideal world, your background should not determine what your, uh, what your political leanings are. Uh, one thing to note here is that we have cleaned the data of all bias. Uh, we have removed the names, we've removed the names of parties, we've removed the names of individuals, and this is the result after that. So, um, next slide, please. Um, the part that I'll come to know is um, the 
way we propose one could measure how polarized an individual is that is um, given the embeddings of this um, individual we find the uh, nearest neighbors for um, each of these individuals and uh, based on who is uh, closest to them and um, their political leanings let's say uh, if if you look at the 20 closest neighbors and um, we expect that if if a person is not politi politically polarized uh, not politically polarized their uh, their uh, neighbors would would be diverse that is they would come from both sides of the party um, however if they are polarized um, their neighbors would be uh, from the from their own party and they would basically be clustered together so um, what we see is for some of these candidates who are the most polarized, uh, the, the neighbors tend to be from the same party. Um, next, slide, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so uh, what we basically uh, try to achieve through, the, through this paper is, uh, and we'll be releasing the data set, we're trying to uh, um, work extend this work and uh, release it there um, what we are trying to do is uh, create a data set which would help others also since this is um, data which has been collected from a um, since this is data that is from the 50th congress it would be uh, beneficial to see if there is indeed polarization or if it has changed over, across time um, and uh, we propose one method we are also extending that method to find um, ways of um, classifying whether an indi individual is polarized and measuring how polarized they are. Uh, so the future work that we're looking at is um, looking at the words that um, the CLS token in the long former identity, the fine fine tuned. Uh, uh, long former token uh, long former model actually attends the most to uh, and then trying to see um, how much of this comes from a from the background and how much of this comes from uh, the political this is not our da the data that we showed right now this is the work that we're working on right now um, and uh, some work that perhaps others can also look at is um, with better language models uh, this can thank you the time is over Okay. Can you wrap up with a couple of sentences? Sure. So, um, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Let's thank the authors. Do we have any questions on the floor? Yes, please. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so, I come from the field of political communication, and a lot of the results here are not super surprising if you're looking at the way that people are socialized and their party affiliations. And so I want to ask about the assumptions behind this, about what you were actually looking for for polarization, what the effect was. Is the assumption that polarization is bad? Because you could also argue for some people, it's a perfectly rational choice to be polarized mm -hmm. um, and to vote for people that have their same views. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I would add the question at the end is, have you considered looking at people who are not polarized because they might mm -hmm. be more interesting mm -hmm. yeah uh, thank you for the question that's actually uh, very interesting um so our our uh, entire motive was to uh, because it's easy to say if a person is polarized but it's difficult to justify if they are i mean we can't really uh, how do you show with some empirical evidence that they are polarized and that's what we were trying to uh, achieve with this and we're still working on that is um could you actually say someone is polarized? And if so, how polarized are they? I mean, there's some work which we haven't yet. Uh, I mean, we're still experimenting, but maybe I can share this was uh, one way you tell someone is polarized is based on their rhetoric. Uh, but what if that's just that's just way of a way of getting traction, which, which is uh, work that I, I guess you would also be aware of and has been uh, studied closely is um, people who are obviously uh, say this stuff just to get traction um, um, turn out people consider them to be more polarized but if you look at their actual political views they they might not be as polarizing and th there might be people who are largely silent and not very visible on media but um, their views are 
more polarizing and so if we can somehow quantify who is more polarizing and give that information to uh, to the voters that would perhaps be useful thank you thank you let's thank the authors again and now we have the next paper talk 5 is by Rath Upasani, Vishal Balagani, Hausik Lakkarayu, Sugalei, Piplak Srivastava, Brett Robertson, Andrea Higgerson, and Vignesh Narayanan. And the paper is called on safe and usable chatbots for promoting voter participation. And this is an um, on-site talk. Thank you. You may proceed. Oh. Hi, I'm Vishal, and today we'll be talking about our work on safe and usable chatbots for promoting voter participation. Uh, this is a joint work done with uh, University of South Carolina and University of Mississippi. Uh, there are a couple of people that have contributed to this work. The, uh, the names that are underlined are going, to, uh, are going to give the talk today. A brief look at how the talk is organized. I'll initially start off by uh, giving the motivation for this research problem, following which I'll talk about the role of chatbots uh, and also the importance of the input data that is given to train the chatbots. Then Kaushik uh, will talk about the safe chatbot design that we have proposed in this paper, followed by the possible ways to test the design chatbot. Later, which Bharat will talk about the implementation of election bot and also the insights uh, from the focus group of the election bot. We'll conclude today's talk with a uh, discussion and uh, the future work. The voting turnout rate, uh, especially in the US, has been recorded at 62.8% in the year 2020, which is very low in comparison with all other countries. Promoting voter participation using traditional approaches is often costly. Uh, and these tradition, uh, traditional approaches include uh, distribution of flyers or having government campaigns and so on. And this is also time consuming often uh, yielding little to no results. Using technology for auto engagement, especially among seniors and youth, has been a well-researched problem statement. Chatbots, uh, which are a way of technology that we are currently exploring in this work, can proactively and also interactively deliver useful information for voting compared with websites that are available uh, as of now. Safe chatbot-like design is very essential in order to deliver a sensitive information, especially pertaining to elections. And we come up with such an architecture in this work, which has not been done in the previous uh, um, related survey that we did. The effectiveness of using chatbot to improve voting turnout has also not been evaluated. And that is something that we would like to contribute in this research. Uh, if we take a look at uh, the top 10 easiest and hardest states to vote in the US, uh, we see that South Carolina is ranked at 43rd and Mississippi is ranked at 49th, uh, which are some of the toughest states to vote um, based on various factors such as availability of information, ease of voting, and so on. And for our research, we have considered uh, or we have built chatbots for these two particular states. And uh, this is done because we have collaborators in these two states. So it eases our uh, focus group testing. Coming to the role of chatbots, Current chatbots are capable of performing general chit chat, provide a way to interact with smart appliances and also help disseminate information. There was a tremendous 67% increase in chatbot usage uh, between the years 2018 and 2020. However, the enthusiasm for AI services is being da dampened by growing concerns about their reliability and trustworthiness with issues like bias and privacy. Later, I'll also demonstrate uh, the immensely popular chat GBT's ability uh, in answering questions related to elections. So uh, chatbots need uh, an input training data. And as I just talked about chat GPT, it is unsuper unsupervised and is trained on a huge corpus of data. And we like to uh, follow a more conventional approach of using uh, grounded and FAQ data that is available on the government websites. And the intuition behind uh, that is it helps propel user trust in the chatbot and the answers provided by the chatbot are grounded and safe. But one of the downsides is that not all sought after questions by the people are captured in the FAQs listed out in the government maintained websites. 
uh, here is a glimpse uh, or a snapshot of our interaction with ChatGPT, uh, which is released in December 2022. So we post ChatGPT with the following question. What is South Carolina's new voting system and how does it work? So we see the response from ChatGPT and we can infer that it is limited by the training data. And it's not able to provide information because its knowledge cutoff is at September 2021. We also asked some other interesting questions to chat GPT, such as are, Rep are Republicans going to win the elections or whom should a person vote for, which are uh, independent or personal questions. And chat GPT uh, very cleverly avoids hypotheticals and does not uh, choose a preference, which is a good feature to have. Uh, now I would like to do a quick demonstration of uh, election chatbot, which is what we have built and see how it handles the same questions that were previously posed to chat GPT. So this is the landing page for our website. And if you click on this button, we can interact with the chatbot. So I'm going to ask the first question. Uh, what is South Carolina's? So uh, the answer is pretty detailed, but we can see that uh, election bot is able to retrieve the relevant information for this particular question, which ChatGPT was failing at. And let's also ask uh, the questions that ChatGPT was cleverly answering, which is regarding hypotheticals. Uh, are Democrats going to win the elections? So we see here that election bot also deflects these kind of questions uh, by saying that it cannot handle uh, these requests and also refresh the question. So our intuition is that the personal uh, opinions are not generated by the chatbot, but we only want to disseminate information that is publicly available by the government. How we achieve this is using the safe chatbot architecture, which will be uh, talked about in detail by Kaushik. Uh Good afternoon, everyone. Now I'll be presenting the general architecture uh, for building chatbots with the goal of uh, promoting safety and usability. So the uniqueness of our architecture lies in a safe design where only responses that are grounded and can be traced back to the original source, that is the official FAQ, elections FAQ document in this case, will be answered via sel system self-awareness. And the another critical uh, component of our architecture is a do not uh, answer strategy strategy that can deflect uh, certain user questions, which are not supposed to be answered. So an example would be what we shall demonstrated uh, something that is subjective or it just avoids hypotheticals. And we also uh, have a low programming design a pattern based on open source Rasa platform, uh, which can be used to generate chatbots quickly for any region. So this is the safe chatbot de design. Uh, there is a data, we have a database uh, with common opening and closing dialogues, which can be reused for any chatbot, any other chatbot. And we also have task specific QA, uh, which in this case is uh, related to elections. We have an intent generator, which generates intents for each of those example sentences uh, that are given in the official FAQ document. And we have a paraphraser, uh, which augments the data by uh, creating different variations of the same sentence. And then we have Rasa dialogue system with its uh, natural language understanding pipeline. We also provide some common services uh, like accessibility settings, different accessibility settings. And also we, uh, it, it, the chatbot will be made available in different languages. And there is also a logging system, which can be, which can be used to store the user conversation with the chatbot and can later be used to audit those conversations. And uh, do not answer component, uh, which is another important component, uh, I, which I already talked about. And uh, we also integrated this chatbot with Alexa and uh, you have already seen the web demo of it. So we do testing uh, using two different methods. Uh, one is focus group and other is RCTs. So focus group is mainly used to get insights and feedbacks guided by structured and unstructured questions for the target users of the chatbot. In the case of our election chatbot, it is the senior citizens. And RCTs are uh, used when users are where their users are randomly assigned to two versions of the chatbots to evaluate the effect uh, differences between the chatbots. RCTs are used for quantitative evaluation and focus groups are used for qual qualitative analysis. And these could be conducted to get insights and results. 
So I'll briefly talk about uh, RCTs. Uh, so RCTs are mainly mostly used in uh, healthcare domain. And in the case of, uh, in the context of our uh, election chatbot or any chatbot, uh, the users are either assigned to experimental group or a control group. Uh, in the experimental group, chatbot gives specific answers to specific questions. Uh, but in the placebo or the control group, chatbot will send the same web page link uh, where the answers reside instead of answering the questions in a specific manner. We collect these feedbacks from different users and we compute the statistical difference uh, between both these feedbacks. Uh, now, Bharat will talk about the election bot implementation and also the insights from the focus group. Hello, everyone. I'll talk about the implementation of our election bot for the two states, uh, South Carolina and Mississippi. Uh, I'll talk about the procurement of the data sets, the pre-processing uh, for the chatbots and the safe chatbot uh, design uh, that we followed as just Kaushik mentioned. Uh, talking about the data that is available in the official government websites, uh, this is a uh, comparative analysis of the two states, South Carolina and Mississippi. Uh, both of the websites have uh, FAQ format uh, that are provided, whereas South Carolina has 30 FAQ questions and Mississippi has 12 FAQ questions. And the latest, uh, these websites have been updated are as follows, like October 25th, 2022 and November 11th, 2022 for the both states, South Carolina and Mississippi. First, uh, these, FAQ, uh, uh, these FAQ websites are scraped using a web scraping tool and the data is stored as follows uh, in a question answer pair. And uh, later the same FAQ pairs are augmented with uh, intent and paraphrased questions. We have uh, used an ngram based approach uh, to extract the intents uh, for the questions that have been present in the FAQ website. And later, a TFI-based uh, language model has been used to append the question answer pair with six semantically similar questions to improve the effectiveness of the response of the chatbot. And uh, later, the RASA framework has been used to uh, develop a chatbot framework for uh, South Carolina and Mississippi. And later, uh, these are deployed in web and Alexa. Here are the links that you can follow to access the chatbots uh, as the demo has been provided by uh, my friend Vishal. Later, uh, after implementing the ch chatbots, we went uh, forward and did a focus group testing for both the states, uh, South Carolina and Mississippi. Two groups for South Carolina and one group for Mississippi. One of the groups, uh, focus groups in South Carolina had two senior citizens. And the main insights that were obtained uh, from this testing was uh, the users uh, were seeking the information regarding time, location, and election procedures. Whereas the official FAQ website has only the details regarding the election procedures and is missing the data for time and location. And the second focus group uh, was consisting of four senior citizens with hearing and visual disabilities. They were uh, mainly seeking the information regarding candidates and propositions. Neither of the information was present in the SEFAQ website. And the next focus group was regarding the Mississippi state, uh, where the user expressed preferred medium uh, of the information consumption would be in-person rather than uh, through government uh, officials, only through government officials. One minute. And it was also noted that only few senior citizens have uh, access to the technology and expertise to interact with this. Uh, coming to the summary, uh, we discussed a safe uh, architecture to build the chatbots. And the safety highlights of our system are it responds only to the grounded and traceable uh, questions. And the answer uh, was self-awareness. And uh, due to the logging capability, it, it is also capable to audit the answers post-conversation and a do not answer strategy has been um, uh, employed to deflect uh, the answers which are not to be, uh, the questions which are not to be answered and deflected and a low program uh, design pattern for uh, using the RASA platform uh, and the architecture of a safe chatbot has been employed. And the proposed voting chatbots are closed domain and does not answer uh, open domain questions like hypothetical questions. And some of the future works that we are looking for this chatbot are to improve the coverage uh, by combining non-official 
sources uh, by asking the user intent whether he wants to dilute the uh, source of information or not and use a generative model in the context of uh, building the safe chatbots. And some of the short term goals are uh, improving the do not answer strategy by employing uh, different modalities and providing an extractive summary as one of the answers that was retrieved was very long, which would be hard for the users to go follow and read through the entire answer rather than provide an extractive summary at upfront. And the, according to the user interest, we can expand the entire answer. And also other experimental tests like RCTs other than focus groups itself uh, can be done in a short term uh, future work. These are a few of the references. And for additional details, you can uh, follow our paper uh, at this link. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the interesting paper. Do we have any questions from the floor or from online audience? I would like to um, present some questions. So, so you presented this uh, paper as um, uh, the novel novelty of this paper was the um, prevention of certain topics that you know, that, that constitutes the chatbot as safe chatbot. So, um, and and my question is, can this uh, prevention strategy some be somehow circumvented? Because certainly, ChatGPT can be circumvented by even the questions that it doesn't answer when you ask long enough and interact based, and it still is able to release information that it shouldn't. So uh, are you mentioning about the do not answer strategies to yeah. just deflect the users? Yeah, you want to um, avoid, um, not to, you don't want to touch certain uh, biases, yeah. certain political or, yeah. or other biases. So. Currently, we just uh, detect the do not answer questions that uh, the user are post, uh, posing, like whom you want to vote, uh, whom do you support kind of questions. And we just give a straightforward answer of, we don't support this according to our knowledge base, or can you rephrase the question and I'm not understanding. In the future work, we would like to explore some other modalities like deflecting or uh, guiding the user to ask different questions rather than such hypothetical questions. Uh, we still have a small risk in our current thing. And I'll explain the language model you see in the DASA dialogue system. That small piece is used to generate multiple alternatives for the same question. Okay. So that is not necessary strictly, but just to improve the system's uh, responsiveness for all kinds of ways you can ask question, right? Uh, usually that language model is used to generate alternatives. Okay. We could restrict it. It's a tunable parameter. We can restrict it completely. But this is, I would say, is a very, very small risk in the sense that it is, who are you? What, what is your name? That kind of a thing. It's a very, but it's a tunable parameter. But other than that, we, our focus is to only answer things which, uh, whose answer can be traced back to the original source. So most of the common things which come is because of the uh, election-related information, not the way you can ask questions. So we may answer wrong thing because of that language model, but uh, we don't answer anything uh, away. We don't try to create answers. Yeah. Thank you for the answer. And um, of course, when we uh, develop such systems, we think of the real life uh, uh, deployment. We always want to foresee that the system will be deployed sometimes in the future. So I, 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 I foresee the uh, possible questions from the from the public, uh, which uh, may refer to the bias of the developers or the bias of the yeah. deployers of such systems, because uh, as many of our uh, presenters in the first session pointed out that we need to have mechanisms in place that refer to uh, democratic practices and technical practices, which, uh, which, uh, which would uh, validate such system in real life. Thank you very much. and. Let's go on to the next talk. The sixth and uh, final talk of this session will be by Deepak B, Stanley Simos, Maurice McCarty, 
and is titled AI and Core Electoral Process, Mapping the Horizons. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, am, I, am I audible? Yes, you are very loud and clear. Okay, you may yeah, share the... your screen and uh, yeah, start, yeah, start yeah, your presentation this, this as you see fit. Yeah. Just one minute. Okay. Um, uh, let me start my presentation. Why is it not? All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stanley, and I'm a PhD student at Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, the title of this talk is uh, AI and the Core Electoral Processes Mapping the Horizons. Um, last year, my co-authors in this work, Deepak and Murish, whose pics you can see on this slide, and I began exploring how AI has been used within the electoral process globally. Uh, our findings, which included both scholarly information and intriguing stories from the real world, uh, were put together in an article, which was eventually accepted for publication in AI magazine this fall. I'll be sharing with you some of our findings in this talk. Um, during our explorations on the topic of AI usage in the electoral process, uh, we found that most scholarly discussions uh, were around the impact of disinformation and personalized content. We did come across AI-based solutions that aid voter education, detect disinformation and hate speech, and predict election trends such as voter turnout. Uh, but most of this technology is focused on aspects uh, outside of the actual administration of the election itself. Um, that is the time, place, and manner of elections, uh, which we call, which we refer to as the core electoral processes. In fact, there appear to be very limited deliberations on the usage of AI in these core electoral processes. Um, towards addressing this deficiency, we have put together content from various sources, cutting across disciplines, with the goal of mapping the horizons of risks and opportunities involving AI usage in this domain. The benefits of using AI are well, well established. Within the public sector, there have been reports that suggest that the adoption of AI within government processes could free up one third of public servants' time. Uh, however, when adopting AI within the public sector domains, there are some key considerations that should be kept in mind. Some of these considerations include public accountability, inclusiveness, trust, and the effect of AI on human rights. In fact, the harms of the uptake of AI within other public sectors, such as policing and healthcare, are well documented. This would suggest that enough care needs to be taken when using AI in the public sectors, since these have an implicit expectation of being fair and responsible. In the context of elections, uh, the integrity and access to the electoral systems affect public trust in elections and democracy itself. The focus of this talk revolves around the usage of AI within the core electoral processes. I will specify in the next slide what we view as the core electoral processes. This will be followed by a discussion on two illustrative avenues in the core electoral process, along with an AI technology that has been used or can be used in each of these avenues. We will also look at a potential ramification and a path and a pathway towards mitigating these risks. Uh, let me start with specifying what we view as the core electoral processes. We view the core, we view the electoral process as being made up of core and peripheral functions. Uh, the core functions in the electoral process include everything to do with the administration of the election, which, if you refer to the U.S. Constitution, is defined as the time, place, and manner of elections. Some examples of these functions are voter list maintenance determining polling booth location um, and voter authentication at uh, polling place. As you can imagine, the core electoral processes would typically be managed by public election bodies and authorities. Every other electoral process not carried out by the public election bodies would be peripheral. For example, candidates engaging in campaigning, um, the conducting of uh, opinion polls and exit polls, um, and reporting by the media. In contrast to the core electoral processes, uh, the peripheral ones would involve private actors such as the candidates, uh, the media, and social media tech giants. From our observations, given that the peripheral electoral processes have received more attention compared to the core processes, the focus of this talk is on AI usage in the core electoral processes. In the next couple of slides, we will look at two avenues in the core electoral process. Okay. The next, the first avenue is voter list maintenance. Uh, 
voter voting lists contain information on individuals who are eligible to vote. Having an up-to-date voter list is important to ensure the integrity of elections. On one hand, voters need to be removed from voter lists if they are moved, if they have moved, changed citizenship, or in the event of their death. On the other hand, voters moving into a locality would need to be added to the voter list. The onus of making an application for inclusion in the list is usually on the incoming voter. This is in contrast to voter removal, which would typically be done by election bodies. Naturally, automation seems an attractive proposition to efficiently uh, remove ineligible voters from the voter list. To maintain an up-to-date voter list, there may, need, there may need to be periodic checks to ensure that the voters are not registered multiple times on the same voter list or across different regions' voter lists. This is in line with the principle of equal representation in voting. In other words, one person, one vote. Having an ineligible voter on the voter list would affect electoral integrity, particularly if a false vote is cast in their name. On the other hand, leaving out a legitimate voter due to erroneous removal from the voter list would deny them access to their voting rights and thus reduce confidence in the electoral process. Clearly, balancing access and integrity is an important consideration of voter list maintenance. Uh, with regards to the AI usage in voter list maintenance, we found little evidence. However, given the sheer size of voter lists, which could potentially contain millions of entries, there is incentive for voter removal to be at least partially automated. There has been mention of the use of automated systems such as name matching in the US, wherein administrative data sources such as um, such as death notices and uh, recent address lists recent address lists are consulted. This opens a channel for the potential use of various AI techniques. One such technique is record linkage, uh, which is a fairly mature area in computing. Record linkage is concerned with identifying records that refer to the same individual. Um, a key challenge here is that of records that refer to the same individual but differ across data sources. So for example, the format of names could differ across data sources or on the other hand, multiple individuals may have the same name. Um, record linkage techniques would allow identifying true duplicates in a single voter list or across voter lists using pattern-based heuristics in consultation with external data sources. What are the potential ramifications if record linkage techniques are used? As you can see in the screen, screen grab of a news article on the right, there has been evidence that the use of administrative data to identify ineligible voters in the voter list uh, produces errors that are observed more for minority ethnicity, even when this process is done manually. Replacing the manual process with AI could simply reproduce these biases, thus depriving particularly com particular communities the right to vote. Uh, one option towards swaying uh, AI adoption towards uh, low-risk directions is access-focused AI, uh, wherein AI techniques are used to identify omissions in voter lists, uh, potentially through the use of external sources. Um, the identified voters could then be sent requests to enroll in voter lists, thus making the electoral process more inclusive. You can find other relevant AI techniques, potential ramifications, and pathways forward towards the usage of AI for voter list maintenance in our article. The next avenue is determining polling booth locations. Uh, polling booths are physical locations where voters within an electoral district exercise their right to vote. Uh, one would argue that polling booth locations are fairly static over decades, if not centuries. Uh, so there would be no need for technology here. Uh, however, there have been instances where new polling booths are introduced, for example, to increase the voter turnout and decrease waiting time. One such instance was in Telangana, India, which can be seen in the screen grab of a news article by the Hindu on the top right, uh, wherein a thousand new polling booths were added. There have also been instances where polling booths have been closed, uh, for example, to cut running costs. Uh, one such instance was in Texas, which can be seen in the screen grab of a news article by The Guardian on the bottom right. In our explorations, we found no evidence of current AI usage for determining polling booth locations, uh, but we find this unsurprising given the tendency of um, polling booth locations to remain static over time. However, if the need to determine polling booth locations does arise, like in the screen grabs on the right, uh, the technological readiness of AI in this context may be regarded as moderate to high. Uh, one such technique is facility location, which involves determining the locations for a number of service centers in accordance with multiple criteria. In the context of polling booths, some of these criteria would be area, population coverage, and access to public transport. Uh, let us now look at a potential ramification if these techniques are used. 
the availability of this technology may create an implicit urge to use it frequently, thus causing the polling booth locations to be changing regularly. This volatility could increase the finding costs of polling places and negatively affect voter turnout. I will now point out one of the pathways forward. Regardless of where polling booths are located, uh, there would always be some voters who are disadvantaged. Um, AI techniques could be leveraged to discover disadvantaged voters, such as the physically disabled, who are at a moderate to high distance from their polling booths. Now, efforts could then be directed towards helping such voters, thus fostering more inclusive voting and offsetting the deficits of the chosen polling booth location configuration. Okay. In this talk, I have given you a flavor of some of our findings, but the underlying article contains even more information. Uh, for example, besides the two discussed avenues, our article explores in depth three are the avenues of AI usage in the core electoral process. Um, these avenues are on polling booth protection, voter authentication, and video monitoring of electoral fraud. We also provide an assessment of the five avenues in terms of their technology readiness, uh, risk level, and the public visibility of the use of AI. On a concluding note, we believe that the usage of AI within core electoral processes is a volatile and interesting space, which is likely to see significant activity in coming years, uh, particularly in the context of citizen trust in electoral systems. Uh, we hope our attempt at mapping the horizons in this arena would help deepen the debates on the topic. Uh, you can find a preprint of our article titled AI and Core Electoral Processes Mapping the Horizons on Archive, uh, which besides scholarly information also contains fascinating stories from the real world. Um, yeah, we hope that you find it as interesting and informational as we did while putting together the content. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, comments, or criticisms, please feel free to reach out to either of us through email. Uh, we'll be very happy to talk. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for the interesting paper. Do we have any questions from the floor or from online audience? So I have, I have a question. Uh, I read your paper and uh, I think it was uh, very strong and one of the best papers of, uh, of this session. So um, it gives a very good overview of the core electoral processes and uh, to the extent the AI um, has, has been used. So my question would be, which strategies would you suggest to implement uh, uh, to introduce AI into electoral process. You have done this good overview, but let's say the uh, election officials, the government would like would like to follow your um, uh, uh, overview and, and the review. So how should they proceed? What strategy? Okay, yeah, so, um, so the general push towards the uptake of AI, right, within the public sector is, is more of an opinion that uh, technology is used for good uh, but if you look at some of the some of the other public sectors, like right, like for example, if you look at policing, uh, there has been a lot of information, uh, a lot of I mean, like debates on whether it has actually helped or not. Uh, especially since um, there has been, uh, I mean, like there have been, I mean, like people you people have known that uh, these these tech these technologies tend to target particularly particular groups. Uh, so, for example, um, there's this there's this compass, the compass recidivism al algorithm. Um, so, what 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 people from the social sciences suggested was that rather than you know just coming up with uh, technological solutions for for problems within this the public sector, um, we also need to take care of their. We also need to be concerned about their actual implications or how they how they actually affect uh, how they actually affect the public so i mean one of the slides i did i did uh, i mean okay i didn't mention in the slide but in the talk i i did mention that you know uh, the use of ai in the public sector um, can affect you know so there are problems of transparency fairness um, and they can even affect human rights uh, so these are considerations that we actually need to be they, they, we need to take care of them while uh, while um, while you know while taking up AI within the public sector. It's not enough to just think of it as you know um, uh, as as a means to solve problems, but we also need to be aware. So so that's basically the outline of you know the article. We are just we, we are just trying to say that yes, of course AI can be used, and there is a lot of push for AI to be used. 
I mean, like in, in in the context of this article, it's it's more of uh, more within the electoral process. But otherwise, in the public sector in general, uh, we also need to be aware of what are the risks involved, and and if possible, you know, if uh, if if possible, can we use AI for the betterment? I mean, like to to uh, in in areas that are not very not not that are of low risk. Yeah. So that's 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 what thank that's you. what i would see i would think thank yeah. you for the answer any more questions from the audience either in this floor or from online so let us wrap up this session thank you very much to all the presenters we had a nice discussion of the ai possibilities to use in electoral electoral process um, uh, we have a little bit snapped our coffee break time so let's do this coffee break a little bit uh, smaller and get back to this room at um, 4 p.m. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, Anita. Hi, Sagar. Uh, Professor Marcus, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. What time yeah. is it there? It's uh, 6 p.m. Okay. Thank you for being with Thank us. You. Okay. And uh, Welcome back, everyone. Uh, now we will have uh, the third uh, invited talk uh, in the workshop. And this is by Dr. Marcus Antonio Simplicio, Jr. Uh, uh, professor Marcus is an associate professor at University of Sao Paulo. Uh, he works uh, and conducts research in uh, cybersecurity and cryptography and in uh, various uh, resource constrained uh, scenarios, including the, um, and, and um, he's interested in, in um, uh, one of the eight scenarios he's interested in is um, uh, election-like trust-sensitive applications. Uh, he would also he would today give us a perspective about the Brazilian election and uh, what kind of technical issues it, uh, they uh, they bring up uh, into the uh, into the discussion. So, Professor Marcos, uh, over to you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I do have some slides here. I'd like to share. I mean, yes, they you can be. You should be able to share. Yeah. Uh, when you did you receive it, it seems so. Uh, we can see it. We can see yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm not really uh, a researcher on AI. So uh, I research on cyber security. So my goal here is to try to give an overview of what uh, or how and uh, how the voting machines work in Brazil, the, elect the electronic voting uh, works in Brazil, and which are the good points, which are the bad points, and some challenges that still exist. And also talk a little about the controversy that we had this year. I mean, uh, we had even a, our own Brazilian Capitolium invasion uh, in the uh, 8th January, and uh, this has a lot to do with this, with the, the voting machine itself, the electronic voting process in Brazil and how people see it, uh, how some people see it. Uh, so this is the outline of the, the presentation. The idea is to show the who, why, and how we have electronic voting in Brazil, uh, a little bit of the internals, a little bit of how the, um, the voters interact with the voting machine. Uh, some of the uh, security mechanisms that are available, uh, trying to answer the, uh, <laughs> the, the very asked question this year is, are the voting machines in Brazil secure? Uh, was the election rigged and this kind of stuff? And show a little of what it works, where the good points of it uh, and what could be better i mean the challenges involved in the uh, in the current process and some of the criticisms we had in this uh, election some legitimate concerns uh, there were many legitimate concerns and many more fabricated accusations so uh, the idea is to show a bit uh, each of them so i mean it's more like a i expect a discussion <laughs> Uh, you can ask questions uh, and I will try to answer them as well as I can and some conclusions on, on the procedure. So first, just uh, a little bit about me. Why, how am I involved in elections itself? Uh, well, since 2002, I'm involved in the elections like a vote, as a voter. I mean, because voting in Brazil is, is mandatory, so we can't, <laughs> after 18 
to not vote. So yeah, uh, I am a voter. <laughs> and also in 2014, there was the first large scale auditing in Brazil uh, requested by the, the uh, defeated party, uh, PSDB. And that was the first attempt to uh, actually exercise every auditing mechanism that there was in the system. And I will show you a bit of the results. I mean, some of the results were while well, we could go better on transparency on auditing mechanisms. That that was the, the main conclusion. And currently, uh, even being a, a critic of the system, uh, I mean, a critic in the sense of let's try to make the things that are not that good better. Uh, we, uh, the University of São Paulo, has been collaborating with the. Uh, the Elections Authority in Brazil, TSC, to uh, find points of improvement. And actually there are two projects in one here. We are trying to uh, find vulnerabilities. I mean, try to attack, uh, pen test the, the voting machines here. And also think a little out of the box and uh, every problem that was raised, legitimate problem that was raised uh, on the on the system, how to, to find solutions for it, uh, and think how to test it in real elections to to improve the system. So this is this is the context, um, and that's well, uh, that's the the the, the uh, preamble of the presentation. So discussing the elections itself, uh, who handles it in Brazil? Well, actually, everything is handled by one election authority. It's the superior electoral court, uh, TSC, using the acronym, the Brazilian acronym, and uh, with support of local uh, courts, electoral courts that uh, handle the process per state or per city, you know. Uh, so essentially they handle voter registration, the definition of every uh, procedure that will, uh, that, that um, will compose the the, the, uh, the the election. I mean, everything that, goes from the moment uh, the candidates are chosen until uh, are, are, um, uh, are proposed uh, uh, before chosen and until the uh, end of the election, until the telling process. They also recruit the pool workers, the, the people that will uh, work on the elections, like uh, checking the IDs of the voters. Uh, every logistics before and during the elections, for example, how to uh, distribute the voting machines all around the country. I mean, the whole country uses the same machines with the same source code uh, for, for every machine. Uh, they design also the voting machine, maintain its software. Uh, every year there are improvements or modifications that can uh, to, uh, aim to improve the system some aspect of the system. And also they resolve legal disputes. And this is a point that is mainly criticized here because uh, if something goes wrong, in principle, uh, the, the uh, culprit would be TSC because he handles everything. And he's also the judge of anything that, uh, well, is an accusation against itself. So it's uh, kind of, Weird. <laughs> there is a discussion here on uh, who should judge uh, the the, um, the disputes on elections in Brazil. Today, it's also TSC that handles this part here. So yeah, and voting is mandatory in Brazil. As I said, we have general elections every two years. We can uh, every two years we can retest the system and see how it goes. So that's the who, the why. I mean, many countries still use paper ballots, why the hell in Brazil we need to use voting machines? Uh, and the reason is quite simple. Uh, since the redemocratization in the 80s, uh, we had many, many, many problems uh, with fraud uh, with paper ballot ballots. Uh, they, they kind of got professional in uh, doing some rigged elections using paper ballots. Uh, here are just some examples ballots that would be destroyed, replaced, it, invalidated during the telling process. I mean, someone would just, uh, just uh, discard one of the papers. There are, there are even people that say uh, some of the guys doing the tally, they would eat some paper ballots just to make them disappear from the procedure. So kind of crazy to think, but yeah, that happened. 
uh, blank ballots, if they, they there were some blank ballots, they would be uh, filled during the telling process. I mean, someone would have anything actually, uh, even under their nails, just to make a mark on their candidates. So, I mean, uh, you could not vote for no one. <laughs> if you did, your vote would go to someone else during the telling process, quite usually. And also there were some uh, procedures, and that's when I, I said they were professional in, in committing fraud, uh, where people would have pre-filled pre ballot papers and they would give them to voters and those voters would go to the voting machine, not voting machine, I mean to, to the voting place, deposit that uh, paper ballot, get the blank one they, they got from the, uh, from the pool workers, and then give it so the next guy would have also to vote with the prefilled paper. So it was kind of uh, crazy in terms of frauding regions that were controlled by, well, not so honest uh, politicians and even militia and this kind of stuff. So that's that's a real problem. I mean, there are some people that say, well, we should go back to paper ballots to avoid every criticism on the electronic system. Uh, probably they are ignoring the, the, the problems that we had before <laughs> the electronic system. So the voting machines, they were introduced in 96 uh, and uh, the, the uh, first fully electronic election was in the 2000, in 2000 the, the, the first one for president, governor, senate, um, and yeah, and uh, some other representatives. So Brazil uses the direct recording electronic machine. It's the uh, a model different from India, for example. I saw some presentations here uh, from from India where there are paper paper ballots that were pr are printed by the voting machine. In Brazil, we only have the digital data, and this is one point of criticism. I mean, uh, how can I be sure? that the voting machine recorded my vote and not someone else's uh, a vote for someone else since I cannot see the materialization of the material of the, the, the vote I, I made. So this is one source of criticism, legitimate, I, I would say. Uh, and this is something that uh, is also uh, part of the current discussions between the University of Sao Paulo and other universities, uh, academia, and the uh, NTSE to uh, improve the system somehow. Um, and finally, the how. Uh, how is it done with uh, the, those DRE uh, machines? From the voters' perspective, it's essentially like this. They arrive at the designated loca uh, location where they, they have to, to vote, and they present their uh, their identification usually uh, there is uh, it can be a cell phone it can be a uh, a printed ID um, a printed ID card uh, biometrics this kind of stuff and then they just go to the the, the 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 voting place where the machine is there and they just enter their candidate numbers uh, all candidates are identified by numbers to facilitate I mean for those that are not uh, cannot read, for example. Uh, they can see the picture of the, the, the person they are voting to, and they confirm, and they go home and wait for the uh, for the results to be published. Uh, usually, it's uh, on the same day of the election. The results are ready uh, at the end of the day. So this is the how, on the perspective of the user. Behind that, there are some more <laughs> complications that happen. Uh, in principle, it should be easy. I mean, uh, when we talk about uh, electronic voting, it should be something like, well, it's just a machine that register votes and tell you the votes. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's addition. It's not that complicated. It's not rocket science, right? Uh, but then when you go into the uh, the actual requirements for electronic voting, you see things like, well, you need to handle uh, data that's quite complex from potentially millions of voters from different regions. I mean, the candidates are not the same in our regions, but well, okay, complex data structures should solve this. Not that hard. Uh, also, for accessibility reasons, you need to think about creating an audio for every textual element you have. So uh, anyone that has I mean, uh, some, some kind of blindness can know 
pool they are voting to. Uh, well, not that hard either. I mean, processing uh, audio, you need just to start for the audio, maybe not that hard. Uh, then you must have a precise uh, procedure, uh, even though you rely on fallible techno technology. I mean, it's just a machine. It can break at any point. Uh, it can even have uh, weird results if you don't have um, uh, error correcting codes or error detecting codes on the data that you store. So yeah, well, that starts to get a little more complicated. Then you need to uh, be secure enough to protect against domestic and foreign uh, malicious actors, knowing that you don't have a 100% secure system. There's there does not exist 100% security. You do the best that you can and you have yet to protect against many different actors. Uh, you have to have an usable and intuitive system, even for those that are not tech savvy. I mean, uh, even people that never work with computers in their lives and also the election officials, uh, the, the uh, workers, they need to it needs to be easy for everyone that is involved in the election, including the voters. Uh, it has to accommodate regular voters and also those with uh, disabilities. I mean, some disabilities I mentioned with the uh, audio uh, part. They must support transparency, verifiability, while also protecting voter privacy and equality. And while well, if you fail, uh, it has to be affordable. And if you fail, and if you fail, uh, you are in trouble because that's uh, the the peaceful passage from one president or governor or uh, whoever to the other depends on the trust on the system. And trust is not something like you can build, uh, like an algorithm for trust <laughs> does not exist exactly. So yeah, it's not rocket science. It's harder than rocket science in the end. Uh, that's not what I, I'm saying. I, well, I, I'm working with it. I agree with Mr. Uh, Eddie Paris uh, when he talks about this and, uh, at the DEF CON in 2021. Uh, there are many aspects that are hard to, to foresee. And then even if you foresee or if you see it happening, it's hard to just solve uh using technology uh, so this is uh, a problem and so how does brazil solves or tries to solve <laughs> this kind of problem uh, this is the whole ecosystem of the, the voting machine i mean you have to uh, create the dedicated machines and then you prepare the software that goes inside those machines you have the elections done on the software. There is this, uh, the, the voting phase. Then there is the telling phase. And finally, uh, you can try to audit uh, the system using every uh, audit trail that is available to voters. So my idea is to show a little each of those parts, how they work, starting from the start with the, the, the hardware. Uh, the hardware itself is not produced by, uh, by TSC. I mean, TSC handles everything except for the hardware itself. The design is uh, a co-creation between TSC and a hardware contractor, but the manufacturer itself, the manufacturing process is done on a dedicated assembly line uh, from a hired contractor. So uh, until 2015, it was Diebold mostly. And since 2020, uh, we, they, they changed it. The contractor is now Positivo. Uh, it's a Brazilian uh, Brazilian company. And probably the next years will be Positivo too. Uh, my, my best guess, uh, they created a, a, an interesting uh, assembly line. I, I had the opportunity to visit and uh, they seem to be very capable of delivering lots of uh, voting machines in the future. I mean, it's a price, uh, a price fight here. Um, but in principle, uh, I don't doubt they will continue being the contractor for producing voting machines. And one important part of these machines are the uh, called M MSE. It's a hardware security module that goes inside the voting machines and they uh, protect every uh, hardware, every uh, cryptographic material is protected by this hardware. Uh, one of the main sources of criticism, uh, mainly from academia in the past, 
was exactly that uh, if someone could get access to a voting machine and try to, I mean, uh, to reverse engineer it, it might be possible to extract some of those keys, the, the, the uh, keys for signing results, and somehow produce uh, invalid results and rig an election doing that. Uh, since 2000, well, this year, since 2020, uh, well, last year, uh, since 2022, every voting machine that is being used on the elections has this module. So it's much harder to reverse engineer anything. I mean, we, we did try. <laughs> uh, but the, the, the keys themselves are quite well protected inside the, the, the core of the voting machine. So uh, as a third party trying to get a machine and extract something useful from that machine, from uh, from its memory and all, it's uh, it's quite hard. Um, so that's that's one of the, the things. They, they even call it uh, TDRE. It's like trust-based DRE. It's, uh, it's still paperless, but uh, it has a trusted computing base to produce to every result that is produced by, by the machines. Uh, the firmware and BIOS, they are either uh, provided by the manufacturer, now uh, positive, or I mean, from the, the, the creator of the hardware itself or every module, every component that goes inside uh, the machine. And they are also analyzed by, by TSC before they sign uh, the, the, the firmware. Everything is verified on the boot. So uh, the MSC, it's also, uh, it, doesn't only uh, sign the results. It also verifies everything that's loaded inside the machine. So uh, if you try to, uh, for example, uh, replace the software or replace any candidate, I mean, uh, load something without a candidate, without a, an official candidate, you, you cannot do it because the voting machine will reject the data that is loaded into it uh, thanks to this hardware security module. Uh, and also internally, some components are, um, they communicate uh, using cryptographic protocols. So for example, if you try to insert a device between the key, uh, the, the, the uh, keyboard and the uh, processor to like uh, violate the privacy of the, the, the votes. So you can learn who is voting to who. Uh, you will just capture, uh, you just capture encrypted data. So if it's dropping, it's not possible, even if you have uh, access to the internals of the voting machines. I mean, I'm not, for, for this point specifically, at least, I mean, the keyboard and the processor. Even if you try to change the votes, for example, uh, it would be hard to because, I mean, you cannot uh, just enter the communication protocol. You don't have the keys that are protected by the security hardware. So this is the kind of stuff we try to do while uh, pen testing the, uh, the voting machine. And uh, the, during the manufacture, also some reliability tests are performed on the, uh, considering the battery, the screen and keyboards, everything that goes inside the machine is tested. Uh, so in terms of reliability, I mean, uh, the, the machine does not fail too often. And if it does, there is always a contingency one that can replace the one that failed during the process, uh, during the, the, the voting process. So this is the hardware. Then the software, the software is entirely developed by TSC, well, mostly, uh, almost entirely, uh, some cryptographic uh, libraries are developed by um, a state, uh, state entity uh, called ABIN, it's like uh, our, um, um, it's intelligence agency. They have some um, some algorithms that were proprietary, they're now moving to, uh, to non-proprietary algorithms, I mean, to, to public algorithms for this specific library for, um, for some of the encryption operations, encryption and signature operations that go inside the machine. Uh, but uh, I mean, most of the software in particular, the software that handles the votes is developed by uh, TSC. And for to, to give some more trust on the system, they do what's called uh, public security tests, which are public pen, pen testing. Any Brazilian uh, who is uh, 18 or older can uh, submit a 
test, uh, I mean, a proposal of a test, and they can go to TSC and for one week try to, uh, to, to attack somehow the voting machine, trying to uh, change votes or uh, to violate the, the, the secrecy of vote. I mean, learn who voted to whom. And so th those are kind of hacking events where uh, sometimes there are interesting results that evolve the machine, sometimes not so much. And I will show some of the results we had historically in the, in the next slides. And this is one thing. I mean, uh, let's show that our software is robust. That's that's the goal of those tests. Uh, and what we have been doing you know, at the university's uh, version of this, I mean, we can test the machine as much as we want. We, want. we have the physical machines in our lab. And uh, I mean, instead of one week, we have, well, as much time as we can stay inside the lab. Um, so this is one thing for trust. Uh, the software can also be examined by representatives of uh, political parties for, I don't remember the exact time, uh, one week or two weeks, I think, before it's compiled. I mean, the source code is provided to, to those representatives so they can check if anything is amiss. Probably they will send some technician, obviously, to, to inspect. I, mean, I don't expect uh, politicians to be like uh, tech savvy, uh, security, cybersecurity guys, to know what they are doing, what they are looking at when they examine the, the, the source code. And then when everything is ready, I mean, uh, it's one month before the elections, there's a ceremony where people can once again analyze the software and every piece of software goes to the compilation procedure uh, and signature procedure. So the uh, software can be loaded into the machines and they uh, can, can verify the signatures if they are, uh, everything loaded is legitimate on the machines. Uh, this creates some, uh, the, 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 the software is uh, placed on a vault, a physical vault. I mean, there is a CD uh, or DVD right now that is uh, placed on a vault with the, uh, I mean, everything that was produced as a result of the compilation. And also this same software is sent to the uh, local uh, offices so they can be loaded into the machines. And yeah, and the machine verifies if everything is correct, that's loaded into it. So then we go to voting. This is where the, 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 the voters know what's happening. Uh, first thing that happens is to check that the flashcards that uh, store the voting results are uh, empty. There's no preloaded votes there. And then the voting procedure, I mean, you authenticate, you get, uh, you, you choose your candidates, go home after confirming. And there is also in parallel to the uh, to the, the official voting, there is what's called an integrity test. Essentially, some voting machines they are um, uh, they are picked at random from different parts uh, of the, the country or state, actually, and then it's a per state uh, test. And then they are placed on a, a, a local where they are tested by uh, audit, uh, auditors. That uh, they essentially they get some votes from, from paper ballots and they just vote. And in the end, they verify if what was uh, placed on the machine, every vote sent to the machine corresponds to, res to the partial result given by that machine. I mean, if there is no voting being ignored or changed by the machine itself, by, by the software itself. So essentially it's a, a black box tests where the machine is being, um, tested if it's not really good trying to change something of the results. I mean, I, I know the expected results. Let's see if the machine gives the exact expected results. And so, well, this is what happens for, for the voting. At the end, uh, we have a removable flash drive with uh, all the results and also some printed documents like uh, the, the pool results, the results of that specific machine. Uh, our votes cast on that specific machine. It's called the BU, uh, Boletin de Urna in Portuguese. Uh, there are also the um, individual votes uh, that are, um, they are not on the same sequence of the, uh, in which they are cast. I mean, they are scrambled, so you don't know, only looking at those individual votes who voted to whom, even if you know the order 
of the uh, of the voters uh, and event logs, uh, anything that happened in the with the machine since it was loaded with the software during the voting uh, process and everything. And everything is signed and sent to TSC. So if anyone tries to like do something on the communication, they cannot because everything is signed. Uh, TSC will uh, reject any uh, manipulated results there. So that's it. And when it arrives, every date arrives at TSC. Uh, they totalize it, and it's just uh, uh, there is where the only addition <laughs> occurs. They verify the uh, signature of the data, and then they tell the results and announce the results publicly. Uh, here's the URL if you want to check every specific voting machine, the results in there, uh, you can, there is a website for that. And then comes the uh, the, the very uh, recurrent question, is the system secure? I mean, uh, I mentioned many security, uh, security mechanisms that exist here and there. Uh, is that good enough? Could be improved and, well, the, 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 uh, it's a recurrent question, but it's actually a bad question because usually when you say, is it secure? You have to say secure against what? I mean, it's not secure against acid or fire. <laughs> uh, so what exactly is security here? So in general, in terms of uh, availability, I mean, it's, it's quite good. It's hard to, um, it has many redundancies here and there to avoid the machine uh, from, from failing during the election process. So power outages, if we have, we have internal battery batteries. If the machine halts for some reason, you can just get the results that were stored, the partial results stored until that point of the election and put them, uh, load them into another machine. Uh, so the, the, the poor results are, are, are not lost. Uh, in, in that sense, even if someone from the end of the election, uh, when uh, well at the end of, of the election, get the removable flashcards and you have to send them to TSC. If someone loses that flashcard, that's not a problem. You can go to the machine again and reprint them and re-record them on a different flashcard. Uh, if the biometrics of the users fail, you can ask them for other information like the uh, voter's um, birth year and to verify more carefully this time the ID cards and just let them vote. So there are many things that are meant to not prevent someone from voting. I mean, it's hard, it's really uh, rare for someone that wants to vote uh, and is obliged to, uh, not to vote because of a problem with the voting machines. And then you go with, well, but what about third parties? What if someone gets the voting machine and tries to uh, I mean, modify the software, rig it somehow? And it has very good uh, security Excuse against me, those kind of factors too. Excuse so, me. yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, can you wrap uh, in uh, five minutes, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So quite good security against third parties. I showed many of them here for you. Some of the security uh, mechanisms were violated in previous uh, tests, uh, public security tests, but they are, uh, I mean, now mostly fixed. And finally, the transparency, and that's the main source of criticism for the last years. Uh, internal actors might be able to do something wrong with the machines and go unnoticed. That, that's the main source of criticism. That doesn't mean that it's, it's happening. It's just that without like paper ballots, for example, it's hard to see if that did not happen for sure. Even the things, the, the auditing mechanisms that there exist in the machine, they might be, uh, uh, be not enough to uh, detect when something goes wrong. So integrity tests, detailing by TS, uh, detailing by the detailing process is the most uh, easier to audit the others might be uh, somehow, uh, I mean, they might be rigged somehow, technically speaking. Uh, so this is the, the, the main legitimate criticism and it is the main point of criticism that is being uh, handled by the partnership with the universities today. Here are some of the, uh, the, the things we are considering doing, in particular uh, to have an end-to-end -end verifiability procedure added to the voting machine 
so the voter can verify it's even better than the printed ballots in the end so the voter can verify if his vote was cast was recorded recorded correctly and also if uh at the telling process it was uh tallied correctly so this is the the, the main uh points here here are some criticism that we had along the years i will not go through each and every one of them due to time constraints uh but essentially uh was the brazil was stolen somehow there was some fraud in this uh 2022 uh this year uh, most most likely not because every criticism is really bogus completely fabricated things that were uh, created by people that were trying to say that the elections were rigged and well since we did not have any <laughs> minimum evidence that something was wrong probably there was nothing wrong even if the problems uh, the, the transparency could be better exactly to avoid those problems here so there were uh, many uh pseudo technical arguments with the statistics uh someone that did not even know the possibility of ifs in the code someone that could not do basic math to say that uh well there is uh uh there is some artificial lock on the number of votes that are cast on the machine but the artificial lock is not artificial it's just the number number of votes that can be cast by machine i mean there are at most 500 voters that can vote so yeah the, the the sum of every vote cast on a machine cannot go over the 500 uh, voters that were there and other things that appeared here and there and in the end the only one that the, the party the defeated party that went uh, tried to create uh, legal action against the, uh, the 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 procedure was uh well, the, the result of the legal action was bad faith litigation. And in this case, it was technically correct to say it was bad faith, but there was no shred of evidence that would justify the legal action they tried to, to pull up. So this is a summary. Very good. So the, the process today is very good against under 30 parties. It could be better in terms of um, transparency, auditing mechanisms. It's something that's been uh, worked on uh right now and in the end the, the 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 problem here is that while technicians have been saying we can and we should improve the system politicians have just said well fraud is abundant that's an essential translation of what it could be better and then it's not good enough it's full of fraud and this second part is false and that's it a quick overview of what we have here in brazil and have been having uh, in the last moments. Thank you. Thank you very much for this extensive talk. Uh, are there any questions in the room um, or uh, online? So um, actually I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question which I have is that um, the problems that you were, um, some of the problems you were mentioning uh, seem to be uh, because of the fact that um, uh, you don't have a paper trace of what the voting happened, right? So do you think uh, that is, um, uh, so the, the phenomena that you were describing, is it uh, common for um, most places where they don't have a paper trail or is there um, still something specific that, because if, if paper trail is the only issue, right, just to have it and solve it right so or this is easier said than done or is there something else which is i'm missing here well pretty said them not uh but uh, the, the point is it would be good to have additional uh, uh so audit, additional auditing trail not necessarily paper based paper based is the easiest one but uh, the problem with paper is that paper can be, you remember when I was talking about paper ballots, the, the original ones, paper ballots were destroyed, paper ballots were uh, rewritten. So to create a solution that is robust against this kind of, uh, I mean, destruction, for example, of the paper trail, that's not that easy. Uh, you would have to like protect the papers 
much more than you have today the, the, to, to protect the machines. So it was tested in the in 2002, uh, and it was rejected not for good reasons, in my my humble opinion. But uh, there are there are some um, issues that need to be solved to get a paper trail, and we fought, uh, I mean, TSC fought so hard for so long against paper trails due to the, the, the uh, logistics that they entail that uh, many people today believe that paper trail is a bad idea. Uh, they, they somehow leak the votes of the voters. So, uh, I mean, it would not be accepted by most of the population right now. So that's in part why we are going to end-to-end uh, -end verifiability that is, uh, you can do end-to-end -end verifiability with paper trail, but you don't need to. So avoiding papers is something that today, kind of politically, not necessarily technically, is something that we need to do. Okay. The second question which I have is that, um, as you know, in AI, um, there is, a, and especially in deep neural networks, there is a lot of talk about explanation methods, right? And uh, some of one of your graphics just reminded me that this looked like a huge neural network. Okay, uh, and and uh, uh, for uh, I, I don't know if this is a serious question or a very frivolous question, but my question to you was that uh, given that uh, the voting mechanism, right, or and the whole process is a black box, so are the, do you think that the methods which we use for explanation and various kinds of explanation, contrastive explanation, and uh, um, and, and many other forms of explanation, right? Um, uh, perturbing the input and uh, like Lyme and many other things. So I'm kind of wondering, could those uh, concepts be conceptually be usable in uh, trying to um, make this more transparent? Uh, they might help at least with uh, some analysis that uh, today have been made by humans. Some humans that were not trying to bring the truth out of it, but uh, essentially to, to create a narrative. And so, uh, I mean, my, my impression, I'm no specialist, if we had more analysis, automated analysis, that can be trusted in the sense that they, they are well-defined, the, 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 the parameters are well-defined, and you can give more confidence or raise an issue, I mean, this, this part here seems strange, let's evaluate it. Or this part here is okay, uh, it would be better. Uh, I mean, we had a hard time, we, uh, I'm saying academia in general, we had a hard time trying to refute many analyses that had absolutely no technical, technical basis. Uh, for example, trying to say that different voting machines will lead to different results. And well, okay, that's weird because voting machines in different places should have essentially the same distribution. But then you see that the distribution of the voting machines, of the, the models of voting machines is not uniform. So, well, uh, it may have to do with the, distrib the physical distribution of the voting machines, not exactly uh, those machines are uh, preferred this candidate to another. So having something that can I mean, uh, evaluate data in a more transparent manner probably would help uh, to create good arguments to, for starters and to your food uh, fabricated arguments. That, that might be a possibility, yeah. So thanks, Marcus, again for a great uh, talk. Uh, next, we have a panel uh, and Andrea is going to take it away. All right. Good afternoon, and thank you to our last panel of the day. Um, so this, I'm excited to be on this panel because we've had a lot of technical talks, but a lot of the presentations today, oh, he's great. Hi, Maurice. Um, so I'll introduce our presenters in just a minute, but I'm so thrilled that they're here because a lot of the presentations today have touched on journalism. They've assigned a lot of blame to journalism. Um, there's been a lot of assumptions about how journalism is so much more biased now than it used to be, which I'm happy to refute. Um, and so I'm excited to have these panelists today to kind of get into some of these questions. So I'll offer a brief introduction, and then I'm going to start with just kind of a, a simple question. And I hope this is organic and you, you offer things and our panelists online offer things as well. Um, so we'll start with our panelists available online. 
So we've got Sagar, who is some Tani, who's assistant professor in the Grant Thornton Scholar in the Department of Operations and Decision Technologies at Indiana University. And he has expertise in AI for cybersecurity and cyber threats, among other related areas. Also joining us online, we have Maurice Turner, who's a cybersecurity policy expert uh, who's worked at Meta and as their public policy manager. And interestingly, he's worked on the community standards that they've put out. So that would be very interesting for us. And sitting here with me is Dave Leventhal, who's the editor in chief of Raw Story. He previously worked at the Dallas Morning News and the Center for Public Integrity. And Dave and I went to journalism school together 23 years ago, something like that. Yeah. I was gonna say, and I haven't seen him since then. So that's also very exciting to have Dave here today. So I'll start out um, just by asking, how is AI already being used in election coverage? And so uh, Dave, you're here, so I'll hand it. So for mainstream journalism or not mainstream journalism, AI is still a fairly nascent technology. I think you know we're seeing it in certain applications, which I, I feel like I'm insulting your intelligence by even listing but I, I think you know when you see for example um financial wire services and there are earning reports uh or the latest jobs numbers come out and speed is of the essence that oftentimes is uh you know a great opportunity to have ai or automated reporting um not to conflate the two uh, to to basically be the frontline reporter uh where a human being is not necessarily going to be writing or even editing the text. Uh, so that's something that obviously we see a lot. Uh, I've, I've been very interested, especially, uh, you know, I cover a lot of political influence issues. And for example, I've done a lot of reporting on lawmakers in Congress and the House and the Senate who have stock investments. And sometimes their stock investments will conflict with the work that they're doing on committees that they're on, uh, or for example, they might invest in Raytheon or Lockheed Martin or a defense contractor, and yet uh, be making decisions in a public capacity where their public and their private lives may intersect. There's been some very, very interesting uh, applications of AI to collect that data, use that data, and report that data in a way that almost instantaneously is giving people information about what senators are doing, uh, what House members are doing. Unusual Whales uh, is uh, definitely a, an outfit that I've paid a lot of attention to in this regard. But, you know, when it comes down to, and I'll stop and shut up so everyone else can talk, but I, you know, I think when you're talking about election coverage, when you're talking about shoe leather reporting, a very deep data analysis that uh, requires a human element to it, um, you know, workaday journalists like me and my colleagues at other news organizations, AI is not yet a part of our life in that regard. And I suspect we'll get to this a, a little bit later, but I also do see coming down the pike five or 10 years from now, uh, AI being used in ways in newsrooms that uh, we're not really thinking a whole lot about today or using for sure. To our panelists online, uh, Maurice, would you like to go first about talking about the ways journalists use AI or maybe could use AI? Sure thing. I'm excited to see journalists use AI within the realm of election coverage. I think that having these technologies available so that people can actually scale their abilities uh, is critical because right now there just aren't enough people covering elections with the, the depth and the technical understanding that would best serve the American people and really anyone who's participating in a democracy. So I think from that point of view, uh, we're just not going to get enough people to be able to cover these kinds of areas. And so the next logical step is investments into technology to help those people who are covering these areas be able to scale their efforts and do it in a way that's actually beneficial rather than just leaving these areas um, uncovered at all. Great. Thank you. And Cigar, any thoughts on this topic? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, first of all, for inviting me to be part of this panel here. It's, it's an honor to be part of this, such a distinguished uh, group. I want to just uh, put a big caveat and say I'm not a journalist. Uh, I'm not an election guy either, but I do have a lot of experience in terms of doing uh, applied artificial intelligence in different uh, application areas and security, uh, and privacy and analysis, mental health analysis, and others. So I have a good sense in terms of situations where an AI 
market is going to excel and where AI is not necessarily going to be the best uh, choice here. And it kind of piggybacking off of uh, what some of the comments were a little bit earlier. AI, I think, has a lot of potential to be able to do two things within this space. Number one is to be able to digest large amounts of data and be able to generate predictions, be able to identify patterns amongst that data and to be able to provide recommendations in terms of what should be looked at, what should be prioritized and so on. Where it's not going to be very good is in situations where it does require a deep dive, where it does require a lot of human effort and human knowledge. That's not an area that AI, at least today in its current form is going to be very valuable. So those things that require a lot of manual linking, best judgments, uh, human heuristics, the things that people would just know uh, based off of their common sense or years of experience, especially in very narrow application areas, it's, it's typically where AI does not uh, excel. And I think that that would also be applicable in this context uh, as well. And then I think we I have to put in the obligatory chat GPT plug as it is uh, in, in society today, right? It's the, the role of these large language models and pre-trained models and being able to generate content, boilerplate content, that uh, would be a, that folks would be able to use right off the bat, or be able to have as a foundation for their reporting efforts. I think are two areas that AI could be uh, considered here. Great, thank you. So my next question is: it's a twist, but for each of you. So what you wish other fields knew about your job and, and how AI could help you. So so Dave, I'll start with you. What do you wish that um, developers creating AI applications or even public policy people understood about journalism as a, in the way they work? When I talk to a lot of people who are not journalists, they may not know what goes into journalism, the the art of it the act of it, uh, the practice of it, um, they're oftentimes very surprised to hear that you might spend, especially if you're an investigative journalist, which much of my career has, has been based in that area, that you might spend dozens, hundreds, even thousands of work hours, yourself and your colleagues, on a single story or a single project. So when you're talking about really high-level journalism or very deep-dive journalism, uh, that that could be called, you know, investigative by any uh, definition. Uh, it, it's just an incredible amount of work and very sophisticated to get an answer. Uh, a lot of times they're thinking of news as like, oh, you know, what I see on my Facebook feed or my Twitter feed or what I get on a news report at the top of the hour and, and not that. So, you know, when we talk about AI, I think that, you know, I want to go back maybe about four years to an experience that I had, which uh, was sort of an early uh, taste for me about what the potential could be for it. I uh, worked with an incredible data journalist, a uh, man by the name of Chris zubak -Skies, and in basically he, that's amazing, okay, uh, Chris is brilliant, and Chris, you know, basically used AI uh, to, our goal was to identify political action committees in this country that we wanted to somehow define as scam packs, okay? Political action committees that were not there to support a Republican or a Democrat or to promote a cause, but were there to basically steal money from unsuspecting people under the guise of, oh, well, we're gonna we're gonna help police officers or support candidates who do, or you know, help kids with cancer and do so by lobbying up on Capitol Hill. I mean, it was all nonsense. So he created, I mean, just incredibly sophisticated, and I can't even begin to explain to you exactly what went into it, but um, a way to find out and, and basically separate wheat from chaff. Uh, with data sets that will blow your mind on how big they are going back years and years and years. I mean, we're talking millions and millions of record lines and trying to find and separate and, and delineate among all the different political committees are, that are out there and all the millions of donations that have gone through there. Anyway, you know, the point to your question is, what do you want people to know? Journalism is hard if you want good journalism. So as it applies to AI, I'm looking for ways anyway, technologically or otherwise, to make the process more efficient. And if there is a tool out there that's going to allow me and my colleagues to make journalism more efficient, to do great journalism, you know, sign me up. I'm going to be interested. 
Thank you. That, that's fun to hear you mention Chris Zubaksky. So Chris was a computer science major at RIT when I was a young faculty member there, and he dropped out of computer science and went into journalism. So he really had that unique skill set to begin with. Um, so that's really great to hear. And so uh, Maurice, I'm curious, what, what do you think in the public policy realm? What do you wish journalists knew? And then what do you wish maybe that the public knew about journalism? I really like that question um, because I think something that I wish that uh, journalists knew about public policy is that uh, it's a lot more complicated than it seems. You know, there there often aren't just you know one or two sides of an issue. There's so much more nuance to it, and there's so many more ramifications. And it's difficult to wrap that all up into a story um, that can be put out once, whether that's going to be you know, a longer uh, longer form piece or even condensed down to uh, just a couple of tweets. And so I, I think that it would be helpful if journalists had a better appreciation um, for just the difficulty uh, of the making of public policy and all that goes into it and uh, recognize that there will always be voices that are missing or uh, information um, that is difficult or even impossible to access. Uh, and going the other way, um, I do think it's important for public policymakers to recognize that uh, journalists face security threats as well. So it's not just that uh, they're out there asking questions, but you know their personal safety is at risk, um, but also just their, their safety online is at risk. And so the, the number of steps that journalists need to take in order to keep themselves secure because of either what they're reporting or who those reports might damage uh, is something that I think is important uh, to recognize and keep top of mind. Thank you. And Cigar, what do you think? Yeah, I'll answer from the aspect of what do I wish folks knew about the AI aspect here. Uh, and, and I think the big thing I want to point out is that AI hype is not AI reality. And that sounds obvious when I say that, but a lot of, we see a lot of massive successes of AI, uh, just, you know, picking on the, the favorite, uh, you know, favorite term, chat GPT, where you see big successes in that, and, you know, startup businesses and things like that in that, in that area. But uh, in reality, a lot of AI is very unsexy. It requires a lot of effort to be able to instantiate it properly within any particular application area. And so being able to think about how can AI be used in a meaningful way and instantiated properly in, in specific context areas requires deep domain knowledge as well as deep technical knowledge as well. So there's a lot of interesting AI developments that are happening, but oftentimes when I actually use some of those techniques right off the bat in certain application areas, it doesn't work the way that it's it's advertised, so to speak. So I think the big thing is just making sure that being able to delineate what the hype is versus what reality is going to be when you start to use it in specific areas. Great, thank you. So next I wanna talk a little bit about dissemination of news because a lot of that is on platforms that use AI in the background and we use it kind of uncritically. So Dave, could you talk a little bit about maybe how raw story or in your career, you've seen social media um, help disseminate things and maybe ways that it hurts or doesn't, just any reflections on dissemination of the news? I mean, there's, Staying the obvious here, there's been such an evolution over the past 20 years about how news is disseminated. And I remember early in my career thinking, man, you know, I wish it was easier to actually connect with readers. You know, you, they, they have to call you on, on the phone at your desk. Maybe they don't even have email. Yeah, I mean, it just stuff like that where you're, we're talking about very early 2000s problems. And, and now it's like, you know, anyone can get in touch with a reporter if a reporter wants to be found. So, you know, on one hand, uh, I think this is an absolutely delightful, amazing, awesome, wonderful problem to have is that there is sort of a democratization of journalism uh, in that anyone, if you invite them to do so, can communicate with you as a reporter, an editor. Um, you know, before I was on this panel, I was literally responding to like several readers who wrote in about a story that we just broke a couple hours ago, which, you know, uh, is great. And I don't think that would have been possible, certainly a generation ago, or even half a generation ago, the way it is right now. Social media, of course, is part of that. Uh, my Twitter DMs are open. I have uh, got a lot of garbage and a lot of nonsense via that route, but I've also made some really great sources. And even some, you know, friends, uh, via Twitter, you know, through that way. And just one example, LinkedIn is another great example of uh, also to how, how that works. So 
I think on balance for all of the, you know, difficulty that comes with that type of communication uh, that on balance, uh, I think it's been, you know, a total net positive for me personally, others may disagree, but I think it's benefited, you know, me and actually I have a lot more fun too, when I can engage with people in meaningful ways, even if it means having to like put yourself out there so that others will take swipes at your work or beat you up or, you know, have that nasty things to say, that's fine. You know, we'll, uh, we'll, I, I like the accessibility part of it. Uh, and, and that really overrides it. Maurice, what are your thoughts about dissemination of news on social media and the algorithms? Is that net positive, negative? What do you think? I think it's a net positive. Uh, it's obviously complicated because uh, now so many people are on so many platforms um, that at some point, every platform becomes a, a source of news. So it can start off as something fun, like sharing photos of friends and family, or even seeing the latest dance craze. But eventually, uh, where people go to have fun, people then kind of congregate and have conversations and ultimately conversations uh, end up about topics um, that might be divisive. Uh, and so I think that it, it's always going to be a case that when you get enough people together, for whatever the reason, they're going to end up talking uh, about what's going on in their day-to-day -day lives. And so, you know, from that perspective, I think it's challenging for the platforms to be able to, to morph um, and react to uh, the desires of the people who were there, their end users, um, but also staying true to what their purpose was. And so from that perspective, you know, the conversations are always going to turn toward the daily events and it's difficult to keep track of, okay, just how much of what kind of information do people say they want versus how much are they actually clicking and viewing, which gives you their actual preference and trying to you know, align those two while it's happening in real time um, is, is the biggest challenge I think all of these platforms are facing and, and they're trying to use AI to solve it. Cigar? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a net positive. Just to uh, echo what everybody else is saying here, but also uh, if I talk about the, the negative aspects of it too, the aspects of the, the systems that are uh, recommending the news stories or helping disseminate are based off of a lot of customer preferences and customer private data, so to speak. And so concerns around privacy start to come about in terms of what are individuals actually liking? How is it getting disseminated out? When do things get uh, shown at the appropriate points in time and so on? So I, overall, I'd say a net positive, but at the same time, there are some aspects that, uh, that require a little bit of careful thought uh, with relation to the design of the algorithms and how the news stories are getting disseminated or recommended to individuals. Great, thank you. And I'm just gonna ask one more question then I'm curious to hear your questions. And so I'll work in reverse order this time and start with you, Cigar, but it's about regulation. Um, and so it seems like there might be more of an appetite for regulation in some aspects, whether it's privacy or um, this morning, someone on a panel talked about sometimes security is in conflict with inclusion of technologies. And so I'm just wondering what your, what do you see as areas and kind of appetites for regulation related to, to news transparency? Yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. Uh, so in terms of regulations, you know, we have you know, regulations like GDPR and CCPA and, and things of that sort are more on the privacy angle. When we start to talk about uh, areas such as security, one of the things that it comes to mind is the idea of different types of risk management frameworks or different types of frameworks that could be applicable to specific vertical application areas. So if we think about a common one, say, for instance, in um, in the AI space, just in terms of AI security, for instance, there's an AI risk management framework that came out by, by NIST. So I wouldn't say it's so much on the regulation side. I would say probably more framework side for specific vertical applications and vertical domains, hospitals and, and you know, payment card industry are examples of, of, of they've adopted specific, you know, types of frameworks that are specific to those industries and the unique aspects there. So the in, if we consider the vertical aspect, I think that there might be more success in terms of how do we consider the dissemination or usage of some of this information. Thank you. And Maurice, I'm, I'm curious, based on your expertise, what you think about this issue? 
this is probably going to be one of the most difficult areas to, to regulate, specifically talking about you know the use of AI, um, you know, by journalists and news reporting. Um, for me, I, I try to take a step back and think, okay, what are the general expectations that we have? Are we expecting uh, this reporting generated by AI to be perfect? Do we expect it to be better than humans or sort of just good enough to get some information you know, out there quickly? Um, because right now, it, it's not illegal to be wrong uh, in, in terms of what's being reported. And so uh, share a, a quick story. Last week, we had Google and Microsoft come out with really big announcements, you know, one after the other, talking about how they're going to basically commercialize AI for the general public. And both of them had some pretty big errors uh, in their demonstration. So Google, they were doing a demo and um, asked about, you know, what was the first picture of an exoplanet? And it came back that in 2023, James Webb Space Telescope uh, took a photo of the planet. Well, the information was totally wrong. The, the first photo was actually taken in 2004 by a ground-based telescope. Um, so there was no, you know, if, ands, or but, it was just objectively wrong. Uh, Microsoft came out with a demo and its response by its chat bot totally made up numbers based on uh, a financial report uh, by Gap. And so, again, there was no interpretation of the information. It was just flat out wrong. So it's like, what's the liability that we're all expecting to have? And therefore, what should the general public be calling on government to do as far as regulations? Are we actually going to regulate that these things need to be accurate? Or is it all going to fall under sort of free speech protections and it's going to be up to the reputations of the journalists and of the, of the publishers to try to maintain a high standard so that their readership will want to follow them because they know that they are trustworthy or are readers just going to accept you know, less than accurate information as part of what they want to digest? So I, I say this as the editor of a news organization, government regulation is probably the thing that that I'm least concerned about in the context of, of this conversation, at least in, in the next couple of years, um, because the government's probably not going to do anything much about it uh, in, in this area. There's not going to be, number one, enough consensus to push something forward. Uh, in, and even if there was, then there are going to be other priorities likely that, that are going to supersede where I think the action is going to be is uh, within the industry itself. Uh, first and foremost, the the news industry. You know, you think of Bloomberg or uh, other publications that that use automated technology to write stories. Uh, they have to make a choice: Are they going to be transparent about that article being, you know, written by a non-human source? Many do, and and that's a way for them to telegraph that. They feel like they are are doing this properly, uh, that the information is accurate. They are vouching for it. They are taking ownership of it. So that's very powerful uh, in news and in an industry that, that generally is not regulated as many uh, other industries are, or at least to the degree that many are. Um, so, you know, news organizations taking ownership for it, very key. There's already so much garbage going on right now, too, in the sense that, like, you know, we have to worry about our stories being ripped off by these fake news sites. And I, I use fake news, meaning literally like they are, you know, not news sites uh, and they steal our work and they repurpose it and they change a few words in it. And and they try to game the system in a way that uh, monetizes our intellectual property. Uh, and, and that's a legal issue. So there, there's, you know, that, too, that we have to fight. If there's any regulation to be done, it's probably, you know, in that area, first and foremost. And then finally, you know, also within the industry, is Google going to prioritize or deprioritize, you know, different uh, news organizations that have a pattern and a history of doing things, what I think we could all generally consider to be the right way versus the wrong way, uh, you know, news organizations that are transparent, news organizations that are accurate, that have demonstrated that they are all of those things, all of the above. Uh, are they going to get, you know, in essence, when they show up on a certain platform, and I say Google, but you could pick any of, you know, 20 different ones out there, um, you know, what are the rules of the road going to be in that regard? I, I think that's an open question right now, as it pertains specifically to automated content and AI. Thank you. Questions? Biplob's ready. <laughs> yeah, so 
um, I, I just couldn't resist uh, asking the question, which, uh, which was that, um, uh, you know, there is um, a general tendency, especially in the US industry, which is that profits are mine, losses are governments, right? I need, so there are two uh, industries I can think of, banking and uh, airlines, okay? When they are making profit, they say, yes, this is because of my action. And whenever they are getting losses, right? Whether it was 2009, 2000, 2008, 2009 timeframe or uh, during COVID or any other time, right? And it may be external, internal, whatever, any airline is big is going down, you're too big to fail, right? So they want government's intervention. So the reason I was saying this is because uh, we were talking about uh, uh, news journalism, right? And uh, the answer probably is in the question itself, which is that everyone follows the money, okay? So what I'm trying to uh, ask here is knowing that, um, um, and, and another analogy I'll give, and then I'll come to journalism. I'm sorry, I'm just moving around. So uh, which one is like in the food industry, okay? Uh, which in packaged food, we had the standardization on the calories and the, you know, the, uh, the protein, the salt, and this, that is probably the most regulated anywhere in you will see apart from pharmacy uh, medicine there and, and the reason for that is if you'd want to do food recall right you know whom to go and yet in food packaged food you don't see anything where was that product made it was distributed by someone but who produced it right you will not see in your labeling so uh, there is a pushback from the industry that no no please don't do that i can get it from anywhere in the world whatever right and they do it. So the reason I'm saying this is a Bloomberg or any other news agency, uh, it may actually want to get the information out for whatever reason, but if they have to retract information, right? That's part of the journalistic ish, uh, um, principle that if you are proven wrong, then you basically retract the thing. How would you retract anything, right? And if you're not able to retract, then basically you are going away from the journalistic principles. So my, my question was, as we are talking about AI and the, and the disruption it is causing in journalism, uh, I want to know, are the journalistic principles getting, uh, they, do you see them getting preserved? Or do you see the market forces and all these, right? Also disrupting it. And uh, maybe a sub, sub question on this is, I'm actually quite worried about AI and workforce in general, because I work in AI, so I just think about that. So how do you see um, this disrupting the workforce, the journalists themselves? Because high quality journalism needs high quality journalists. Well, you, you brought up food products, so maybe that, that's an appropriate place to, to start. There's, there's actually a, a, an organization called NewsGuard and NewsGuard creates, I, I forget exactly what they call them, but they're basically like nutrition labels for news, okay? And they do this and they've, ranked hundreds and hundreds of different news organizations to basically let a consumer of news, just like a consumer of food, know that this is something that is going to be nutritious for your intellect versus something that's going to be a confection and empty calories. So, you know, there are going to be, I, I think, uh, an increasing number of organizations out there funded you know, by nonprofits or maybe not uh, that that do that kind of work. For the news organizations themselves, I mean, just speaking only for myself and my own news organization, I think transparency is paramount and key, whether you're talking about AI, whether you're talking about articles that are 100% written by a flesh and blood human being or something in between. If you get something wrong, you make it right. And you let people know how you made it right, what was wrong, how it's been corrected, if you do that, then then that gets you toward that goal of transparency, which I think undergirds and supports credibility. If everyone's going to make mistakes, nobody is infallible. I don't care what news organization you work for or how good a journalist you are, you will screw something up. But when you do, make sure that you, you're being honest about it. Uh, and in the long term, that's going to help your credibility. Tell me again your second question. So, like, I've had friends and colleagues ask me, well, you know, do you, do you think that, that, you know, basically some computer is going to just start writing all your stories? 
And, and, you know, now we're living in a world where you can, you can say, Hey, write me a story. And, you know, a artificial intelligence will write you a story. Uh, I will tell you a very quick story and, and then we can move on. Uh, earlier today, Senator Dianne Feinstein put out an announcement. It said that she would not run for re-election in 2024. Okay. Well, I could see very much a news organization having a way for that initial nuts and bolts news break announcement to be written by somebody who is not corporeal. Okay. What could not have been done was what happened about an hour later when my Raw Story colleague, Matt Laszlo, chased Diane Feinstein down the hallway of a building in the U.S. Senate complex and put the question to her and said, so just want to make sure you're about your retirement, you know, you, you are going to retire. You're not running for reelection. And she had no idea what he was talking about and said as much and said, I haven't put out it. I'm paraphrasing here, but I haven't put out any announcement. I may put out one later. So the story that you'll see on Raw Story right now, if you go there this moment is, is the latter. We had the former, which we wrote ourselves, but the latter was a story. Now we broke that news because we were there. We had a reporter who was on the ground talking to the very person without any filter, without, you know, any analysis. It was literally a human interaction. And that's the only way that kind of business could have been done. So you see where the two can go hand in hand, but you are you are never going to replace that side of journalism, which of uh, which I would say and argue would would be the most incisive, the most important, uh, the most um, essential kind of journalism is not just covering the news, but uncovering the news. AI will play a role in the latter, but it it can't be an end in and of itself. The human element will must always be there in order to truly get to the bottom of some of the greatest mysteries in politics or health or science or whatever the topic may be that journalists are going to be writing about. I'm going to speak to that too, because I got a strong feeling about this uh, and being at a journalism school and thinking about what are we going to teach our students now? And I really feel like this is the moment for journalists. And even today, we've heard a lot of stories about how there were mistakes in AI or the human needed to come in and offer more context. And even my work on, on deep fake detection, you know, We've been working with journalists and it's just one tool, but they're all going back on their context to say kind of stories like this. Well, that person actually wasn't there that day or that doesn't sound like them. So therefore, I think that that's fake. And I think if anything, now chat GPT and all the terrible examples out there have just shown people that we really need humans involved more. So I think it's a great time for people to go to journalism school and, and to create these collaborative spaces. So in that sense, I'm, I'm very hopeful. But what about anyone online? Thoughts about the future of the workforce for journalism? I can I can go ahead and uh, speak here. I I'm not a journalist, like, like I said, but I will say that the implications for AI and journalism is going to be similar for the implications of AI in any content generation field. So uh, journalism is is generating content. Uh, academia is generating content. What, uh, papers. Uh, the music industry is generating music. You know the the film industry is generating you know movies and so on. Right. So. The implications of AI across those different modalities of data and then those different vertical application areas as well, I think that there's going to be similar unique, similar characteristics across all of them where an AI is going to get you part of the way there, but there's going to be that human element that's always going to be necessary to do that deep dive in, to validate, and then to further refine what is being generated from AI. So if, for my own workflow, I've started to use ChatGPT just for ideation and for brainstorming and for generating boilerplate content. I'm never going to use it as in its current format to, to write a conference paper for AAAI. That's just not going to happen uh, because I, I don't think it's going to get to the level of quality and depth. And most importantly, is it going to be able to cite its sources properly? Hint, no. Uh, and so the 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 you know utility of these models is going to be really up until a certain point a human is going to have to come in and i think that that's consistent across data modalities that's consistent across different industries at this point in time great thank you any other questions all 
our panelists, is there anything else you'd like to add? I can go ahead and add uh, one more thing to this, which is I think journalists should keep doing what they've been doing, which is cultivating sources, doing the investigation, and synthesizing the, the data and to think of AI as another tool for this. Um, you know, the data sources have always been crucial to journalism since the beginning of the profession. Uh, and, and so I think it's even more important now to be able to use the technology uh, to be able to, um, to collect and, and basically catalog these trustworthy data sources as a way to protect against adversaries who want to seed bad information, try to stoke additional concerns or fear on whatever topic by manipulating conversations and sentiment because they're using technology to amplify the impacts of that. So I think it's incumbent upon journalists to figure out a way to use technology to guard against that uh, so that the journalistic process can still be protected and that the, the story itself can get out rather than the focus being on how is technology going to replace certain aspects or even entire careers? I don't think we're there yet. I think it just needs to be another tool in a journalist toolbox so that they can continue to evolve along with the audience that is consuming the news. I'm going to ask the panelists uh, the question that um, you journal, journalists play a very important um, role in helping the people understand the electoral processes and build trust in the society. So from your perspective, how can technology and specifically AI technology uh, help you? What are the, your pain points and where do you think uh, uh, technology should help you? And um, uh, Sagar has, works a lot in deep fakes and uh, dark web and so on. So maybe uh, uh, Sagar may want to start or anyone can start, but I'm just wondering how can we help you? Yeah, I, I can go ahead and start here. So I think I'm going to give a very blunt and crude answer here, which is I get tired of typing all day. So AI can really help me out in terms of re reducing the amount of typing I need to do and get more, more papers out. But in all reality, I think AI can also help out in terms of deepening some of the areas of inquiry that we may not have had access to uh, before. So for instance, I'll, go, I'll, I'll give one example here. Um, related to the dark web one that you brought up at Blob. So I think a, a lot of my background is actually developing cyber threat intelligence by analyzing uh, source code from dark web hacker forums. So these hackers will go on these forums and then they try to identify different or they try to share different pieces of source code with each other that may be used in an exploit or that may be used in an attack and develop. I, I try to develop cyber threat intelligence from that. So. Uh, if we think about cyber threat intelligence as generating reports about what's happening and the dark web in that particular space, one of the major issues or limitations uh, when developing CTI in from dark web data is that a lot of the source code that's on these forums is actually incomplete. It's not complete. You don't know what it could actually be used for. So some of these new developments in AI is actually helping me develop and report more effective cyber threat intelligence because I'm, now I'm able to do things like automated code completion for the incomplete pieces of source code on dark web hacker forums and be able to say, ha, this particular piece of source code could be weaponized in this type of fashion and enhance threat intelligence reporting more effectively by using AI. So I think these days AI is actually helping out with rejuvenating some areas of inquiry that may not have been there before, uh, simply because of the abilities of being able to generate content, being able to predict, being able to recommend, and so on. But it still requires that human validation as to whether or not it's legit or not. So I, I would love if there was some magical mystery technique, computer, AI, call it what you will, that would help me with one particular line of inquiry uh, that that I've been reporting out for the better part of the past two years, which is uh, thefts from political campaigns. Um, we've identified you know dozens of uh, individual examples of cyber thieves or more you know common criminal or traditional means of check washing or or stealing money from politicians and their political campaigns sometimes to the tune of hundreds of thousands even even millions of dollars in a couple of extreme examples but this has all been at the federal level because 
the federal level, you, you can you can deal with one data set, dealing with 50 plus one data sets and trying to do that at every state to identify greater trends uh, would take uh, an amount of labor, human labor that, that I certainly don't have myself and don't have the team to do, but it would be amazing. So, you know, that that would be just one example of where I would I would love to have more than I have right now in order to perform searches that would potentially identify information that would allow me to go reporting well beyond where I've been able to get right now with the time and the resources that I have. Yeah. So just a, just a clarification. Uh, if fraud detection is a very common area where AI, AI has a long track record. So I want to just ask you a clarification question. Uh, if there is a method which helps you, right? Is there an agency which will give us 10% of that money? Like in tax fraud, right? If I do it, IRS will give me a 10% or 20%, some percentage of the thing. So there is incentive built in for the technical community to do this, right? So my question to you is for journalists or, or, or technology and journalists together, mm -hmm. let's make a collaboration, right? And we find a, a $10 million. And I heard today that in presidential campaign, the money raised is about $1 billion. Okay, it can go into billions and for Senate races, it can be in hundreds of millions. That was a number someone was quoting. So is it possible to get 10% of that money if we find something? Is, are there rules? Are, is there an agency? Well, you, you, you'd you probably have to talk to the political campaigns themselves because it's their money, not not the journalist money. What I could tell you is I would I would pay, as a news organization, I would, I would pay for a service uh, or I would pay for the expertise for somebody to either design a custom bespoke type of, uh, you know, a, a ability to to do what I'm hoping to do, or if it was, you know, a more out of the box thing, we're talking about a pretty esoteric thing here, so it might have to be custom, but uh, yes, to the basic level here, I would assign a value to that. I would assign a, a relatively significant value to that. Uh, to help us allow us to do the kind of journalism that we want to do. Thank you. Maurice, anything to offer? I was thinking the same thing uh, in that I, I believe that the future uh, of these AI projects is actually going to be domain specific AI data sets uh, and companies that produce services such that if someone is interested in election fraud detection that is a, a data set that someone can go out and build that is an AI model that someone can train specifically so that it's high quality data, high quality output that's available as a service. And I see that happening across to, you know several domains by multiple companies and that's where the competition comes in so that it becomes worthwhile for people to make investments in different domains. Um, because if all we're doing is relying on general knowledge chatbots, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to see the level of sophistication that we need in order for the results to be as trustworthy as they need to be uh, to make decisions in places like journalism or business. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks to my guests for a terrific panel and for the audience for being here. And we appreciate your time. Do you have any closing words for today? First, I, so the title of the, so first I want to thank everyone for staying for the last hour of the last workshop <laughs> on the last day of the conference, okay? So uh, we have had an exciting um, discussion throughout the day. Uh, our numbers do not show the enthusiasm around on the topic, but I can tell you that we have had people calling in uh, from election commissions. Uh, um, I'm very thankful from uh, Ireland. We had uh, interest from NIST. Um, and uh, so on, uh, who want to participate. And so I, I think this was uh, very, very um, useful. And I think if uh, th this was not just an incredible election, but uh, the title is A Call for Action, right? So I, 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 we hope that we are taking some call for action. From the last panel specifically, I take the call for action, especially for people in AI, maybe Sagar for you, for myself, we should uh, try to be bounty hunters, tax fraud or bounty hunters, right? And uh, look for policy changes so that we can actually get in principle without any 
uh, you know, a negotiation, you get 10, 20%, whatever. And we build tools because, you know, without having the right financial incentive, nothing, nothing in the world gets done. I mean, just this, just, just the industry, uh, this thing, right? A simple ground truth. So I hope that that can happen, but uh, this is a very important uh, topic. So I thank all the speakers, all the panelists, all the paper presenters, uh, and, and we conclude the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank nice. you. Uh, Anita, are you on the call? I'm here. Yeah, Do, any, any words from you? And, and I will request all the people uh, who are on the virtual call to just uh, show their video, please. And Anita, any final no uh, words from you? Nothing for me. I've been taking a lot of notes all day. And um, <clears throat> I've also been fielding a lot of emails from people who just couldn't make it, who are very interested in our output. So yeah, the, the numbers in the room don't belie the interest in this, as, as Biplop said. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.